Section 1 of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth from the Peace of Westphalia to the Peace of Nijmegen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth from the Peace of Westphalia to the Peace of Nijmegen by osmond airy preface the epoch of european history with which i have here attempted to deal is an epoch of restorations restorations which assume widely different forms in correspondence with the varying circumstances of the countries in which they take place in france after a period of fierce internal strife during which all antagonistic influences exhaust themselves in a vain struggle with the tenacious purpose of mazarin and sink into helplessness the triumphant monarchy emerges as a despotism of an almost oriental type that despotism is conferred upon a prince of great capacity and of boundless ambition with all the instruments of ambition ready to his hand in england a different scene is witnessed the revolution had overthrown three great institutions the monarchy the parliament and the church all three were now restored under the old forms the parliament first and then in natural sequence the monarchy and the church and when the settlement is complete it is seen that the first and the last have gained immensely and that what they have gained the crown has lost acting in strict harmony the parliament and the church assume toward the king a dictatorial attitude and from their dictation he partially escapes by a gradually deepening subservience to louis the fourteenth a subservience rendered easy from the fact that parliament has as yet no direct control upon foreign policy the union of the two monarchs leads to a third restoration that of william of orange by the combined attack of france and england the united provinces are brought to the brink of destruction they escape from the peril by throwing off a constitution ill adapted for confronting immediate national peril and by placing once more the executive power though with many limitations in the hands of a single man the representative of the house under whom independence had been won the treatment of this period in a form as condensed as is required by the plan of the series has been rendered difficult by two facts it is in the first place a period of incessant diplomatic intrigue on the part of every ruler concerned and all diplomacy is secret and personal and thus while avoidance of detail is a prime object details of which many seem not merely important but essential to a clear understanding of the story press in on every side to an extent scarcely to be appreciated by any one who has not somewhat attentively considered the subject there is secondly the fact that in england at least there are no great figures around whom interest and sympathies may gather no prominent politician acts from a great motive no one after the fall of clarendon even from an honest or unselfish motive and no one seems to live in the open light of day there is no great cause definitely present to men's minds to strengthen the moral fibre wearied with the tension of twenty years the parliament is possessed by vague wants and vaguer terrors it displays a low moral sense and is ruled by a spirit of unreason though by the very law of its being it half consciously feels its way toward the goal of sixteen eighty nine the character and purposes of the king his detestable private example the influence of his mistresses the potency of backstairs intrigue afford the opportunity for all who unite ambition and capacity with cunning frivolity or shamelessness to come to the front and to prosper in writing the chapters devoted to the fronde i have drawn largely from the histoire de france pendant la minorité de louis xiv and the histoire de france sous le ministère de mazarin of m cheroul which from the impartial and exhaustive use displayed by the writer of authorities previously unknown or neglected must be held to supersede former works on the subject 
the voluminousness however the abundance of detail and the somewhat provoking looseness of the arrangement of these volumes render the conception of persons and events in their due proportions a matter of the utmost difficulty the histoire de france of m henri martin and especially the franceuse geschichte of professor ronca have been constantly referred to to lessen this difficulty while in one or two instances i have been aided by dr kitchen's history of france and mr perkins france under richelieu and mazarin for the part played by louis the fourteenth outside france during the years between sixteen sixty and sixteen seventy eight i have relied principally upon m minier's negotiation relative à la succession d'espagne supplemented on all questions regarding the connection between louis the fourteenth and charles the second by ronca's history of england principally in the seventeenth century while with respect to the dutch republic my chief authority has been the jan de witt of m pontali macgregor's holland and the dutch colonies has also been found useful in enabling me to give a brief description of the commercial supremacy of the dutch the parliamentary debates as recorded in volume four of the parliamentary history have of course been indispensable in questions of home politics while a few facts of interest and importance are drawn from the inspection of original documents such as the essex and sheldon papers which have not yet been printed the plan of the series does not admit of reference to authorities this requires mention as not only the statements but possibly here and there the actual phrases of the writers who have been consulted may be noticed i regret that the assigned limits have forbidden the introduction of an account of scotland during the period or of the remarkable scope and activity of english commercial enterprises in conclusion i wish to acknowledge two personal obligations to mr s r gardiner who in the midst of his own labours has found time now and continuously during several years to give advice and ungrudging assistance to one who is but a novice in the craft of which he is a master and to my friend mr w l sargent who has aided me with the revision of the proof sheets throughout the book osmondary birmingham october second eighteen eighty eight end of section one Section two of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter one Peace of Westphalia. One General Effect. The Peace of Westphalia, October twenty eighth, sixteen forty eight, which closed the desolating struggle of the Thirty Years' War, ushered in a new phase of European history with the exception of russia poland and turkey not yet to be regarded as european nations and of england absorbed in her own internal settlement there was not a country in europe which did not henceforth work under new conditions the political map was designed afresh the old names indeed were retained but new conceptions were associated with them france germany the empire spain and the countries of the north meant from this moment something profoundly different both individually and relatively from what they had previously meant the power of the austrian house was worn out the spanish branch had lost its old influence in italy its armies had been shattered at Rocroi and nordlingen it had been compelled through sheer weakness to abandon the struggle with the united provinces and it was hampered by domestic troubles while the german branch territorially and politically dissociated from the spanish had now to relax completely her failing grasp upon the princes of the empire and the free towns sweden had become dominant in the north but without a preponderance so great as to render her a danger to european peace france was for the time more than satisfied with the position in which she was left by the treaties and was regarded by the secondary states not as a menace but as a guarantee of their independence it was still more important that ideas which had in the past generally ruled the relations of peoples were ostensibly abandoned and a new groundwork of international policy was accepted with universal consent 
hitherto community of religion had been the recognized basis upon which alliances had been made and wars waged but the thirty years war is the last war of religion in europe the peace of westphalia did for european repose what henry of navarre had done for french unity waves of religious emotion indeed did afterwards from time to time momentarily influence a country's policy but only as incidental adjuncts to secular considerations for the first time in the history of christendom the wishes and decrees of the head of the catholic church were openly ignored in vain the papal nuncio strove to maintain the influence of rome in vain he protested in her name against the attacks which by the toleration of heretics and the secularization of ecclesiastical property were dealt to the church and in vain when the treaties were concluded and had become the law of europe the holy see declared them null invalid disavowed without force and without effect the thunders of rome fell upon unheeding ears the ecclesiastical idea had been replaced by a policy which boldly declared its national and secular origin henceforward it is the independence of individual states or to use a phrase as old as the reign of elizabeth the balance of power which becomes the ruling principle of international life two germany for germany three things were done in the first place there was granted an amnesty partial indeed within the hereditary domains of the emperor but complete and comprehensive over the rest of the empire this amnesty was no mere pardoning of political offences on the one side or the other but an absolute re-establishment of those who had been dispossessed of their territories during the war the religious difficulty was overcome by a compromise based on the peace of augsburg in fifteen fifty five between the rival faiths and between the rival branches of protestantism all questions of ecclesiastical property were determined by actual possession in sixteen twenty four that year being chosen as lying between sixteen eighteen the year when the thirty years war began and sixteen twenty seven when catholicism was again in the ascendant while a reconstitution of the extraordinary commissions of the diet with equal representation of catholics and protestants provided for the settlement of all future disputes finally the relations of the emperor to the states of the empire were so revised as to modify profoundly the political constitution under ferdinand the second and ferdinand the third the increasing power of the austrian house had gone far to stifle the independence of the princes of the empire and this independence they now recovered at the very base of the new settlement lay the condition that henceforth the free consent of the states of the empire assembled in diet should be necessary for all action on the part of the empire as a whole still more important was it that each state now secured the right of making foreign alliances so long as these were not directed against the emperor the empire the public peace or the treaty itself this was the work of french diplomacy mazarin took care to do in germany the reverse of what he was bent upon doing in france there we shall see him ready to sacrifice all to render the central power supreme over every form of independent and local action at home his aim was to weaken the central power to the utmost he followed the steps of richelieu in crushing the feudal idea in france he replaced and supported it in germany his object was that when occasion should arise it might be easy to create among these independent princes leagues which should paralyze the emperor's power of offensive action against france whilst they opened the way for her arms to the heart of the spanish low countries three france treaties of peace usually betoken a step in the rise or fall of nations for the power of the austrian house the peace of westphalia was a striking mark of decline for france it was the visible completion of a great bound to european supremacy it was emphatically a french triumph and as her efforts had been great 
so for her patronage of the new germanic federation france reaped a rich reward she was enabled at length to relinquish victoriously one part of her life and death struggle with the house of austria while by the condition that the emperor and empire were not to interfere in the war still to be fought out with spain she was set free to continue and to bring to a glorious termination twelve years later a conflict which had lasted with varying fortunes since the time of francis i the defenceless position of paris within but a few days march of an enemy's fortresses had ever been a source of anxiety to french statesmen to make her strategically as she was historically the heart of france was the principal aim of their diplomacy that aim was now in a great measure realized by the cession of upper and lower alsace with zundgau and the prefectures of ten imperial towns france gained the coveted rhine frontier by the possession of old breisach and the right of placing a garrison in philipsburg she secured two advanced posts in germany while the stipulation that between basel and philipsburg no fortress might be established on the right bank of the river several existing strongholds being dismantled placed the whole of the upper rhine with the exception of strasbourg and places belonging to immediate vassals of the empire unreservedly in her hands at the same time commerce and navigation were made free throughout its course thus while austria was no longer able to join hands with spain in the netherlands inasmuch as the intervening states were now independent and the emperor could not march through them without their leave france had secured a riverway into the heart of the united provinces the whole rhine valley indeed was at her mercy for the great ecclesiastical electorates of treves and mayence were in her interest she obtained moreover the full recognition of her rights to the bishoprics of metz toul and verdun with their districts a right which she had claimed and practically exercised since their conquest by henry the second and she thereby secured a new and easy road avoiding the strong fortress of stenay to the frontier of the spanish low countries lastly the undisputed possession of pinerolo which she had acquired in sixteen thirty two opened to her a path through the passes of the alps into piedmont by all these acquisitions france had placed herself beyond the possibility of a sudden attack on her eastern frontier for the full accomplishment however of her ambition she had to wait to the northeast lay the spanish low countries with their line of well-nigh impregnable fortresses for securing them or at least for neutralizing the danger which they threatened every french minister had his scheme richelieu had proposed to form of them a free state mazarin desired to conquer them the dutch proposed to divide them with france it will be seen that in this direction the ambition of france was for a time frustrated that though a great step was made at the peace of the pyrenees in sixteen fifty nine the spanish low countries were to form the object of thirty years more of intrigue and war four sweden sweden supported by france made good her claim to a heavy share in the spoils of victory she obtained the whole of nearer and part of further pomerania with the reversion of the rest on the extinction of the male branch of the brandenburg house she thus secured the towns of stetten gatz dam and golnau with the islands of rügen and wollen which gave her complete command of the mouths of the oder on both banks while the cession of the town and harbour of wismar the archbishopric of bremen and the bishopric of verden placed in her power the navigation of the elba all these she held as immediate fiefs of the empire and thus claimed for bremen verden and pomerania three voices in the imperial diet she was also allowed to erect a sovereign court at wismar with a university at greifswald she had thus assured to her a communication with the scandinavian states and her dominion of the baltic and not only was placed in a position of marked though not crushing supremacy in the north of europe but gained a distinct hold upon germany both territorially and consultatively which lasted until the treaty of stockholm in seventeen twenty 
5. Spain. From all participation in that part of the Peace of Westphalia which concerned France and the Emperor, Spain was rigorously excluded. Exhausted and bankrupt from the war with France and the struggle with the Dutch, she had long been anxious for peace. But the terms demanded by Mazarin in 1646 had been too much for her pride. That minister was bent upon wresting from her the barrier of fortresses which made French safety or extension to the northeast impossible. For this purpose, he proposed to exchange the Spanish Low Countries for Catalonia and Roussillon, then in the possession of France. But Spain hoped, in view of the confusion caused in France by the civil troubles, then nearly at their height, to regain Catalonia and Roussillon by force of arms. The Spanish Netherlands she determined to save in another way. She resolved to bow to necessity and to close her long and profitless struggle with her rebellious subjects. The Dutch on their side were at the time not unwilling to dissolve their long-standing alliance with France. They were alarmed at her rising power and at the prospect of a French army in occupation of the Spanish Low Countries, which at present formed a barrier between themselves and French ambition. Spain sedulously fostered this feeling, and on January 30th, 1648, concluded a treaty at Munster whereby she at last acknowledged the complete independence of the United Provinces. She ceded to them all the places in Brabant, Flanders, and Limburg, of which they were then in possession, afterwards known as the Generality, and she even granted liberty of conscience to all Dutch subjects in her territory. Lastly, she consented to close the navigation of the Scheldt and adjoining waterways, and so to ruin Antwerp, her great commercial centre, for the benefit of its Dutch rival, Amsterdam. Germany reconstituted upon a decentralization basis under the protection of France, which now became the foremost European power, the supremacy of Austria in Central Europe destroyed, Sweden in a position of commanding strength in the north, the Spanish monarchy severed from Austria and left face to face with France, Switzerland formally detached from the empire, the United Provinces a new and independent kingdom. Such is a rough political map of Europe after the Peace of Westphalia. End of section two. Section 3 of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 2. Prelude to the Fronde, Part 1. 1. Richelieu and Privilege, the Prime Ministership. Upon turning our eyes from the external grandeur of France to her internal condition, we behold a strange contrast. It well illustrates the tenacity of purpose which was the leading characteristic of Mazarin, that even while the last formalities of the treaty which made France the arbiter of Europe were taking place, he, with the youthful king and the queen mother, were voluntary exiles from the seat of government. So completely occupied indeed were the minds of all but the minister himself and a few of his fellow workers, with the beginnings of civil discord, that this great settlement passed almost without remark. To ninety-nine out of every hundred Frenchmen, the treaty between the Crown and the malcontents of Paris, under cover of which the court returned to the capital, was of infinitely greater interest than the Treaty of Westphalia, which was signed on the same day, and which expressed the change which had passed over the face of Europe. To realize the meaning of the disturbances which, under the name of the Fronde, went far during five years to render France powerless to take advantage of the position she had just gained, it will be necessary to refer somewhat in detail to the principle which had consistently guided the policy of Richelieu and his pupil Mazarin. This principle was by all means and at all costs to render the crown supreme over every rival influence. Henry the Fourth had understood that what France needed was national unity. Richelieu had felt that the first condition of national unity 
was the unquestioned and unlimited authority of the central power. His whole career was one unfaltering struggle with the spirit of privilege. He determined to turn the great feudal dignitaries into courtiers, the parliaments into mere courts of registration of the royal will. Beneath the kingship, all ranks of society were to occupy one common level of subservience. From the king was to issue all national activity. In him was to center all national aspirations. His earliest and most critical struggle was against the governors of provinces. These grandees had during the wars of religion well nigh shaken off even the semblance of submission to the royal authority. They raised troops, levied taxes, administered justice, made war or alliances, and were in every respect independent sovereigns of their provinces. They had even learned to regard their governments as hereditary rights. They thus formed a barrier to all attempts at centralization. Richelieu therefore endeavored to make their functions purely military and to render the governorship as costly and as powerless as possible. Every opportunity was taken to replace the governors whom he found in office in 1624 by men devoted to himself. Exile, the prison, and the scaffold were ruthlessly used. By their readiness to engage in plots against him, they played into his hands. Of the nineteen governors whom he found in 1624, four only remained at his death. The other fifteen posts had been filled by men devoted to his interests or had been absorbed into the monarchy. A still more effective blow against the genius of feudalism was the revival of the institution of intendants. These officers, chosen from the bourgeoisie, nominated and dismissed at will by the king, were devoted to the power to which they owed their existence, and it was specially laid down that they might not be the relatives or dependents of the governors. Their power was immense, extending at first only to matters of justice and police, but before long to finance, administration, and every department of government. By 1648 there were thirty-five of these officers with fixed posts in all the provinces, who, grasping little by little the whole provincial administration, and guided and supported by the central authority, in their resistance to the governors and all local bodies, were the essential machinery of the central system. As such, they were always the first object of attack at the hands of the classes whose privileges they had destroyed. Richelieu's task was an easy one in dealing with the general body of the noblesse. He had, indeed, no intention of destroying their privileges. Equality before the king was his main object, and he judged that the surest way to secure that equality was a separation of classes so decided that union was an impossibility. The fifth chapter of his Testament Politique is thus headed, Combien il est important que les diverses parties de l'État demeurent chacune dans l'entendu de ses bornes. He therefore did all in his power to confirm them as a superior caste, while as the means of sustaining their position he gave them the exclusive right to almost all offices of dignity and emolument, and allowed them to engage in commercial undertakings without derogation to their rank but he had no intention of permitting them to remain a political power. The conspiracies which they raised against him were nipped in the bud, and their leaders coldly and inexorably put to death, while the executions of de Boutville and des Chapelles, who had insolently defied the edict against dueling, taught their whole body that the king's commands might not be lightly disobeyed. The blow, however, which strikes the imagination most was one which marks in a vivid manner how great a space of time separated the political and social conditions of England and France. The France of Richelieu is the England of Henry II. By the ordinance of July 31, 1626, 
it was commanded that throughout the kingdom the fortifications of all towns and castles not needed for the defence of the frontiers should be destroyed as in england these castles were the haunts of oppression and formed the greatest burden of the peasant class accordingly an immense outburst of joy rose from the common people first throughout brittany and then throughout france since the days of louis the fat the monarchy had struck no greater blow for national unity against feudal oppression and anarchy all that remained of feudalism was stabbed to the heart richelieu's dealings with the church were conceived with the same view whilst he vehemently upheld the gallican liberties as the concrete expression of national life against the papal claims he was equally determined to allow no such independence in regard to the crown more than once he attacked in detail all the clerical immunities from taxation and compelled holders of benefices to recognize the full lordship of the king while on several occasions ordinances of a sweeping nature were issued without consultation with rome for the reform of both the regular and secular clergy new and frequent restrictions were also applied to ecclesiastical jurisdiction and the civil power intervened in many matters hitherto considered to be purely religious in their nature the local governing bodies had by the time of richelieu ceased in a great degree to possess political power and the cardinal faithful to his policy of balancing class against class had no desire to compass their further degradation occasionally however they formed centres of disturbance and they were then put down with a high hand thus troyes dijon and many other towns suffered the loss of part of their liberties while at la rochelle where in sixteen twenty eight the protestant schism in its political aspect was finally destroyed the municipal institutions were completely remodelled privas uze nimes anduze and montauban suffered the same treatment in sixteen twenty nine the revolt through sheer distress of the crocon in guienne in sixteen thirty seven and of the nupier in normandy in sixteen thirty nine led to a general annulling of privileges in these two provinces the jealousy of richelieu was still keener with regard to assemblies of a wider scope such as the etats generaux and the etats provinciaux the former indeed which corresponded with our english parliament were never summoned throughout his career while the latter which after sixteen twenty six were the only political bodies remaining with the right of approaching the sovereign were diligently suppressed the absence of any union or real legislative power among them rendered his task easy and at his death burgundy and languedoc were the only two provinces where the etats provinciaux retained so much as their old constitution with the parlement of the provinces and especially with the parlement of paris the conflict was more severe and prolonged originally this latter body was merely a part of the royal council charged with the administration of justice and with the duty of recording the decisions of the council itself it was also allowed the right called the droit de remonstrance of making observations upon these decisions from this right in the middle of the fifteenth century had sprung the claim to refuse to record the edicts unless their remonstrances were acted upon at the same period the members acquired fixity of tenure of their offices and a little later hereditary right the parlement of paris naturally became the incarnation of privilege in its most selfish and aggressive form taking advantage of every moment of weakness on the part of the central authority it had grown in strength until it had assumed the right of direct intervention in state affairs and of representing the etats generaux when that body was not sitting to richelieu this pretended sovereignty formed a permanent obstacle to the national welfare and he determined to crush it the struggle lasted without cessation for fourteen years in vain richelieu endeavoured by menaces 
by creations of new offices, by the exile and imprisonment of leading members, to bend the Parlement to his will. So incessant and so galling was its opposition, especially in the refusals to register the financial edicts rendered necessary by the enormous expenses of the war, that in 1641 he determined on a decisive step. In his famous manifesto of that year, he set forth the principles upon which alone the state could prosper, the complete equality and entire submission of all men before the king is the first condition for national grandeur and stability. Whensoever this had been lost sight of, as in the evil days of Henry the Third, misfortune had followed. The royal authority was now again threatened by the exorbitant claims of the Parlement. They were thereupon forbidden in the most express terms to take henceforward any cognizance whatever of state affairs. Whilst allowing the ancient droit de remonstrance, the declaration insisted upon the immediate registration of all edicts and declarations put forth from a lit de justice, or formal sitting of the king and parlement, whether these remonstrances were attended to or not. The application, moreover, of this right was confined to matters of pure finance. In all questions of state administration, the edicts were to be published and registered without any deliberation whatsoever. And to emphasize the determination of the court, the offices of several members who had been forward in resistance were suppressed by the king. De notre certaine science, pleine de puissance, et autorité royale. From this moment the Parlement ceased to be constitutionally a political assembly. We shall indeed see it, during the disturbances which followed the great cardinal's death, raising itself for a few years, only to sink into a dependence upon the central authority still more complete than before. It is probable that the events which were passing in England contributed to this decisive action of Richelieu. In any case, it is an interesting commentary upon the relative positions of the crown and its subjects in the two countries, that during the months of imprisonment of Stratford and Laud, and less than three months before the execution of the Prime Minister of Charles by the English representative Parliament, the Prime Minister of Louis was able by an act of masterful despotism to reduce to the position of a mere court of record of the royal will a turbulent and dangerous body of hereditary magistrates who had nothing in common with an English parliament but the name. Thus then, before he died, Richelieu had altered the whole face of government. Every element of local or corporate resistance had well-nigh disappeared or existed only in name. He left two ideas occupying the whole field, the old idea of the absolute monarchy, and the new idea which he created in France, and which Mazarin, after a hard struggle sustained, of the irresponsible prime ministership. It was in the fact that to Louis the Fourteenth, at the death of Mazarin, there descended both of these, the prestige and power of royalty, and the prestige and power of the premiership, that his extraordinary position was in a great degree owing. And it was the struggle, the selfish and frivolous struggle, of the privileged classes against the new creation and not against the monarchy that constituted the fronde. 2. Mazarin and the Reaction The absolutism established by Richelieu had lasted too short a time to crush out of his opponents the memory of their former influence. The instincts of privilege were awake and vigilant, and their opportunity speedily came. Louis the Thirteenth died but a few months after his great minister. He had faithfully carried out Richelieu's policy, but even during those months the iron rule had been relaxed so far as to awaken the hope of a great reaction. The state prisoners were released. The Parlement began at once to reclaim and to exercise that interference in state affairs off which Richelieu had so haughtily warned them. The banished members returned to Paris, and the suppressed officers were re-established. A declaration issued by Louis had imposed upon the Queen at his death a council by which her regency would be entirely controlled, 
and this declaration had been registered by the Parlement on the following day without resistance. Only four days after the king's death, however, the Parlement, by way of asserting its authority, abolished this council, on the ground that such a limitation of the regent's functions was contrary to the principles of the French monarchy, and placed the whole power unreservedly in the queen's hands. Both Richelieu and the Parlement had deceived themselves. The cardinal to whom the queen had naturally enough been a lifelong enemy, and who expected that her first wish would be to make peace with the House of Austria, of which she was a daughter, and for the overthrow of which he had striven so fiercely, had hoped by Louis's declaration to fetter her independence of action. The Parlement, anxious to assert its strength, and hoping to find in the enemy of Richelieu the enemy of Richelieu's policy, had now placed her by their own action in a position from which she was able before long to complete his work. They were soon enlightened. Thoughtful men looked forward with dread to a policy of revenge. The queen was advised to choose a counsellor committed to no faction, and she chose, to the surprise and disgust of Richelieu's opponents, his pupil and confidant, Mazarin. A princess of Spain, guided by an Italian adventurer of low birth, was to complete the ruin of the Spanish monarchy and the consolidation of the French people. From first to last, Mazarin served the queen through every crisis with unfailing skill, and she sustained him against all assaults with unswerving fidelity. The fame of Mazarin has suffered from the fact that he followed Richelieu. Undoubtedly, he will always occupy a lower place in the world's history than his great predecessor. His character was not so heroic, his personality so imposing, his energy so fierce, his conception so grandiose, his grasp so comprehensive, or his spirit so high. Where Richelieu struck, he bribed. Where Richelieu defied, he bent the knee. The contrast at the outset of his career is thus described by the master hand of the Cardinal de Retz. L'envoyé sur les degrés du trône, du l'apre et redoutable Richelieu, avait foudoyé plutôt que gouverner les humains, un successeur doux et bénin, qui ne voulait rien, qui était au désespoir que sa dignité de cardinal ne lui permettait pas de se milier autant qu'il le souhaitait devant tout le monde. Nonetheless, Mazarin stands before us throughout his career as the one man of his time in France, alone not merely in coolness and clear sight and good sense, but in that which most distinguishes a man from the mass of men, the distinct perception of a distant goal, and an unfaltering determination to reach it. If he had not the force of Richelieu, he was at least as supple and vigilant. If he did not show himself so masterful of the present, it was perhaps because he saw the future more clearly and fixed his eye too exclusively upon that. His patience, fertility of resource, and tenacity of purpose were exhaustless. Brought up in the Italian school of policy, expediency was his only guide. All lines of conduct were of merit in his eyes, whatever moral verdict might be passed on them by others, according as they tended, even while apparently leading him far from the direct road, to bring him in time nearer to his object. He knew neither close friendships nor lasting hatreds, for either of them might prove a hindrance to his progress. And if in founding a great policy, Richelieu had to overcome colossal difficulties, he had advantages which Mazarin in his conflict to carry that policy to a triumphant conclusion conspicuously lacked. Richelieu was a Frenchman of gentle birth, and he was the irresponsible minister of a king in the plenitude of his power. Mazarin was a foreigner, scarce able to speak the language of the country he aspired to rule, and his task was, while his mind was filled with far-off design, to uphold without flinching, sometimes in exile and in danger of his life, at a period when every turbulent and selfish element of political life held riot, the authority of an infant king. 
At the outset of their career, the hands of Mazarin and the Queen Regent were strengthened by an opportune event. On May 19, 1643, the desperate valour of Enghien and his horsemen swept away the renowned Spanish infantry at Rocroi. By this feat of arms, which marks the transference of military supremacy from the Spanish to the French race, a lustre was thrown upon the policy of Richelieu, which was, of course, reflected on the new government. At the same time, the support of the king's uncle, the fickle and characterless Orléans, and of Enguillon's father, Condé, were for the present secured for the court by liberal promises. The first attack upon Mazarin came not from either of the great interests which had been depressed, but from a faction of persons who, while without judgment or principle, were active and unscrupulous enough to be dangerous. The Duke of Beaufort, grandson of Henry IV and Gabriel d'Estrée, whose only respectable quality was that of personal courage, had collected around him his father Vendôme, his insignificant brother Mercure, and a number of the less reputable noblesse who had not dared to raise their heads against Richelieu. With the most paltry designs, they mingled the most high-sounding maxims and called themselves after the Roman patriots whose deeds they professed to emulate. The ridiculous side of the affair was soon recognized by the ready wit of the laughter-loving Parisians. It was the age of nicknames, Beaufort, whose handsome figure and licentious life made him popular among the lower bourgeoisie, was soon known as the Roi des Halles, king of the marketplace, while his adherents were styled the Importants. With them were joined the returning exiles Guise, Elbeuf, Epernon, and others, while the court ladies, delighted at a new excitement and led by the famous Duchesse of Chevreuse and Madame de Montbazon, threw themselves eagerly into the plot. Gallantry, as was fitting, caused the breaking up of the intrigue. A quarrel for precedence between Madame de Montbazon and Enguillon's sister, Madame de Longueville, led to the disgrace of the former. Beaufort, who was her lover, determined to avenge her by the assassination of Mazarin. Warned of the danger and recognizing the feebleness of the conspiracy, Mazarin at once struck his blow. Beaufort was arrested and imprisoned. Vendôme, the Duchesse of Chevreuse, and the other leaders were exiled from Paris, and the party disappeared amid universal ridicule. Mazarin now felt strong enough to resist with steadiness the claims of the grandees. Elbeuf and Epernon indeed received governments, but Bouillon was refused Sedan, and though Vendôme demanded the important government of Brittany, the queen took it into her own hands. Meanwhile, the Parlement was eagerly exercising its reasserted claim to interfere in state matters. The aristocracy of the robe was a more dangerous enemy than that of the noblesse, and a powerful means of attack was now furnished them. It was no fault of Mazarin that the finances of France were in a desperate condition. The expenses of the war had been enormous, and the constitutional machinery of taxation was not calculated for the strain. At Richelieu's death, the revenue had been anticipated for three years, supplies having been borrowed at exorbitant interests. Nor can the prodigality of the first year of the Regency, when the current phrase, la reine est si bonne, well expressed the incapacity of Anne of Austria to resist the importunity of the courtiers, and when the indispensable support of Orléans and Condé could be secured only by enormous bribes, be laid to his charge, the state of things that had to be faced at present was that the expenditure which in 1642 was 99 millions of livres had risen in 1644 to 124 millions, of which no less than 59 millions were absorbed by the rapacity of the courtiers and the farmers of the taxes. But it was the manner in which these sums were raised more than the sums themselves which led to opposition. The bankers who provided the loans had duties assigned to them in repayment, which they themselves collected. There was thus every opportunity for oppression and embezzlement. The bankers grew enormously rich. What, however, most roused the anger of the people was the knowledge that Emery, the controller general of finance, a man of the vilest character, was the worst trafficker in the spoil, 
and that he was protected by Mazarin. The taille, a direct tax upon property which was levied almost entirely upon the peasantry, and which was peculiarly vexatious in its incidence, had at first been excluded from the bankers' operations. It now, however, fell into their hands and became a terrible burden. Provinces which had never seen an enemy were devastated as though a destroying army had passed over them, and popular revolts broke out in several quarters. Expedients still more desperate were resorted to. Twelve millions were borrowed at twenty-five per cent. Two hundred fresh offices were created for sale. A tax of joie avenement was levied upon all royal officers. The towns, communes, corporations, persons exempted from the tie, and innkeepers. Permanent duties to the crown were redeemed for cash. Grants of domain lands revoked. Dues for bequests rigidly exacted from the clergy. And when all was done, the greater part of the money thus raised was swallowed up in the repayment of loans. Emery now took the step which led to the first direct collision with the Parlement. Charles I's abuse of the law of ship money may have suggested to him a similar abuse of the law called the Toise, by which in 1548 the building of houses outside the walls of Paris had for a special purpose been forbidden. In January 1644 a tax of 40 sous was laid on every Toise of land thus built upon, and the government declined to allow appeals to be carried before the Parlement. Parlement at once declared this to be a violation of their privileges. The refusal of the court to give way was met by what came perilously near to an armed revolt. The mob threatened to burn down Emery's house. The more violent section of the Parlement openly avowed that a general rising was what they wished to bring about. The government recoiled before the danger. Some other method had to be found. The Toise had fallen upon the poorer classes. Emery now proposed to raise the necessary supplies from the rich, and by the tax des aises, a kind of forced loan, he hoped to obtain eighteen or twenty millions. The Parlement willingly gave up the detested money lenders to be spoiled, but they insisted on complete exemption for themselves and for all officials connected with them or with the university, as well as for merchants of only moderate wealth. These exceptions reduced the receipts to insignificance. Emery once more fell back in March 1645 upon the Toise. The riotous opposition of the younger members was at this time met with firmness by the court. The deputation which was summoned by the Queen to give an account of their conduct received a scolding as from our own Queen Elizabeth. Barillon, one of the presidents and an adherent of the important, was arrested, and three other leading malcontents were exiled. In this state of things, Mazarin looked anxiously abroad. Again, Anguillon came to his aid by the victory of Nordlingen, August the 3rd, 1645. The prestige thus gained was at once turned to advantage. On September 5th, the boy king was brought to Paris to hold a lit de justice. From any decrees passed at this, the most solemn ceremony known to the Constitution, there was no escape short of civil war. For such an extremity, matters were not yet ripe, and the Parliament ceased open opposition. The government wisely withdrew both the Toise and the Tax des Aises, but an immense number of new offices were created, taxes on divers trades and many other expedients for raising money were registered, the clergy, the great trading companies, and the officials of the sovereign courts were compelled to contribute largely. For a year, no further difficulty was experienced. End of Section 3 Section 4 of The English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 2. Prelude to the Fronde, Part 2. Number 3. The Prince of Condé. Great as was the service which the successes of Anguien, now to be known as Condé, his father having died, had rendered the government his position was the cause of much anxiety to Mazarin. 
whether for generalship or personal prowess he formed the most brilliant military figure of the time as a great cavalry leader he has had no equal marlborough was not more calm nor rupert more impetuous to him were given the face and figure that beseem the warrior the ringing voice to rally a squadron reeling from the charge the eagle eye which notes every desperate chance the instantaneous decision which compels the fate of battle he became the idol of the proud and warlike youth who had fought and conquered with him at rocroi and nordlingen and who emulating his cool carelessness in danger and his desperate valour in action formed the nucleus of that household brigade which earned for itself so terrible a fame throughout europe supreme as he was however in the battlefield conde's character was marred by unfortunate weaknesses he was foppish irritable intemperate in thought and language and inordinately vain his followers imitated the defects of their master and what was pardonable in the great soldier became absurd in them with their wonted readiness the parisians took hold of the poorer side of their character the supercilious airs the foppishness of dress and they have come down to us as the petit maître intoxicated with his well-earned glory and with the adulation of this band of worshippers influential alike by the enormous wealth and power which he had inherited and by his near relation to the throne conde now began to evince a dangerous ambition in this ambition he was firmly withstood by mazarin and the queen to allow one man to become so powerful was to throw up the game the check sank deep into conde's mind to the contempt of the noble for the bourgeois and of the warrior for the statesman was now added a feeling of active hostility which at no distant time was to bear fruit number four encroachments of the parlement this however was not the danger that was momentarily pressing upon the government the financial troubles were again urgent in addition to indirect taxation which raised no opposition from the people emery now put in action one of the edicts of sixteen forty five by which all possessors of lands held on an annual rental to the crown were ordered to redeem that rent by payment of a year's revenue the peculiar sting of this lay in the fact that while the rent had not been changed since the middle ages and was therefore practically nominal the revenue had continually increased the bourgeoisie were at once in arms against the rachat for three days the palais royal was besieged by a crowd of angry citizens the announcement that a lit de justice was to be held to bear down opposition intensified the excitement dangerous talk was heard the successful insurrection of mazaniello in naples was quoted during the night the firing of musketry was heard in the streets the bourgeois were trying their arms urged on by their necessities the government nevertheless were firm the lit de justice was held the operation of the rasha was indeed postponed but money was again raised by new creations especially of maitre de requete the young king and mazarin had to listen to some plain speaking for ten years sire said omer talon the president the country districts have been ruined the peasants compelled to lie upon straw their furniture sold for the payment of taxes and for ten years to minister to the luxury of paris millions of innocent folk are obliged to live upon rye and oat bread and their only protection is their poverty their souls and nothing else are their own and that is only because they cannot be sold the historian of the french revolution finds its direct cause in the state of misery to which the peasantry were reduced under the administrations of richelieu and mazarin over the creation of maitre de requete serious opposition again broke out the existing officials loudly denied the right to create new offices during the minority of the king belonging as they did to the haute bourgeoisie officially connected with the parlement and in some cases allied to the noblesse they were a dangerous body to attack the parlement gladly made their cause its own it now went a step further than hitherto in its encroachments it refused at first 
to vote the edicts registered at the lit de justice except that of the Russia and some others which it allowed with modifications in the end however it shrank once more from open conflict none the less it continued its examination of the edicts sous le bon plaisir du roi the example told upon the provinces both in brittany and at toulouse there was open and violent resistance a last resource was now discovered by the ingenuity of Emery, the paulette so named after its originator paulet who lived in the reign of henry the fourth was an annual tax paid by all officials who had a right to the heredity of their offices once in every nine years it was subject to revision before renewal and sixteen forty eight was the year at which a fresh revision was due emery now in addition to ceasing all payments to the creditors of government for a year a device afterwards imitated by charles the second in the stop of the exchequer and of salaries to the inferior officials determined to demand as a condition of the renewal a fine of four years salary in the hope of avoiding the opposition of the parlement the fine was not to be levied upon that body but the bribe was refused on the contrary the parlement signed a bond of union may thirteenth sixteen forty eight with the other sovereign courts and decided to send deputies to a conference in the chamber of st louis the court immediately recognized the significance of such a step and determined to oppose the meeting with resolution it was not to be imagined that an assembly so formed would limit its actions to the single purpose for which it was ostensibly convened two leading deputies were arrested others were exiled from paris and threats of severer measures were thrown out suddenly at the moment when the court seemed in command of the situation events occurred which compelled mazarin to temporize orleans joined the malcontents beaufort the leader of the important had escaped from vincennes the provinces were stirring for revolt abroad too matters were going ill the spaniards had taken courtrai and were gaining ground fast a conference was therefore opened with the parlement at which mazarin made a striking representation of the danger of its action discord he said was giving to spain greater advantages than she could gain by force of arms the refusal of supplies would speedily make useless all the expenditure of blood and treasure already incurred catalonia must be abandoned the alliance with sweden and other powers to whom france gave subsidies must be broken off his words were vain personal and selfish interests were supreme mazarin saw that resistance at the moment was useless he succeeded in inducing the haughty queen to bend before the canaille as she called them in her anger to promise the release of the imprisoned members and the acceptance of the demands of the parlement parlement at once sent deputies to the chamber of st louis and thus at first in defiance of the queen and at length on june thirtieth sixteen forty eight with her consent was formed a body which became as was anticipated a permanent political assembly sitting during its own pleasure like our long parliament for the reform of the kingdom the aristocracy of the robe had won a definite victory over ministerial power five the english rebellion and the fronde between the five years barren turmoil of the fronde and the contemporary struggle of the english parliament with charles i there are points of superficial similarity sufficiently striking to suggest comparison in both cases the conflict arose from the ill-defined character of the prerogative in relation to the other powers of the state and in both the prime ministership the special characteristic of absolutism was in the first instance the object of attack in both the contending forces under the stress of war each summoned to its help foreign aid and in both the anti-absolutist party established in defiance of the constitution a permanent assembly the one in the chamber of st louis the other in the long parliament but here resemblance ceases the differences between the two movements were radical and profound how real was the one 
how purposeless in comparison was the other, may be inferred from the fact that whereas the English movement reacted constantly upon the French, the events of the Fronde received not the slightest attention from, even if they were known to, those who in England were engaged in a conflict which absorbed every quality of heart and brain. The English contest was at once accentuated and ennobled by religious and intellectual antagonism of the intensest character. It was a contest of modes of thought, an earnest faith in the righteousness of their cause, an enthusiastic conviction in the direct interposition of God in their behalf, sustained the noblest of Charles's antagonists in every reverse, and carried them forward to every victory and it is this which clothes the English rebellion with tragic dignity. To the Fronde this religious element was utterly wanting, and so there was in it no trace of heroism. For Falkland, eagerly welcoming the death which saved him from witnessing longer the agony of his country, for Hampton praying with his last breath for her relief, for Milton sanctifying rebellion by a divine eloquence, it has absolutely no figures to show. So, too, in face of the struggle of great principles which constituted the English rebellion, family ties were unhesitatingly, if mournfully, sacrificed, and gallantry and intrigue were powerless. In the whole annals of the Civil War scarcely a woman's name occurs. But the pages of the Fronde are crowded with the names of women, beautiful, clever, and brave, but licentious and unprincipled, who swayed the fortunes of the fight at the caprice of their amour or the ambition of their families, who had each of them her price, and to gain whom occupied the constant attention of Mazarin and his opponents alike. We look in vain to the leaders of the Fronde for self-sacrifice or the idea of duty, for far-reaching sight or for controlling force we look in vain for an Eliot, a Pym, or a Cromwell. We find instead de Retz, whose highest ambition was to be the leader of a faction, and whose strongest motive was personal hatred of Mazarin, who, despising his dupes, merely amused himself with revolt. We find Beaufort, vain, silly, and petulant, the darling of shopkeepers' wives, Condé, leading more than once the hereditary enemies of his country against his king with no higher object than the satisfaction of his vanity or leon slothful timid and blown about with every varying wind of fortune beside them there flash across the stage with all the picturesque garb and incident of the time many gay and gallant figures as brilliant in their contrast with the sombre men of the english revolution as the causes for which they contested were light and fleeting in comparison with the stern purposes of that great fight the contrast is expressed in the names a fronde was a sling used by boys in their play the english movement was indeed a revolution the french movement was but a mischievous burlesque of a revolution and as such it is fitly known by a name derived from the sport of gamin and schoolboys. To these, the profoundest of the differences which forbid comparison, there are others little less striking to be added. The English Parliament represented freely and directly the whole English people. The Parliament of Paris was a body of permanent officials who, though they had acquired considerable power, possessed constitutionally no legislative or even deliberative functions, represented no interests but their own, and discovered in every action the inveterate selfishness of a narrow and grasping caste. In England, the intimate connection between all the members of the social body, the sympathy, the comradeship indeed, between nobles and commoners, governed and governing classes, made cooperation not merely feasible but natural, and enabled the whole nation from highest to lowest to take in the struggle an eager and constant part. In France, the baneful division of classes, long existing and sedulously encouraged by Richelieu, was fatal to all such common action. 
the bourgeoisie had no support in an impoverished and despairing peasantry and though for a time officialism might enlist the scornful support of an idle and arrogant noblesse the unnatural alliance gave way as soon as a common danger was removed the english movement was national the french was personal one more difference of far-reaching import must be noticed old and venerable as was the idea of monarchy in england its place in the english mind was disputed and in many cases occupied by the representative idea which had grown up with it side by side and so it happened that though destroying forever all hope for royal absolutism the english revolution was eminently constructive the parliament saw more clearly than the king what they wanted and this they were able to obtain without a king the machinery of government was ready to their hand the destruction of monarchy as a temporary measure was therefore possible without national disintegration very different was it in france even previous to the ministry of richelieu the idea of the sacredness of monarchy had been all-pervading and he had striven to raise it to the rank of a religion it had absorbed into itself all other ideas of government and it never entered into any frenchman's head that monarchy could be dispensed with for a day and thus the french movement was eminently destructive it is impossible to see even now what could have taken the place of the french absolutism except disastrous and illimitable confusion had either officialism or grandeeism triumphed it was the sense of this that led to the final failure of the fronde how different were the issues in the two countries may be judged from the party cries in england the royalist cried god and the king his opponent answered with god and the parliament in france even while the king was a child there were but two serious variations upon vive le roi they were vive le roi et les princes and à bas le mazarin end of section four section five of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter three the parliamentary fronde part one number one concessions of the court the first or parliamentary period of the fronde possessed a certain title to respect amid the mob of interested officials turbulent nobles intriguing priests and clamorous bourgeois were to be found men who represented the highest type of citizen life whom neither anne of austria nor the mob of paris could terrify nor mazarin cajole and though violence folly selfishness and confusion marked its course and though all zeal for the welfare of the country was soon forgotten in the indulgence of an unreasoning hate of mazarin this movement had nevertheless the merit of attacking however interestedly and however inopportunely a taxation that had become ruinous and an administration of reckless waste for a while mazarin appears not to have recognized the gravity of the situation he was ignorant in a great degree of the constitution of the country and it was the intrigues in the court which appeared important to him and now at the very moment when the chamber of st louis had established its position as an imperium in imperio of the most threatening character he was occupied with the endeavours of the duke of longueville who had married the sister of conde to acquire the right to sit among the princes of the blood he was however soon awakened the thirty-two delegates were already busy in claiming the control of every branch of the administration with a just instinct they first fell upon the intendants by whose appointment richelieu had dealt so severe a blow to vested interests and local privileges they demanded the dismissal of these officers and the transference of their duties to the three thousand petty officials whom they had superseded they then asked for the remission of a quarter of the tie and of all arrears since sixteen forty seven 
the annulling of all contracts with the financiers regarding it, and the strict appropriation of the supplies gained from it to the purposes of the war. A chamber of justice was to be created to investigate the extortions of the farmers of the taxes. The proposal that no tax should in future be levied unless previously voted by the Parliament was doubtless prompted by the action of the Long Parliament in England, as was also the claim that no one should be detained in prison for more than twenty-four hours without being brought to trial before his proper judges. The trading classes demanded the abolition of all monopolies and abuses in the sale of necessaries and the protection of native industries. No new offices were to be created without the consent of Parliament, and there should be no diminution of salaries. All these demands of the chamber which were endorsed and presented by the Parliament were in direct denial of the doctrine that to the crown alone belonged all legislative authority. Furious at the arrogance of the Canai, Anne of Austria for a time refused to listen to these demands. But Mazarin, now fully alive to the danger and especially to the precariousness of his own personal position, induced her to temporize. Emery was dismissed. The intendancies, all but three, were revoked. A diminution of one-eighth of the tie was offered, and the desired chamber of justice was decreed. The late appointments which had caused so much jealousy were revoked, the diminished salaries restored to the original sums, and the Paulette renewed. The right of the Parliament to verify financial edicts was acknowledged. The Queen, in her own phrase, threw roses at the Parliament. In return for these concessions, the court demanded that the Chamber of St. Louis should be dissolved and that the Parliament should return to its purely judicial functions, which had lately been much neglected. The Frondeur, in reply, pointed out the omission of any satisfactory mention of the point upon which they felt most strongly, arbitrary arrest, and they urged the summoning by the Crown of a general assembly composed of the different chambers. Again Mazarin had great difficulty in calming the queen, who, as he told her, was valiant as a soldier who does not recognize danger and who was for immediate conflict. He himself was looking eagerly abroad and was waiting only until his hands should be again strengthened by a striking military success. Number 2. Beginning of Revolution In the end of August, great news arrived. On the 20th, Condé gained the victory of Lens, which well-nigh completed the ruin of the Spanish military strength. The opportunity was instantly seized. While the Te Deum was being chanted for the victory, Broussel and Blancmesnil, two of the councillors who had been foremost in opposing the court, were arrested by the Queen's orders. Within an hour the people sedulously nursed for sedition by Mazarin's opponents were in uproar. They thronged the city, threw up barricades, and let down the chains which barred the narrow streets. In an incredibly short time, Paris was an impassable camp, and the whole city was in arms. And now, while the cry of Vive le Roi was shouted as loudly as ever, was heard with it the watchword of the next five years, Point de Mazarin. Number three, the Cardinal de Retz. During all the troubles that had now opened upon France, no influence was more actively exerted for mischief than that of Jean-Francois Paul de Gondi, better known by his later title of Cardinal de Retz. Of Italian birth, he had risen by the favor of Richelieu and by his own talents and craft, until, having taken orders, he became, after a youth of dissipation, coadjutor to his uncle, the aged Archbishop of Paris. A dualist and a libertine with no spark of religious feeling, and hating his profession, he looked to it nevertheless to secure for him an eminent place in the turmoil of politics. To increase the importance of his office, he asserted and maintained his right of precedence, even over the Duke of Orléans, and insisted upon the fullest recognition of his ecclesiastical rank. By the careful performance of all the outward duties of his place, by a well-feigned humility, 
by profuse almsgiving and by an ostentatious attention to the interests of the poor he secured among them a dangerous influence diminutive in stature and with signal disadvantages of person he possessed a charm of tongue with which it was as easy for him to sway the passions of the mob or the councils of the parliaments as to seduce women or entice men into conspiracy conspiracy indeed was the aim of his existence he is the unique example of a man of great and powerful mind deliberately setting before himself as the highest attainable object the position of a successful faction leader such a title he declared was the most honourable that he could find in plutarch's lives at the age of eighteen he had written a history of the conspiracy of jean louis de fiesque in which are laid down all the rules of successful treason higher qualities were he declared needed to form a successful faction leader than to form a great emperor of the universe and catiline was a greater man than caesar for the career of his adoption he was admirably suited by the endowments of his italian birth he had the supple resoluteness the ready resource and the absolute unscrupulousness of his countrymen he was free from all personal ties other than that of a licentious but calculating attachment to one or two of the women whose names are notorious among the female leaders of the fronde of statesmanship he possessed no trace and the cause for which he fought so long as it was the cause of confusion was a matter of indifference to him his action was at present decided by an intense jealousy of mazarin and by the perception that in opposition to him could be found the fullest opportunity for the exercise of his powers but he valued good taste in treason as he valued it in art his natural feeling for the fitting in time and place had made him keep aloof from the important for whom as for many of his later associates he professed a hearty contempt now however he considered his time had come arrayed in his ecclesiastical vestments he went to the palais royal and urged upon the queen the release of Bruxelles. rather would i strangle him with my own hands was the passionate reply the royal guards were ordered out to disperse the crowd but they were stopped by the first barricades de retz accompanied them and endeavoured he says to soothe the tumult on his return to the court he was received by anne with bitter sarcasm vous avez bien travaillé monsieur allez-vous reposer the insult sank deep and henceforth he pursued a course of bitter enmity to the queen and mazarin for two days the mob remained under arms loss of life took place and the royal officers were insulted and attacked the parlement passed in a body through the seething streets to demand the release of the prisoners twice they were repelled with anger by anne on their third visit the president to molay informed the queen that if she did not give way he would not answer longer for the consequences at the entreaties of mazarin and orleans she at length consented to a compromise the parlement gave up its pretensions to interfere in state administration with some minor exceptions and in return Bruxelles was set at liberty his entry on august twenty eighth was one long triumphal procession the people in a delirium of joy at their victory flung themselves at his feet and addressed him as their saviour and protector having offered his thanks at notre dame he was escorted to the grand chamber and there received the congratulations of the parlement the frenzy fit which had seized the people then passed off with the picturesque rapidity which had marked its beginning within a few hours the barricades had disappeared the mob had melted away and paris was in absolute repose it was as if a troubling dream had come suddenly to an end number four mazarin's measures the court leaves paris but mazarin was not deceived he foresaw further attacks and he resolved to be beforehand with his opponents on the very day after the return of Bruxelles, he drew up for the queen notes of the course of action to be pursued an agreement with de retz and the other leaders of the opposition must be ostentatiously concluded the court must then leave paris 
suspicion must be lulled until Condé's return, and a blow must then be struck which should at once restore the royal authority. In the meantime, the malcontents were to be divided by all possible means. Circumstances were favourable to this design. To the whole trading class these troubles meant confusion and loss. Already the guilds had met the principal shopkeepers and had determined to meddle in nothing against the king's service. The queen took pains to gain over the provost of the merchants, the commander of the city militia, and the captains of the quarters. Mazarin himself treated directly with many members of the Parlement, and was so successful that even Broussel and Blancmesnil appeared at court. This, however, served only to exasperate the younger members. Acting under the instigation of de Retz, they met privately and determined to attack Mazarin personally by agitating for the revival of the Edict of 1617, which proscribed all foreigners who interfered in the government of France. Mazarin now carried out his plan. At six in the morning of September 13th, the court left Paris for Rouelle, ten miles distant, where it was joined by Orléans, Condé, and the Duke of Longueville. This was followed by the dismissal of Chateauneuf and the arrest of Chavigny, old rivals of Mazarin, who were caballing with the disaffected members of the Parlement. Far from intimidating, this blow served only to irritate that jealous body. A deputation was sent to the Queen to demand the release of Chavigny, the return of the court, and the presence of the princes of the blood at the deliberations of the Parlement. These demands were angrily rejected. Condé especially distinguished himself by the violence of his language. The decrees of the Parlement were annulled by the Council, and it was half decided to supplant that body by royal commissions. The Parlement, on its side, prepared for defensive war. All business was discontinued, the city was secured against a surprise, and provisions were laid in for the expected siege. Number 5. Mazarin and Condé Everything in this contest is spasmodic, except the will and the design of Mazarin. The uncertain temper of Condé, to whom all men looked as possessing the power of the sword, had especially to be reckoned with. It was well known that much as he despised the Frondeurs, his hatred of Mazarin was a still more powerful feeling. He had hitherto passionately refused to join in harassing the crown, but now de Retz had little difficulty in persuading him to consent to a conference at which his jealousy of the cardinal should be gratified by the latter's exclusion. Mazarin did not care to contest the point. Whether the hatred against him was genuine may be doubted, but there is no doubt as to the vehemence of its expression at this time. No story of his crimes was too wild for credit, he was a robber, a traitor, a gambler, a usurer, an atheist, and a debauchee. To sack and burn Paris, to ruin France for his own greed, and to keep her at war with foreign nations that he might the better maintain himself in his usurped authority, were represented to be the objects of his life. The conference lasted ten days. It resulted in the declaration of October twenty second, 1648 in which the greater number of the claims made by the Chamber of Saint-Louis were conceded. But the root idea of the Constitution, that in the King's presence nothing could be refused or combated which he personally announced, was preserved in the retention of the power to hold lit de justice, while as to arbitrary arrests, a verbal promise never intended to be kept was all that could be wrung from Anne. If I consent to such requests, said the queen, my son would be no better than the king of a pack of cards. Mazarin now devoted himself to again fixing the fickle humor of Condé. The task was not an easy one, but the prince could not yet forget that he was of royal blood, and he had the true cast contempt for the Jean de Chiquen of the Parlement, who pretended to tutor the king of France. His own interests, moreover, had not yet been awakened against the court. Mazarin, ever watchful and patient, was therefore before long successful. Condé yielded to the flatteries of the queen and to the assurances of the cardinal that the government should be conducted solely by his advice. In December the compact was closed, 
by the cession to Condé of the governments of Stenay and four other important places. Bribery, on a similar scale, was equally successful with Orléans. End of Section 5section six of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter three the parliamentary fronde part two number six the court leaves paris a second time beginning of civil war the court had meanwhile at the desire of the merchants returned to paris but the atmosphere was no less charged with trouble than before. Disappointed at the non-fulfillment of the Declaration of October 22nd, the Parlement was again in uproar. De Retz, fully in his element, stirred up the flame of sedition to the utmost. He found assistance from the authors of the innumerable pamphlets known as Mazarinade, libelous writings against the Cardinal and the Queen, which without pretensions of literary merit tickled the ears of the parisians with their mendacious and brutal allusions mazarin pointed out to the queen that the revolution in england had been preceded by a similar phenomenon and bade her remember that when in order to stop such writings charles i had sacrificed strafford he had but begun his own downfall by encouraging the Parliament to cry for further concessions. Secure for the time in the support of Condé and Orléans, the court now determined upon force. Mazarin had long planned to retire to Saint-Germain, occupy the strategic points, and prevent the entrance of provisions into Paris. At three in the morning of January 5th, 1649, the queen left the Palais Royal a second time in haste and secrecy. At Saint-Germain she was joined by Mazarin, the princes, and the court. Paris, on its awakening, heard with stupor and affright of the departure. The citizens saw war, siege, and famine at their gates. Undismayed, however, the Parlement met. All available measures of defence were taken, provisions were hastily collected, the gates were shut and guarded. The civil war had begun. Number 7. The Twelve Weeks' War Mazarin had been quietly preparing for this decisive action by collecting troops in the neighborhood of Paris, and although they were yet too few to form any real blockade, he was able, so far to hinder the entry of supplies, that serious inconvenience was soon felt. The shopkeepers with a considerable body within the Parlement were anxious to come to terms, but the earnest opponents of absolutism with the discontented noblesse and the lower classes were bent upon resistance. De Retz was ceaselessly active, and under his influence the mob was soon in a state of wild excitement. The houses of known adherents of the court were pillaged, and any who attempted to escape to Ruel ran serious risk of their lives. An army of 12,000 men was raised, de Retz furnishing a regiment of cavalry at his own expense, and a heavy war tax was voted for their payment. A royal edict ordering the Parlement to retire to Montargis was met by a vote to demand the immediate dismissal and banishment of Mazarin. The Frondeur had indeed raised an army, but it was one that could not be trusted to meet the regular troops, and it was without leaders who could be opposed to Condé, the General du Mazarin, as he was now called. The want was partially supplied by the arrival of the Duke of Elbeuf, an old opponent of Richelieu. He was at once named Commander-in-Chief. His dignity, however, was short-lived. The divisions within the Condé family and the jealousy of Mazarin were skilfully made use of by de Retz and the prince's sister, the Duchess of Longueville. They sent secretly to Saint-Germain to offer the post to Conti, Condé's brother, a youth both physically and mentally infirm, and on the night of January 7th, Conti, Longueville, Marciac, and Le Motte ou de Cour deserted the court. They were soon joined by Beaufort and by Bouillon, the brother of Turenne. Danger threatened from two other quarters. 
Turenne, the general of greatest repute in France after Condé, and greatly Condé's superior in tactical skill, was on the frontier with a large body of troops, partly French and partly Alsatian mercenaries, whom he was endeavouring to induce to follow him against the royal forces. Normandy, where the Longueville family was powerful, was preparing for revolt. The dangers, however, were well and coolly met. Normandy rose, but the Duke of Longueville, who had been sent thither by his wife, was completely kept in check by Arcourt for the king, and when Turenne had resolved to march to Paris, he found that before he could do so, he should have to fight his own troops. The mercenaries had been made safe by the distribution of three hundred thousand livres. Never had Mazarin applied money to better purpose. Turenne at once retired to Heilbronn and thence to Holland, until the end of the Twelve Weeks' War. Meantime, within Paris, the insurrection was in full swing. The Bastille and the Arsenal had been taken by the Frondeurs, while the surprise of Charenton at the junction of the Marne and Seine secured for a time a free entry for provisions. But here the successes of the Frondeurs ceased. An attempt by Beaufort to take Corbeil was ignominiously defeated. More than one sortie was driven back, and Charenton was recaptured by Condé on February 8th. A natural reaction, headed by the clergy, began to declare itself. For a time, the violent section fought hard to keep the upper hand. An emissary of the court who was found distributing loyal literature was closely imprisoned. A herald from the king to the parlement was refused admittance on the curious ground that heralds could pass only between enemies and equals, and that to receive him would be to admit that the parlement was the enemy and the equal of the king. Still the credit of the irreconcilables was daily growing less, the process of disintegration being aided by the vexatious nature of the devices for raising money. To provide a fresh stimulus for this flagging spirit, de Retz now began to intrigue directly with Spain. The Spaniards were ready enough to meet these advances, for they were anxious to avenge their defeats in the field at Roqua and Lens, and their discomfiture in diplomacy by the Treaty of Westphalia. On February 19th, Conti informed the Parlement that an envoy of the Archduke Leopold, the governor of the Low Countries, prayed for audience. This envoy was a monk, sent indeed by the Archduke, but whose address to the Parlement was actually prepared for him by de Retz. His admission, however, caused forcible protests from the moderate party. Can it be, exclaimed the president de Mesma, that a prince of the blood proposes to grant, amid the fleur de lis, an audience to the representative of the bitterest enemy of the fleur de lis? Further checks and skirmishes with the royal troops led to bickering among generals who were rebels from selfishness alone, while the inconvenience and positive distress which was now beginning to be felt were doing their natural work. An event, moreover, had occurred abroad which had remarkable effect. The execution of Charles I in England, so far from encouraging the Frondeurs, shocked the conscience of a people who, whatever else they might be fighting against, had no thought of fighting against monarchy. While the presence of Henrietta Maria in Paris, in need so great that she owed to de Retz the provision of a fire in the bitter winter weather, served to heighten the effect. Moreover, the news of Longueville's fiasco in Normandy and of Turenne's flight to Holland had by this time reached the harassed and disheartened city. Tired of rebellion which was not successful, of exactions from which no results were forthcoming, and of leaders who showed no capacity for leadership, the Parlement, on February 28th, decided to send deputies to treat with the court, though forbidden to hold communication with Mazarin. It was characteristic of Mazarin that he never at any time took public notice of personal slights. He was perfectly willing now to humor the more violent members of the Parlement when they refused to treat with him in person. An arrangement was made by which the parties to the conference met on March 4th in separate rooms and communicated with each other only through their secretaries. The following conditions were agreed to. 
the parlement was to show its obedience by coming to saint germain to attend a lit de justice it was to hold no assembly without the royal permission during sixteen forty nine all its arrêts passed since january sixth were to be annulled including those against the cardinal as also those by the council against the parlement the troops in paris were to be disbanded and the inhabitants were to lay down their arms the bastille and arsenal were to be given back to the king and a second envoy who had come from the archduke was to be at once dismissed on the other hand the king was to set all prisoners at liberty to grant a general amnesty and to return to paris as soon as his affairs would allow the declarations of july and october were to be confirmed the claims of the parlement of rouen and aix were to receive a favourable treatment and finally the right of the parlement to take part in state affairs was at length to be admitted by the appointment of a member of the parlement to assist in the negotiations with spain nothing but necessity would have wrung this from mazarin he knew however that turenne had again offered an army to the insurgents that the archduke was about to invade france and that if he did so the siege of paris would have to be raised for a moment it seemed as if even now the concessions were to no purpose the energy of de retz still kept up the violence of the extremists the signature of mazarin to the treaty made them furious they inveighed against the weak compliance of their representatives they demanded that the treaty should be burnt language borrowed from england was for the first time heard the kings made the parliaments it is true but the people made the kings the cry for a republic was actually raised once more it appeared prudent to give way leopold was already on french soil his vanguard had reached pont de Vere on the Aisne. the court receded so far as to relinquish the lit de justice and the interdiction of the assemblies should this concession not satisfy the frondeurs it was determined to attack paris with all possible force while the weimarian general erlach with the mercenaries in the pay of the court faced the archduke meanwhile every effort was made to detach the generals of the fronde from the parlement it was a mere question of money with the single exception of de retz they handed in the personal demands upon the concession of which they offered to come over to the court rochefoucauld demanded the taberet for his wife and for himself eighteen thousand livres conti claimed a position in the council and the government of some strong place longueville wanted an important government in normandy with reversion to his children elbeuf asked for the payment of large sums which he claimed to be due to him and his wife beaufort demanded brittany for his father vendome and money for himself boulon asked for himself a vast sum of money as compensation for the loss of sedan and for turenne the government of alsace and philipsburg houdincourt required seven hundred thousand livres their greed was satisfied sufficiently to win them for the time mazarin steadfastly refused to grant away provinces or strong places and they like true hagglers took what they could get in money and in promises on april first all coherence of resistance being thus at an end the parlement met under a strong guard for fear of the mob and ratified the peace it was obvious however that an arrangement which had been brought about by necessity on either side and by which neither party had gained its objects was destined to be but a truce the discontent with mazarin remained as it was the nobles were neither contented nor intimidated and the government felt that it had succeeded in obtaining a virtual victory less by its own strength than by the weakness of its enemies had the provinces to any considerable extent espoused the cause of the fronde mazarin could scarcely have escaped complete discomfiture but brittany the most important had remained thoroughly loyal champagne and poitou though excited were easily kept in submission and the revolt in normandy had no popular basis in aix in provence the frondeurs had taken up arms by wise conciliation however mazarin had secured their submission without bloodshed and had induced the parlement of aix by some increase of its privileges to annul all the acts passed during the late troubles 
the really serious outbreak was in guienne where a feud was raging between epernon the governor and the parlement of bordeaux the result was disastrous to the bordelais on may sixteenth the rebels were defeated in a battle which soon became a massacre in which three thousand men were slaughtered mazarin seized the opportunity to endeavour to re-establish the intendants in the provinces foiled in this he partially gained the end in another way by choosing commissioners from the parliamentary families and by thus associating the parlement itself with the reorganization of the provincial administration during the daily complications of this struggle mazarin had with unwavering firmness been conducting the negotiations for peace with spain firmness indeed was needed for spain relying upon his difficulties had been endeavouring to impose hard conditions it is significant of his confidence in the momentary character of those difficulties that from the treaty of westphalia he steadfastly refused the slightest concessions even now though the spaniards were on french soil and though ypres and st venon had both fallen into their hands his only thought was to win some brilliant success in the field which like the victories of rocroi and lens should smooth the path at home arcourt therefore the ablest of the royal officers after conde was sent to besiege cambrai while in order to be near the seat of war the court took up its quarters at amiens the spaniards however were able to throw reinforcements into the place and the siege had to be raised the check was brilliantly redeemed by the capture of the fortress of conde commanding the junction of the Aisne and the Scheldt, and although this place had in turn to be abandoned, the great point had been gained of proving that France was still in a state of elastic vigour. Mazarin, meanwhile, continued his dealings with the leaders of the Fronde. His first step was significant of the character of the time. Through the agency of one of her lovers, he secured the Duchess of Chevreuse, the chief instigator of the plots with Spain, and through her he gained over in turn the support of many of his most dangerous opponents two important exceptions however occurred to his conquests beaufort declined all bribes he preferred to remain the roi des alles de retz though he attended the court steadfastly refused to see mazarin at length on august eighteenth sixteen forty nine it was thought safe for the court to return the king's cortege was accompanied through the streets with enthusiastic cries of welcome even the hatred against mazarin always probably more fictitious than real appeared to have vanished and he was everywhere received with respect the parliamentary fronde was at an end and to all appearances the danger and confusion were past as a matter of fact a storm to which the last had been child's play was about to break upon Mazarin. End of section 6section 7 of the English Restoration and Louis the 14th by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 4. The New Fronde. Number 1 defection of conde hitherto the government had been on the whole supported by conde this support was now to be withdrawn the great captain with no sound cause of complaint was literally in the sulks he considered the reward of his merits and services insufficient he was jealous of the permanent political support which by the marriages of his nieces mazarin was acquiring among the great families especially that of vendome and he could not brook the supremacy of the cardinal in the councils of the queen regarding himself as the first man in the kingdom within measurable distance of the crown urged on by the adulation of the young noblesse and by the comparison which de retz drew between himself and the great duke of guise he now determined to break with mazarin it is the course of folly and treason into which he was led by this enmity that constitutes the struggle of the new fronde unlike the parliamentary fronde this movement had absolutely no title to respect 
The ostensible and in some respects the real cry of the former was the cry for reform. But the leaders of the New Fronde never even pretended to desire reform. Their contempt for the bourgeois magistracy was as deep as was their hatred for the patient minister who stood in their path. It was a barren, aimless, and intensely selfish struggle for power, the last riot of the feudal spirit in France. An opportunity for a quarrel was soon found. Condé, besides presenting demands on his own account, required that Longueville should have the government of Pont de l'Arche in Normandy, a fortress which practically dominated Rouen. Steadfast to his policy of refusing to weaken the royal authority by the grant of fortresses, Mazarin braved the prince's anger. Condé, furious at the rebuff, publicly quarrelled with the cardinal when asked to sign the contract between Mercure, Vendôme's son, and Laura Mancini, Mazarin's niece. In a moment all the cardinal's enemies rallied to the attack. Condé determined to strike his blow by inducing the Parlement once more to bring forward the proscription law of 1617. Mazarin met the danger in characteristic fashion. He advised the Queen to write a letter to himself, ordering him to take Condé's advice regarding the nomination of all generals and principal officers of the Crown. No one was to be removed, no benefices to be filled up, no important resolution come to without his assent, and Mazarin was to promise to support Condé's interest under all circumstances. Finally, the minister was to require the prince's consent to any marriage of members of his family. These terms were accepted by Condé, who in return promised Mazarin his support and friendship. The submission was in appearance complete, and the result was probably what Mazarin had intended. The Frondeurs, indignant at this treaty with the common enemy, broke with Condé. Mazarin at once turned the feeling to his own advantage. He bought up Madame de Montbazon, Beaufort's mistress, and under her influence the Duke at length promised all that was asked him. Through the Duchess of Chevreuse, who had an old grudge against Condé's sister, the Duchess of Longueville, and who recognized that in the end the prince would have to yield to the astuteness of Mazarin and the firmness of the queen, he secured the inactivity of de Retz, to whom it is said the duchess sacrificed her daughter's honor in payment, and of those who followed his lead. Condé himself by two intemperate acts came to his aid. By his demand for the title of prince for his friends, La Rochefoucauld, Bouillon, and Le Tremouille, he insulted the rest of the noblesse, and the queen and Mazarin did their best to encourage the opposition which was excited. Still greater was the irritation caused by the admission of two of the friends of Madame de Longueville to the privilege most coveted of all distinctions by the ladies of the court of being seated in the presence of the queen. The guerre de tabouret, as it was called, from the tabouret or footstool placed before the chair, divided the court. The noblesse appealed to the queen. Condé passionately defended his sister's friends. The Queen and Mazarin desired nothing better than to throw upon Condé the odium of asking for the distinctions objected to and to acquire the credit of suppressing them. They therefore revoked the nominations and earned the formally expressed gratitude of the whole body of the noblesse. Not content with these acts of arrogance, Condé was now showing a reckless want of patriotism in encouraging the Parlement of Bordeaux to a second revolt thus weakening France in the part most open to Spanish attack. This was the more culpable as the Spaniards had been making way on the northeast. They had taken La Motte au Bois and were threatening Dunkirk and Berg. To preserve these two important places was, in all the agitations of the moment, Mazarin's constant anxiety. It was in this attitude of anxious hope and of unwavering determination to yield no inch of ground to the foreign enemies of France, that the real greatness of Mazarin's character was most conspicuous. Meanwhile, the breach between the Frondeurs and Condé had been rendered complete. A fictitious plot was enacted, 
the authorship of which was equally ascribed to and equally denied by the cardinal and the frondeurs a riot was excited among the paris mob during which a shot was fired into conde's carriage and one of his retainers wounded conde was persuaded that his own assassination had been intended he demanded justice and mazarin affected eagerly to espouse his cause beaufort de retz la bouillaille and Broussel were formally indicted for conspiracy each day they appeared in court with their friends and retainers all well armed conde and orleans brought bands of gentlemen similarly prepared for fight into the great hall of justice it seemed momentarily probable that the trial would be changed into a sanguinary conflict in the end the frondeurs managed so to prolong the proceedings that the whole affair was postponed to december twenty ninth but before that day another change had come over the shifting scene conde by his insolent egotism was incessantly playing into mazarin's hands he now roused to exasperation the haughty spirit of anne of austria who had long been chafing under his control by his threats and violence he had compelled her to undergo the humiliation of consenting to receive at court one of his most vicious dependents who had insulted her by a declaration of love he had too in the face of her commands supported the duke of richelieu grand nephew of the great cardinal in a marriage which brought him entirely under his own influence and in an audacious seizure of havre the most important harbour and fortress of the kingdom the danger of allowing this power to remain in conde's hands was too great to be permitted to continue anne and mazarin supported by orleans whose jealousy of conde had been sedulously fostered determined on a step for which the isolation which conde had created for himself rendered the moment favourable they determined to arrest the prince heavy prices had of course to be paid for the support indispensable to the success of so bold a stroke the interest of beaufort was gained by the gift of the admiralty to his father vendome after it had been refused to conde with reversion to beaufort himself and by that of the viceroyalty of catalonia to mercure the nomination to a cardinalate was promised to de retz and heavy gratifications were given to his friends and to those of madame de chevreuse the utmost secrecy as to the intention of the court having been maintained conde conti and longueville were then suddenly arrested on january eighteenth sixteen fifty and imprisoned at vincennes the net has been thrown well said orleans it has caught at once a lion a monkey and a fox an attempt of conde's immediate friends to create a tumult in paris served only to show how little he could count upon support there on the nineteenth the queen informed the parlement of the reasons for the step and that body as tired as herself of conde's masterfulness received the communication with utmost respect the bourgeois mindful of the destruction of their houses and gardens in the suburbs during the siege were equally inclined to concur and paris remained absolutely peaceful number two the fronde in the provinces the capital had been secured it remained to pacify the kingdom conde had warm partisans in normandy burgundy guienne berry champagne and limousin while turenne at stenay a strong fortress commanding the meuse and the great roads to luxembourg and sedan was a constant danger but mazarin's activity was all-sufficing and his skill and patience in dealing with the danger in conciliating where conciliation was possible and in pressing the advantage he had gained by the imprisonment of conde were remarkable he was well aware that imprisonment could not last long he was determined therefore that when the prince was again at liberty he should find himself deprived of his former sources of mischievous power normandy presented the most pressing danger any disturbance there closing as it did the highway of the seine threatened distress and even famine to paris the duke of longueville's officers held the fortresses of pont de l'arche dieppe rouen caen saint lo cherbourg and granville the duchess had escaped thither and was doing her best to excite resistance following the plan he ever afterwards adopted mazarin decided 
while taking ample measures for the safety of the other threatened quarters to lead the queen and the young king into the province before starting he made sure of the fidelity of paris by the distribution of heavy bribes to the leading members of the parlement orleans was left in command but a devoted adherent of the cardinal michel le tellier was placed at his side the court reached rouen on february fifth having received on the way the submission of pont de l'arche the governor of which was easily won by a heavy bribe within fifteen days normandy was safe the duchess of longueville had been compelled to fly dieppe had been secured by force of arms and havre had been obtained from richelieu by the gift of the tabouret to his wife a bribe of twelve thousand crowns bought the submission of the chateau of caen and the title of lieutenant governor of lower normandy to the head of the turbulent family of matignon secured st lo cherbourg and granville all disaffected garrisons and officers were changed and the fortifications of pont de l'arche were destroyed titles of nobility judiciously distributed among the members of the parlement of rouen gained the sympathies of the bourgeoisie on the twenty first the court returned to paris bringing in their train the duke and duchess of richelieu with several of the leading noblesse of normandy as virtual hostages for the fidelity of the province similar successes had been obtained in the other parts of the kingdom dijon the capital of burgundy had surrendered with many more of conde's strongholds stenay and bellegarde on the saone were the only strong places in the north of france which still defied the royal authority in spite of the submission of dijon the temper of the people in burgundy still threatened disturbance and mazarin at once decided to try there also the effect of the king's presence by lavish bribery he again assured the steadfastness of his jealous and temporary allies the duchess of chevreuse was especially insatiable in her demands and mazarin was as ungrudging in satisfying them during the whole of this expedition his correspondence shows him incessantly occupied with keeping unbroken the brittle cords which bound for a time de retz beaufort orleans and the duchesse to his designs the court reached dijon in the middle of march the siege of bellegarde was at once undertaken in spite of the difficulties attending the rainy season mazarin strengthened his force by calling to its aid the troops from weimar who had refused to follow turenne and he heightened the enthusiasm of the soldiers by bringing the young king within the lines a curious scene very characteristic of the nature of the fight now occurred the cries of vivre le roi which went up from the royal troops were raised with equal enthusiasm by the besieged upon the walls they sent word to louis that in honour of his arrival the fire from the place would be suspended for the whole day nor would it be directed toward the quarter where his tent was placed on april eleventh thanks to mazarin's good sense in giving the most favourable conditions the place surrendered the commander was taken into favour and the garrison of eight hundred cavalry was incorporated with the royal army stenay now remained the sole rampart of the rebel cause in the north of france there turenne had been joined by the adventurous duchesse of longueville who was indefatigable in keeping the spirit of confusion awake among the frondeurs in paris the discontented bordelais and wherever opposition to mazarin was possible she negotiated too an alliance with spain which was met by a royal declaration registered by the parlement on may sixteenth sixteen fifty that the duchesse bouillon turenne and la rochefoucauld were guilty of high treason and outlawed and that their property was confiscated to the crown this new alliance had little effect the spaniards indeed took Catelet on june second but they failed before the heroic resistance of the governor of the town of guise no common purpose existed between spain and turenne the former cared only for the enfeeblement of france the latter for securing the family government of Sedan scarcely had the court returned from burgundy when it was called away to guienne where under the insistence of the mother of conde the hatred of epernon the governor and offers of help from spain the smouldering mass had broken into open flame 
bordeaux shut its gates against the royal forces and refused to accept an amnesty from the benefits of which were excluded only those who had treated with spain for all acts of severity on the part of the government they exacted full reprisals and prepared for a vigorous resistance to a siege that this should last but a short while was for mazarin of the utmost importance for he was confronted by dangers on every side intercepted dispatches proved that bouillon was directly communicating with spain in italy things were going badly for porto longone and piambino had fallen before the spanish attack in the north the spaniards had taken la capelle vervon and marle turenne had captured rutel and chateau portion and the flying peasantry were carrying dismay into paris itself there too the faction of the princes was continually strengthening itself while the streets were placarded by still another party who appealed to the people to seek their safety in the reconciliation of the various members of the royal family and in the banishment of mazarin orleans was wavering once more and conspiracies had been discovered in normandy mazarin felt the urgent necessity of having his hands free at length on september twenty ninth he secured his end with the appearance of victory by a treaty with the bordelais that in token of obedience the town should suffer a royal entry at the head of the army should lay down their arms and should raise their fortifications while in return epernon was removed the exiled councillors restored and a complete and comprehensive amnesty granted to the city mazarin at once turned to face his enemies at paris and to take the offensive against turenne he refused further bribes to de retz and he determined at all costs to reconquer rutel and to check the alarming advance of spain with infinite pains he managed to keep the frondeurs still divided and having removed the prisoners to havre for greater security set out with the court for the seat of war reaching reims on december fifth siege was at once laid to rutel mazarin himself though suffering severely from gout and gravel took up his quarters in the camp to encourage the soldiers and displayed the utmost activity in providing not only for the greater matters of organization but for all those details in which the well-being of an army consists down to the men's great coats so vigorously was the place attacked that it surrendered on december thirteenth scarcely had the garrison marched out when turenne appeared to relieve it his men however were tired and vigorously pushed by the royal troops he retreated to an impregnable position on rising ground about twenty-two miles from rutel it appeared however not for the first or last time as though when engaged in this unpatriotic warfare the greatest masters of the art lost their skill and judgment turenne allowed his army to descend from the heights and spread itself over the intervening valley without an instant's hesitation the royal marshal du plessis pralon dashed at them with his whole force turenne was in a few minutes utterly routed almost the whole of his infantry three thousand five hundred strong were slain the royal troops refusing quarter to all of french blood champagne was cleared of the enemy and even stenay itself prepared for a siege one thing in especial was proved by this campaign with or without conde the royal troops could be counted upon that this was due to mazarin's ceaseless care to render the service popular that the tendency of a standing army to rally to the crown had been strengthened vastly by his management is clear he doubtless felt that come what might he would have to depend upon force in the end it was for this reason that he had caused the young king to live among the troops it was for this too that he was eager for a brilliant success at rutel and that he displayed such care for the personal comfort of his soldiers that care did not cease with success i dispatched last evening he wrote to letellier on the sixteenth a great train of bread wine lint and medicines with surgeons to help the wounded and in addition i have sent my own carriages to convey the disabled persons of quality with money for distribution among the officers mazarin might well look back with pride upon what he had accomplished tortured as he was with disease surrounded by open and secret enemies 
and only wielding his power in the name of an infant king he had allowed no note of weakness to escape him and had met every danger with wary and supple resolution by the imprisonment of conde he had declared that the crown should no longer be defied by any subject however powerful by dexterous management he had secured temporary quiet in the capital and he had then first in normandy then in burgundy afterwards in guienne and now in champagne stifled intestine war and driven the strangers from the soil and as he returned to paris he could boast that no town in france save stenay refused obedience to the king he had created an army devoted to the crown and while stretching conciliation to its limits in the endeavour to unite all frenchmen to labour for one object he had steadfastly refused during the worst periods of danger and doubt to yield the slightest concession to spain mazarin was a great card-player and it was said that he always rose from the table a winner whatever might have been his losses during the game this aptly illustrates his conduct of great affairs no view of his character is more false than that which represents him as a mere political adventurer that is the view which contemporaries blinded by the storms through which his piercing eye saw land and safety might fairly take but ultimate success in designs far distant and hidden from the eyes of others was all he cared for in his determination to compass that he never wavered and he played the great game of politics with a patience a coolness and a dexterous use of every turn of statecraft that compel our wonder even now End of section seven. Section eight of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter five: The Rebellion of Condé. Number one: Failure of Condé majority of louis the fourteenth mazarin returned to paris as a conqueror he might well have hoped to find his path easy but the jealousy of ministerial absolutism turned his very successes to his disadvantage before the year was out de retz was attacking him with all the old vehemence before the parlement which passed a vote demanding his dismissal it was sustained by the assemblies of the clergy and of the provincial nobility which de retz had brought together in paris and by orleans whose fickle support had once more been secured by this master of intrigue the authority of the regency had for the first time rested upon the alliance of mazarin with either conde or orleans it now stood defenceless once more the queen mindful of charles i and strafford refused to give up her servant but mazarin who recognized that it was in hatred of himself alone that the various parties were united with calmer wisdom determined to withdraw on the night of february sixth sixteen fifty one he secretly left paris at lillebonne on the tenth he heard from anne that she had been forced to give orders for the release of the princes before the messenger had reached havre he was there in person if the princes were to be set free he was determined to secure if possible their gratitude by releasing them himself this done he left france and sought the protection of the elector of cologne but though absent he was none the less powerful more than once while in the thick of the confusion he had appeared partially bewildered from a distance he had a far more complete control of the situation and the skill with which he guided the queen through all her difficulties was most remarkable for the moment it doubtless seemed to conde as he entered paris amid the enthusiasm of the streets that the game was in his hands to wrest the regency from the queen summon the etats generaux and frame a new constitution appeared well within his power he soon recognized that such a scheme was hopeless the parlement feared that their privileges would be weakened de retz 
the duchess of chevreuse and her friends had no intention of subordinating themselves to conde longueville Molay, bouillon and many others were alienated by his arrogance while the house of vendome was divided through the affection of mercure for mazarin's niece whom he shortly married conde was soon driven to see that his only chance of supremacy lay in coming to terms with the queen herself his conditions were such that had they been granted he would have been virtual king of france without hesitation mazarin urged the queen to reject them and to form in turn a close agreement with the frondeurs they demanded a frondeur ministry and the nomination to a cardinalate for de retz and on these terms they engaged to further the recall of mazarin and to allow the court to leave paris the mere suggestion of mazarin's recall however brought about in turn an alliance between conde and the parlement the prince left paris and refused to return until the chief official adherents of mazarin had been dismissed the queen replied that she would sooner go into a cloister once again mazarin succeeded in persuading her to give way he felt the necessity of not allowing the understanding between conde and the parlement to become permanent and he knew that with time his best friend would probably be conde himself his hopes were fully justified by his insolent refusal to visit the queen and the king and by his general arrogance the prince rapidly alienated his friends in the parlement and thus robbed himself of his only support across the troubled scene of the last five years the monarchy had been guided up to an event of supreme importance on september seventh with the full concurrence of the parlement which had been gratified by a fresh decree against mazarin and with every circumstance of rejoicing was celebrated the majority of louis the fourteenth the proceedings of the day in which royalty appeared to the people in all its splendour as the personification of the unity and power of france are recorded in great detail from one of the tribunes of the parlement the ambassadors of the foreign powers looked down upon the inauguration of the epoch which was to establish the supremacy of france from the other the exiled widow of charles i gazed upon a scene which must have added by contrast a bitterness to the downfall of all her hopes from the crowd of great nobles one figure alone was absent as louis prepared to set out for the parlement a letter was handed him in which conde expressed his regret that fear for his personal safety prevented him from attending the ceremony the contemptuous refusal of the young king to open the letter well illustrated the changed conditions of the contest from the moment the majority was declared the princes of the blood until now rivals of the crown became subjects and subjects alone nothing was left for conde but submission or fighting should he choose the latter he would no longer be fighting only against evil advisers he would be a rebel against a king in the plenitude of his authority supported by the instincts of a nation number two rebellion of conde into rebellion however he threw himself with characteristic impetuosity at bordeaux he was enthusiastically received the great families of la rochefoucauld rohan la force la tremouille also upheld his cause in the south of france Dognon brought him a fleet marson the royal governor of catalonia carried over his best troops thus strengthened and liberally supplied with money and men by spain in return for the possession of a harbour on the dordogne he determined to defy the crown a royal declaration was at once issued depriving the prince of all his honours and governments and attainting him of high treason and the declaration was registered by the parlement on december sixth conde had underrated the resources of the government an immediate progress through poitou saint and anjou secured the quiet of these districts 
Harcourt defeated La Rochefoucauld, relieved Cognac, and took La Rochelle from Dognon. Condé, who had hastened to succor La Rochelle, was himself beaten at tonnay charente and was compelled to fall back upon the Dordogne. He now sought for allies. In one powerful quarter he had great hopes. There had for long been existing among the Bordelais a strong republican feeling, and this had been carefully encouraged by agents from England. As early as 1650 the help of England had been formally asked against the government, and an offer made in return of a port on the Gironde and of La Rochelle. These offers were now renewed. Cromwell, however, prudently sent to the south of France to ascertain the real position of affairs. His messenger reported that secure in their religion through Mazarin's wise observance of former promises, the Huguenots gave no sign, that the Fronde was a frivolous and discredited faction, and that as for Condé himself, stoltis est et garulus et venditur a suis cardinali. In another direction, Condé was equally unsuccessful. The Duke of Lorraine, for eighteen years a duke without a duchy, was always ready to sell himself and the army with which he wandered on the frontier to the highest bidder. Condé now applied to him, and Spain seconded the request. But Mazarin, by holding before him the prospect of a repossession of his estates, succeeded for the time in baffling his design. The moment had now come for Mazarin to reappear on the scene. Since the middle of October he had transferred his quarters to Dinan on the frontier. Thence he had kept up an active correspondence with such of the governors of the provinces and commanders of the northern fortresses as were in his interest, and he had collected there a well-equipped force of seven thousand men, the Mazarins, devoted to himself. With this army he crossed the frontier on December 24th, and undeterred by the fulminations of the Parlement, which went so far as to set a price upon his head, marched rapidly through France and joined the king and queen at Poitiers on January 30th, 1652. He had brought with him as the first fruits of the king's majority something more important than even his army or his council. He had brought Turenne. They came at a critical moment. Condé, indeed, had again been outmaneuvered on the Dordogne, but danger was threatening from the north. The Duke of Nemours had collected a mixed army of French and Spaniards and was now marching to join the forces under Beaufort, which Orléans, who had once more changed sides, had raised between the Loire and the Seine. The emergency was boldly met by Mazarin. He led the court to the Loire and at once took the offensive. On March 29th, 1652, Beaufort and Nemours were beaten by Turenne at Jargo. They immediately marched to Montargy to place themselves between Paris and the royal forces. At this moment, Condé suddenly arrived in their camp. Disheartened at his failure in Guienne and warned of the danger on the Loire, he determined to take the command there. He at once made his presence felt. Falling by night upon one division of the king's army, he routed it and almost captured the court. The skill of Turenne, who came up in haste, and who with numbers not a third of those of Condé prevented him from pursuing his advantage, alone averted a complete disaster to the royal cause. Condé hereupon betook himself to Paris. Orléans was there in his interest, with a considerable force, but the Parlement, though still hating Mazarin, was unwilling to oppose directly a king whose majority had been declared. And above all, there was steadily forming itself among the wearied bourgeoisie a fresh party, who saw in the success of the crown their only chance of the repose for which they longed. Thus foiled, Condé turned to the mob. Anarchy was soon raging, for Turenne was gradually hemming in the city, and the people were furious with the Parlement, which seemed powerless to bring their miseries to an end. The news that Turenne had avenged Blenot by a brilliant victory over Condé's Spanish forces at Etampes on May 4th increased the frenzy. The populace clamoured for something that should end their suspense, 
and turned their anger against the Parliament and Condé alike. An attack by the royal forces enabled Condé to draw the people into participation in the rebellion. With an armed but undisciplined mob, he inflicted a serious check at saint cloud upon turenne who thereupon undertook instead the siege of Etampes, in which the remains of Condé's force were shut up. The siege failed through a strange intervention. The Duke of Lorraine marched from the frontier and appeared before Paris with his banded army of ten thousand men, wasting the country as he came. He had come in the pay of Spain to help the princes. He kept his word by a peaceful agreement with Turenne that the siege of Etampes should be raised, and then, outmaneuvered by that commander, and moved by a bribe from Mazarin, higher than Condé could offer, returned to the frontier after a fortnight's stay. The troops of Condé succeeded in escaping from Eton and reaching the suburbs of Paris, but the city guards, angry at the devastation which they witnessed, shut the gates and refused them entrance. They encamped, therefore, at Saint-Cloud, and there Condé joined them. Meantime, Paris was given up to anarchy. The members of the Parlement were attacked in the streets, and at length that body suspended its sittings. Many fled to the court. Mazarin and Turenne, reinforced by three thousand men, now determined to strike the long-deferred blow. On July 2nd, Condé's army was caught on the march in the streets of the Faubourg Saint-Antoine. A murderous conflict of several hours, in which the prince displayed his accustomed bravery, resulted in his total defeat. Hemmed in between Turenne and the walls of Paris, he would have been utterly crushed, had not his friends within the city, at the moment when Turenne was preparing a final attack, thrown open the gates to his shattered troops, and checked the further advance of the royalist forces by a cannonade from the Bastille. The immediate result was further violence and massacre in Paris, encouraged by Condé himself. The Hôtel de Ville, in which the General Assembly of the city, which had replaced the Parlement, was in session, was set on fire by the mob, and many of the notables were cut down as they endeavoured to escape from the flames. Condé then coerced the remnants of the Parlement to consent to an administration in which Orléans was lieutenant-general of the kingdom, himself commander-in-chief, Beaufort governor of the town, and Bruxelles provost. The court had meanwhile to meet a fresh danger. At the beginning of July, the Archduke Leopold, who had just taken Gravelines and was besieging Dunkirk, sent a large force with Lorraine's troops to the aid of Condé. Turenne retired to Compiègne and determined to defend the line of the Oise with his 8,000 men. The enemy numbered 20,000, and had the Spanish general listened to the prayer of Condé and with the prince's help attacked the royal troops, the result could hardly have been in doubt. But thus decisively to end the war which was every day weakening their great enemy was far from the interests of Spain. At the critical moment she recalled her army, and the danger thus disappeared as soon almost as it had arisen. Lorraine and Condé were easily held in check during the whole of September by the superior generalship of Turenne. Number three, reaction in Paris, royal entry. In other ways, the sky was brightening. The massacre of the Hôtel de Ville had disgusted all reasonable men. A great reaction took place in Paris. The bourgeoisie refused to pay the taxes demanded by the provisional government. Condé's army rapidly dwindled away. On August 9th, he could muster only 1,200 men. To separate their friends in the Parlement from their enemies, the court now ordered that body to leave Paris and resume its sittings at Pontoise. Molé, the president, and some thirty members obeyed the summons, and their numbers increased day by day. The court thus gained the advantage of securing the registering of their acts according to the Constitution. So greatly did Louis appreciate their services, that to the end of his reign he paid all the members who attended the session of August 7th through October 20th a pension of 6,000 livres under the title of Pension de Pontoise. It did not at first appear that this step 
was for the interest of Mazarin. The Parlement of Pontoise demanded his dismissal. This, however, was obviously a prudent step, as it removed Condé's last excuse. The demand was acceded to with the old readiness, and on August 19th, Mazarin left the court to reside at Bouillon. Within Paris, the party of order continually improved its position. So strong was it that on September 24th, the bourgeoisie and the clergy determined to invite Louis to return. The provost of the merchants, the principal magistrates, the six trade companies, with de Retz at the head of the priesthood, carried the invitation to Saint-Germain. Turenne, meanwhile, had once more outmaneuvered the Duke of Lorraine and compelled him to lead his bands from France. Condé, bitterly disappointed, hastened with the remnants of his army to do the same. The fickle resolutions of Orléans were easily overcome. Beaufort was induced to give up his governorship for 100,000 livres, and on October 21, 1652, amid a scene of the wildest rejoicing, Louis the Fourteenth at last entered his capital. An amnesty was passed for all occurrences since February 1651, and all decrees issued in the interval, including those against Mazarin, were cancelled. Mazarin, however, did not at once return. He was busy in putting the army of Champagne into such order that Turenne was shortly able to drive Condé to La Capelle and to retake all the towns held by the prince except Rethel and saint Menehou. He was, too, perhaps unwilling again to appear prominently until he had heard of the exile of his rival Chateauneuf, of the complete dispersion of the leaders, male and female, of the Fronde, and of the arrest of de Retz. He entered Paris on February 3, 1653. The earliest opportunity was taken for asserting the triumph of the principles of Richelieu and Mazarin. On the very day after the entry, a lit de justice was held at which the Parliament was once more forbidden to assume any control over state affairs or to meddle with finance. Paris was now secure, but the provinces were still agitated. In Provence, Burgundy, and Saint-Ange, quiet was soon restored. The struggle in Guienne, however, was serious and prolonged. Bordeaux was under a reign of terror, and the violent section of the Parlement, known as the Orme, from the fact that its meetings were held in a grove of elm trees, refused all the offers of the crown. Its tyranny, however, became intolerable to the respectable citizens and led to a dispersion of Condé's faction. On August 3, 1653, Bordeaux, vigorously pressed by the royal troops, opened its gates. With this submission, the long struggle of the Fronde came to an end. Its result was to leave the monarchy supreme. The conflict between royalty and the spirit of feudalism had ended in the complete triumph of the cause which best satisfied the yearning for order and the sentiment of national unity. The great nobles had failed because as time went on it became more clear that they had nothing to offer the nation and that their cause was the cause of civil confusion. They now exchanged their fruitless pretensions to independence for the high commands, the titles, and the pensions which Mazarin showered among them for all the gilded servitude of the court. The heads of great houses who had stood in arms against the king henceforth found their chief honor in filling the numberless offices which were created in the household, while the younger members of the noblesse were encouraged to seek a career in the one profession which was not beneath the dignity of their order. The Parlement, the only other bodies whose pretensions could be dangerous, were sternly kept within the original limits of their constitution. But while henceforth they were allowed to occupy themselves with the judicial functions alone, Mazarin was ever careful that no cause should be given them for discontent by interference with those functions. They became once more bodies of magistrates constituting a legal caste. All the machinery of a purely centralized administration was rapidly reorganized, and in especial the intendants, the favorite institution of both Richelieu and Mazarin, were immediately restored. Even now, 
before she could claim that supremacy in europe to secure which had been throughout all the troubles the guiding ambition of mazarin as it had been of richelieu france had much to accomplish and many dangers to overcome she had to win back the conquests which spain nerveless and inefficient as she had become had been able to wrest from her during the years of confusion piambino porto longone and casale in italy dunkirk mardyke gravelines fuen and other towns in flanders catalonia in spain and she had first to face the final efforts of conde end of section eight section nine of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter six close of the war with spain number one defeat of cond and safety of france the prince had now taken the last step in treason he had formally enlisted in the service of spain and with a mixed force of thirty thousand men appeared in france in the spring of sixteen fifty four turenne could only bring sixteen thousand troops to oppose him but the spirit of his troops was high soon the interest of the war centred around two places arras and stenay the latter was besieged by the french on june nineteenth while arras was at the same moment attacked by cond all europe stood watching the strife for the first success would probably decide the war paris was in a ferment of expectation while circumstances known only to mazarin invested the issue with singular importance Condé was indefatigable, but he was feebly seconded by his Spanish colleagues, whose punctilious pride had been annoyed by his arrogance. Within Arras a very different spirit reigned. The defences of the town were weak, and the inhabitants were Spanish, but the governor had no thought of surrender, and the officers of the garrison swore to one another to die at their posts. Meanwhile their brethren outside Stinney, encouraged by the presence of Louis, pushed the siege with such vigour that on august fifth the town capitulated and the besiegers at once hurried off to attack conde before arras a desperate effort of the prince to carry the place before these forces came up failed on the twenty fourth turenne by a night attack forced his lines and compelling him to retreat in confusion pursued him almost to the walls of brussels the northern frontier was now safe the treason of Arcourt, the governor of Alsace and Philipsburg, who had taken possession of Breisach and had assumed the position of an independent prince, gave Mazarin an opportunity of securing also the frontier of the Rhine. Unable at first to bribe the commander, the cardinal bribed his men. Arcourt, finding himself defenceless, listened to the minister's offers of fifty thousand livres and mazarin took the governments of alsace and philipsburg into his own hands before the beginning of the next campaign took place a scene which marked the distance over which the monarchy had moved since the beginning of mazarin's career on march twentieth sixteen fifty five a lit de justice was held for imposing taxes rendered necessary by the war louis was hunting at vincennes when the news reached him that the parliament was discussing the new acts with the view of remonstrating suddenly he appeared unannounced in the palais de justice in the dress in which he had ridden hard from vincennes and with marks of anger in his face intervening at once in the discussion he expressed his surprise at this audacity curtly forbade the continuation of the proceedings and then left the hall as abruptly as he had entered it the parliament never again ventured to incur a similar rebuke the same lesson was taught in a still higher quarter the pope refused to declare that a vacancy had been caused in the archbishopric of paris by de retz's forced resignation in prison a compromise was arranged but the pope insisted that the terms of the agreement should receive the sanction of the assembly of the clergy and of the parliament mazarin unhesitatingly refused the condition in the most emphatic terms he laid down the doctrine 
that the absolute and despotic power in france was with the king and that no organization whatsoever in the kingdom could pretend to the smallest share and it illustrates the national and anti-papal character of the gallican church that mazarin was strongly supported by the clergy in this position the summer campaign of sixteen fifty five was little more than a military parade on foreign ground everywhere france was now on the offensive fortress after fortress was captured and in november the leaderless army of the duke of lorraine who had been arrested by the spaniards and imprisoned in madrid was taken into french pay fortune was more evenly balanced in italy and catalonia though there too the french had more than held their own number two the english alliance mazarin was now bent upon an alliance which if successful must finish the war a deadly blow would be struck at the strength of spain if dunkirk mardic and gravelines the possession of which was of vital importance to her communication with flanders as well as enabling her to ruin french commerce on that coast could be wrested from her for this the cooperation of some maritime power was necessary and mazarin determined at all costs to secure england with cromwell the only diplomatist by whose astuteness he confessed himself baffled he had been negotiating since sixteen fifty one but up to this moment with no result in sixteen fifty four the protector found himself courted by both the great powers he told them the terms on which his help might be had in each case they were dictated by the two main principles of his policy the desire to make england mistress of the seas with a foothold on the continent and the desire to protect protestantism from spain he must have calais when taken from the french freedom of trade with the american colonies and a cessation of all attacks by the inquisition upon english merchants in spain the first condition met with no favour in spain since it would place her communication with the netherlands at the mercy of england to the second and third she returned a flat refusal to grant them she said would be giving up the king's two eyes from france cromwell demanded dunkirk when captured from the spaniards and promise of toleration for the huguenots and mazarin was ready to accede to these terms mutual jealousies and varying interests hindered an understanding and the massacre of the protestant waldenses in piedmont by the duke of savoy would have caused the negotiations to be broken off had not mazarin yielded to cromwell's demand and compelled the duke to grant the survivors favourable terms at length on november third sixteen fifty five a treaty was signed at westminster based upon freedom of commerce and an engagement that neither country should assist the enemies or rebels of the other mazarin consented to expel charles the second and james and twenty named royalists from france cromwell similarly agreed to dismiss from england the emissaries of cond but mazarin was soon anxious for a more effectual bond the french army had sustained a grievous disaster by a victory of cond at valenciennes july fifteenth sixteen fifty six which threatened the loss of all the advantages of the campaign the financial embarrassments too were very great the army was unpaid and peasant risings were taking place in various parts of the kingdom cromwell had equally good reasons for drawing closer to france for spain was preparing actively to assist charles the second french and english interests thus coinciding an alliance was signed at paris on march twenty third sixteen fifty seven gravelines and dunkirk were to be at once besieged both by land and sea england was to send six thousand men to assist the french army gravelines was to become french and dunkirk english should the former fall first it was to be held by england until dunkirk too was taken mazarin disarmed the hostility felt by the french clergy to such an alliance with heretics by a clause preserving the catholic religion in any towns taken by the english the danger that england might gain too strong a hold on the continent was guarded against 
by her promise to attack no other towns in Flanders. The alliance was not a moment too soon. The campaign of 1657 had opened disastrously. The tide was, however, turned by the arrival of the English contingent. Montmédy was immediately besieged and capitulated on August 4th. The effect was again to make Mazarin hang back from further effort, since it seemed possible now to make peace with Spain and thereby avoid an English occupation of Dunkirk. But Cromwell would stand no trifling, and his threats were so clear that Mazarin determined to act loyally and without delay. On September 30th, Turenne laid siege to Mardyk, which protected Dunkirk, and took it in four days. It was at once handed over to the English. Mazarin had meanwhile gained an important diplomatic success. The Emperor Ferdinand III had died on April 1st, 1657. Mazarin knew that in breach of the Treaty of Westphalia he had been constantly sending help to Spain, and that Leopold, his son, was now doing the same. He determined to seize the opportunity of depriving his enemy of so important a source of support. For the next eighteen months he exhausted all the resources of diplomacy to oppose Leopold's succession to the imperial title, putting forward first Louis the Fourteenth and then the elector of Bavaria as rival claimants. To secure his election, Leopold found himself compelled by the electors whom Mazarin had won by wholesale bribery to sign a capitulation by which he bound himself to observe with scrupulousness the terms of the Peace of Westphalia. On August 14, 1658, Mazarin managed further to form the Rhine League, by which six of the electors, with the King of Sweden, joined with France in an engagement to compel Leopold during three years faithfully to observe his word. The expense incurred by France was ruinous, but the need of neutralizing Leopold's sympathies with Spain was immediate, and the value of the influence gained in German affairs was of vital importance to Mazarin's future plans. Meanwhile, the great blow had been struck in the north. At the demand of Cromwell, a fresh agreement had been made in the spring of 1658, by which the siege of Dunkirk had without further delay been begun. Under Turenne's command, and encouraged by the presence of Louis, the combined English and French forces worked with desperate energy against the almost insuperable difficulties of the position, aggravated as they were by bad weather, want of provisions and munitions of war, and eruptions of the ocean. On June tenth, Turenne learned that Don Juan of Austria and Condé, accompanied by the Dukes of York and Gloucester, at the head of some English royalist regiments, had arrived at Furne, intending to force his lines. Leaving sufficient men to continue the siege, he at once marched to meet them. So confident were the Spanish commanders in their numbers, and so inefficient was Don John himself, that all proper precautions were neglected. Condé, knowing to whom he was opposed, foresaw the coming disaster. Turning to the young Duke of Gloucester, he asked him if he had ever seen a battle. The Duke replied that he had not. Then, said Condé, in half an hour you shall see how one can be lost. He was not deceived. The picked Spanish infantry, supported by the English and Irish auxiliaries under James, held the dunes or low sand hills on the right. Straight up against them, sinking deep in the sand at each step, went the Ironsides with an impetuous valor, which was the wonder of all who saw. Condé on the left met Turenne's onslaught with such desperate energy that he twice repulsed him and nearly broke through his lines. But in the end, the discipline of the Ironsides and the skill of Turenne won a crushing victory at the Battle of the Dunes, June 13, 1658. Dunkirk immediately surrendered, and on the 25th was in Cromwell's possession. Two months later, Gravelines also fell. A short and brilliant campaign followed in which Don John and Condé, shut up in Brussels and Tournay respectively, were compelled to remain inactive, while fortress after fortress fell into French hands. A few days after the fall of Gravelines, Cromwell died, 
September 3, 1658. But Mazarin was now near his goal. Utterly defeated on her own soil, beaten too by the Portuguese at Elvas, and threatened in Milan, her army ruined, her treasury bankrupted, without a single ally in Europe, Spain stood at last powerless before him. The rest, he felt, was but the work of diplomatic skill, and in diplomatic skill, now that Cromwell was dead, he had no master. To him the prospects of peace were at least as welcome as to Spain, for France, so terrible was her exhaustion, after thirty years of ceaseless foreign and civil war, maintained only by taxation of crushing severity, was from every corner of her devastated departments literally crying aloud for repose. Number 3. The Peace of the Pyrenees The treaty between France and Spain dealt in the first place with accomplished facts. By a preliminary arrangement on February 1659, all the conquests made by France previous to the English alliance were to remain hers for ever, but the places captured by Turenne in the last campaign, except Mardic, which was held by France, and Dunkirk, which was retained by England, with Valence, Mortara in Italy, and several towns in Catalonia, were to be restored to Spain. Artois, with the exception of Aire and Saint-Omer, Roussillon and Alsace, became French soil, while by the cession of many fortresses in Luxembourg, Hainaut, and Flanders, her foot was planted firmly in the Low Countries. Bound in honour and gratitude to do what they could for Condé, the Spanish ministers urged his restoration not only to all his possessions but to his governments and dignities as well. The demand was at this stage formally and decisively refused by Mazarin. But it was the future rather than the present which, as usual, most occupied Mazarin's thoughts just as in the peace of westphalia he had been looking to the future weakening of the power of austria when he helped to secure the independence of the separate german states so now he was looking to the future absorption of the spanish monarchy into that of france when treating for what had long been looked to as a foremost condition of peace between the two kingdoms the marriage of louis with the infanta the grounds of his expectation lay in the peculiarity of the spanish law of succession a peculiarity which dated from the eleventh century not only did the crown descend to the daughter where no male heirs in direct descent were living but contrary to the custom of europe it was by her carried to her husband it was this law by which in twelve seventeen castile and leon and in 1479 Castile and Aragon were united, and which by the marriage of Jean La Folle, the heiress of the Spanish monarchy to Philippe le Bel, the heir to the Austrian dominions and the Low Countries, made their son, Charles V, the sovereign of nearly half the known world. But in 1612, when the marriage of Louis XIII and Anne of Austria opened up the possibility of a combination still more threatening, the union, namely, of the French and Spanish crowns, the general alarm of Europe and the national jealousy in Spain brought about a breach of this law. The contract of marriage, then drawn up, contained an entire renunciation by Anne of all pretensions to the Spanish throne by herself and her descendants, and this renunciation was after the marriage reaffirmed both by herself and Louis XIII. A similar renunciation was now insisted upon on the part of marie therese and louis the fourteenth mazarin exhausted all his art to evade the spanish demand the prospect of this succession had been foremost in his mind ever since sixteen forty six when he was hoping to come to terms with spain before the peace of westphalia and now although there seemed no present likelihood of the renunciation being referred to since in sixteen fifty eight and sixteen fifty nine two sons were born to philip the fourth and the claims of the infanta would be dormant during their lives yet these sons being both delegate one died in sixteen sixty and the other in sixteen sixty one his anxiety to avoid the renunciation was as great as though no such obstacle existed failing in this mazarin as usual gained his ends by indirect means he demanded a dowry of five hundred thousand crowns with the infanta 
of which one third was to be paid on the day before the marriage and he refused to proceed with the treaty until this demand was agreed to he then instructed his secretary leon to whom was entrusted along with don pedro coloma the task of drawing up the contract to procure the insertion of a clause setting forth that the validity of the renunciation should be dependent upon the punctual payment of these sums after much diplomatic fencing the skill of leon overcame the reluctance of coloma and this condition which contains the key to the french policy of the next four years was duly included in the contract whether from inability to raise the money or more probably because coloma having died in the interval the condition was overlooked by the spanish ministers the first sum had not been paid when the marriage took place and the renunciation was therefore invalid on the next day mazarin and lyon were able to congratulate one another upon having thus completely outwitted spain the question of portugal had next to be settled that kingdom had in sixteen forty recovered its independence and the duke of braganza under the title of john the fourth had since worn the crown he had from that time been a thorn in the side of spain and had been actively assisted by france so anxious was mazarin not to lose this source of support in the future that he actually offered to restore to spain all the french conquests in the low countries if the independence of portugal might be recognized in the treaty but spain had set her mind upon reducing this rebellious province and all that mazarin could obtain for her was a truce of three months while on the part of the king of france it was promised that he would never directly or indirectly give to her any aid whatsoever public or secret it will however be seen that when a convenient time came this promise was easily evaded on one other point mazarin found himself compelled to give way conde's future again occupied a large part of the conferences which he held with don luis de haro at the isle of pheasants in the bidishoa river de haro threw over the preliminary treaty in this respect and demanded in the most pressing manner that conde should be fully restored mazarin at length yielded the prince was reinstated in his possessions honours and dignities receiving the government of burgundy with possession only of dijon and saint louis de lone instead of guienne and the dignity of grand master of the household for his son but mazarin gained an ample equivalent aven one of the most valuable towns in hainaut with philippeville and marienburg as well as the territory of conflans under the pyrenees were ceded to france while the duchy of juliers was restored to her ally the duke of neuburg moreover as mazarin said Condé now gained no more than he certainly would have received after giving in his submission to the king. Finally, the Duke of Lorraine was provided for. He was re-established in his duchy with the exception of Moyonvic and the districts of Bar and Clermont, Stenay, Dun, and Jarmetz, which became French. He was compelled to promise that he would join no league against France and would allow her armies to pass freely through his territory the importance with which this settlement was invested throughout europe was seen in the presence at the place of conference of deputies from sweden austria germany the commonwealth of england and the exile charles the second sweden and the rhine leagues were clamorous for the aid of france against the emperor who again in defiance of the treaty of westphalia had invaded pomerania the affairs of england too received much attention both spain and france were well disposed toward charles but it was important for france to have the goodwill of england in view of a possible renewal of the war and england at present meant the commonwealth mazarin therefore declined charles's offers including his proposal to marry the cardinal's niece hortense mancini and when restored to hand over the government of ireland and refused to help in his restoration further he satisfied lockhart the english ambassador by agreeing that charles should not be allowed to employ the forces which cond would leave when taken back into favour with respect to the war which continued between spain and england it was agreed that france should preserve a complete neutrality such were the principal provisions of the peace of the pyrenees 
which gave a short period of repose to southern Europe. For Spain, it was what the Peace of Westphalia had been for Austria, a confession of weakness and mark of decline. For France, it was, as that peace had also been, a fresh step toward European supremacy. But France, though she had gained much, though her boundaries were now the Rhine and the crest of the Pyrenees, though she had prepared for the future by the formation of the Rhine League and the Spanish marriage, and though she had established a foothold among the fortresses of the North East, had unhappily, both for herself and Europe, been unable to force from Spain that complete rampart for Paris, the determination to secure which had been the main reason for the earnestness with which throughout all the difficulties of the last fifteen years she had bent herself to the war. And so it was that what might have been a lasting peace was indeed only a truce. The attempt to make good this unfulfilled desire forms the subject matter, so to speak, of the intrigue and the fighting of the next eighteen years. End of section nine. Section ten of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter seven. Restoration of Monarchy in England. Number one. Conditions of the Restoration. Louis the Fourteenth, after the fever fit of the Fronde, had entered upon his sovereignty by the right of conquest, unshackled by any constitutional authority and unbound by any conditions. In England, too, monarchy was within a year after the peace of the Pyrenees re-established amid all the signs of popular rejoicing and with greetings as apparently servile as those offered to Louis himself. And yet Charles was bound hand and foot by conditions the failure to fulfil which would in all probability have relegated him once more to a wandering life among the courts of Europe. That this was so arose from the all-important fact that, speaking roughly, he was restored by those who had overthrown his father and who were responsible for his own exile. The fleet, the army, the fortresses were in their hands, England had, it is true, shaken off at length the military despotism by which Cromwell had cut right athwart the most cherished traditions of English life. Like an unstrung bow, she had fallen back upon her old ways of life. She had restored her Parliament, and then Parliament and monarchy being coordinated in the English mind, she had restored her king. This government was as natural to them as their food or raiment, and naked Indians dressing themselves in French fashion were no more absurd than Englishmen without a parliament and a king. But having thrown off first the despotism of Charles I and then the despotism of military force, the country had no thought of taking another. The new reign must take account of the feelings which had grown up during the overthrow and abeyance of monarchy. That Charles fully recognized the position was seen in his own words some months later to the House of Lords when he spoke of those who brought or permitted us to come here. The people might, it was hoped in their impatience, be deceived by the professions made, but made they must be. The declaration of Breda was admirably suited to the object in view. By the most careful expression of deference to the authority of the Parliament, Charles trusted to lull suspicion, until he was steady enough upon the throne to use his constitutional power of dissolution at a favourable moment, and thus to secure a Parliament more to his wishes. The foremost question in men's minds was how far the spirit of retaliation was likely to go. Had the restoration, instead of being the re-establishment of parliamentary government, been the work of a victorious royalist movement, the passions roused would have been quenched, the accumulated injuries of years avenged in torrents of blood. 
but the declaration granted a general pardon to all who within forty days after its publication should by any open act return to loyalty and obedience excepting only such persons as shall hereafter be accepted by parliament the king's word was indeed solemnly passed for an absolute oblivion of all acts committed against him or his father in the letter to the speaker accompanying the declaration however a significant hint was given if there be a crying sin for which the nation may be involved in the infamy that attends it we cannot doubt that you will be as solicitous to redeem and vindicate the nation from that guilt and infamy as we can be the question of the church was treated under the same conditions the presbyterians were looking forward with eager anxiety the anglican churchmen with exultant hope to quiet the one but in terms which might afterwards leave the field clear to the other charles proclaimed on his own account a complete liberty to tender consciences declaring himself ready to consent to such an act of parliament as upon mature deliberation shall be offered to us for the full granting that indulgence the resettlement of the land was next dealt with during the wars many estates had changed hands the crown lands and those of church dignitaries had been confiscated by the commonwealth and sold about them nothing was said in the declaration as to private estates either granted away by the commonwealth or sold by distressed royalists the decision was left absolutely in the hands of parliament in another matter the declaration expressed how completely the restoration was one of sufferance it concluded with a promise to consent to any act of parliament for the full satisfaction of all arrears due to the officers and soldiers of the army under the command of general monk and to receive them into the royal service upon as good pay and conditions as they now enjoy the recognition of the absolute authority of parliament in questions regarding the church and the land the complete waiving of a desire for personal vengeance the satisfaction of monk's army these were the conditions under which charles was allowed to return to england the composition of the executive government expressed the nature of the compromise the privy council was really nominated by monk and was composed in a great degree of leading presbyterians out of this however was formed a small committee which practically had the whole control of affairs edward hyde now earl of clarendon was lord chancellor and was so supreme that the years from sixteen sixty to sixteen sixty seven are fitly named the clarendon administration with him was ormond who projected into this reign the high-toned virtues of the old cavalier stock southampton the lord treasurer and nicholas the secretary these four represented the principle of legitimacy in its purest form on the other hand monk and his confidant morris were included while lord robarts who had fought against the king was made viceroy of ireland scotland was placed under middleton a rude soldier of fortune who had served on both sides number two partial fulfilment of the declaration of breda the indemnity bill was taken up at once charles and clarendon were determined that in this respect the declaration should be carried out as loyally as the prevailing temper might allow and they managed at least to confine the spirit of retaliation within intelligible lines a broad distinction was drawn between the regicides those namely who had committed the crying sin and all others about the former the majority of the house of commons had little hesitation the true presbyterian abhorred the crime of the king's death as much as the royalist they began on june fifth by accepting from the benefits of the act five of the judges for life and estate on the eighth three more were added and the next day twenty more for pains and penalties not extending to life it was not until july eleventh and then only in consequence of an urgent message from charles that with some further additions the bill passed the lower house in the lords a far more savage spirit reigned 
the earl of bristol was the spokesman of the majority when he complained that the bill was miserably inadequate though he thought that delay was even a worse evil than an incomplete revenge on july twentieth the lords resolved that all who had signed the warrant should die and three days later they included all who were concerned in the murder once more charles intervened but for his promise he told the lords plainly neither he nor they would have been there his own honour and the public security alike demanded an indemnity for all except those immediately guilty of his father's death with amendments which the commons would not accept the bill passed the lords on august tenth in the conferences between the houses the feeling of the lords was expressed in a demand for the death of four members of cromwell's high court of justice in revenge for the death of four of their own number condemned by that court the victims to be chosen by the relatives of the slain peers the commons however refused to entertain the proposal hoping in full accord with charles and clarendon that their lordships would not have the sacrifice of the king's blood to be mingled with any other blood at length on august twenty ninth the bill passed besides the exceptions already mentioned hacker and axtel who were not among the king's judges were accepted for life while in the case of vane and lambert though they as men of mischievous power and activity were accepted it was understood that a pardon should be granted them and it was further determined that those who had given themselves up should be tried but if convicted should not be executed without a special act of parliament the trial which followed is famous because orlando bridgman interpreting the events of the last thirty years then established the present view of monarchical immunity and ministerial responsibility the king's person he laid down is inviolable he is directly subject to god alone and no authority whatever can exercise coercive power over him the full responsibility of ministers was affirmed with equal emphasis with the exceptions mentioned every act committed against the state between june first sixteen thirty seven and june twenty fourth sixteen sixty was forgotten at the price of some twenty lives the universal fear was removed it should not be forgotten that it was principally owing to charles and clarendon that after a civil war which had its roots in the deepest feelings which can stir men's minds after a despotism which triumphant as it placed england among european nations had roused the bitterest resentment the restoration of the old order was accomplished with blood shed which when compared with the provocations which seemed to call for vengeance was well nigh insignificant life was now safe it remained to give the same security to property with regard to the crown lands those of the church dignitaries and in a few cases those of private owners who had been forcibly dispossessed no action was taken either by the court or the parliament until the dissolution they then in the natural course of law since their confiscation had been illegal reverted to their original owners the question of private estates however was a different one those royalists who had voluntarily sold their lands looked eagerly forward to regaining them but here to their indignant disappointment clarendon stood firm in his assertion of the sanctity of private contract and the bill of sales decreed the confirmation of all transfers made with the owner's consent probably to no act of his administration did clarendon owe more odium as for none did he deserve more credit than to his integrity in this affair another matter of the first importance for the stability of the restored government was then taken in hand both charles and the commons were eager for the disbanding of the army to the king principally composed as it was of the soldiers who had served cromwell and whose acquiescence in charles return was largely mixed with sullen jealousy it formed a standing menace in the presence of such a force the monarchy could not breathe freely but charles had another reason little guessed at the time it is now known that he had formed the deliberate intention of dissolving parliament as soon as the troops were disbanded 
wresting all the power from the Presbyterians, and with the help of foreign money, raising an army for himself independent of any other authority. His people were as eager for the disbanding as he was. The cost of maintenance alone, seventy thousand pounds a month, was no light burden. But of all the feelings roused by Cromwell's rule, hatred of his military despotism was the deepest. It finds eloquent expression throughout the reign and has entered the statute book in the Mutiny and Riot Acts. In the debate on August 30th, William Morris aptly expressed the general feeling when he said that as long as the soldiery continued, there would be a perpetual trembling in the nation. They were inconsistent with the happiness of any kingdom. The keeping of the army on foot was like a sheep's skin and a wolf's skin, which, if they lie together, the former loses its wool. The nation, he said, cannot appear like itself whilst the sword is over them. Monk willingly cooperated in the step, though it at once robbed him of his extraordinary position. His utmost wishes were satisfied. The rude soldier of fortune had fallen upon times which gave ample scope for his peculiar genius. He had played the game with incomparable dexterity and had won the stakes. He had been made gentleman of the bedchamber, knight of the garter, master of the horse, commander-in-chief, and duke of Albemarle, with a pension of seven thousand pounds a year, and he had nothing more to desire. In England, fourteen regiments of horse and eighteen of foot, in Scotland, one of horse and four of foot were disbanded. Charles, however, took advantage of the sudden rising of a few fanatics in the streets of London to retain the Coldstream Guards and a regiment of horse, with one of the regiments which formed the garrison of Dunkirk, in all about five thousand men. One instance of the growth of modern constitutional ideas was the doctrine of ministerial responsibility laid down by Bridgman. Another was the adoption of the principle that the whole nation should pay to get rid of an abuse, even when a single class is benefited by its abolition. In settling the royal revenue, the feudal tenures which pressed solely upon the landed interest with the court of wards were swept away, and the money was raised instead from the excise, which having been raised originally by the long parliament to defray the expenses of the war against the king, was now perpetuated. It is no wonder that vehement debates took place upon the proposal, and that while political economists like Ashley Cooper and Maynard were supporters of the change, it was opposed both by crotcheteers like Prynne and by statesmen like Ansley. There remained but one question, but that a question of supreme importance the settlement of church government. The restoration had been the joint work of Episcopalian and Presbyterian. Would it be possible to reconcile them on this question too? The Presbyterian indeed was willing enough for a compromise, for he had an uneasy feeling that the ground was slipping from beneath his feet. Of Charles's intentions he was still in doubt, but he knew that Clarendon was the sworn friend of the church. The churchman, on the other hand, was eagerly expecting the approaching hour of triumph. It soon appeared that as king and parliament, so king and church were inseparable in the English mind, that indeed the return of the king was the restoration of the church, even more than it was the restoration of parliament. In the face of the present Presbyterian majority, however, it was necessary to temporize. The former incumbents of church livings were restored, and the commons took the communion according to the rights of the church, but in other respects the Presbyterians were carefully kept in play, Charles taking his part in the elaborate farce by appointing ten of their leading ministers royal chaplains and even attending their sermons. The state of things was faithfully reflected in Parliament. As early as July 9th, words had been used which concisely expressed the determination of the church. There was, said Heneage Finch, the solicitor general, no question as to her religion, and for the rest, 
he knew of no law for altering the government of the church by bishops in any case he hoped they would not cant after cromwell it was not to be expected that a presbyterian majority should tamely fall in with this ignoring of past years after prolonged debate and amid a scene of unusual disorder the question was shelved by a resolution desiring charles to select a number of divines to debate the whole matter he willingly undertook the task but was soon undeceived regarding the likelihood of a compromise a barren discussion was begun in writing between the anglican and presbyterian divines we agree with you in the main said the presbyterians but we wish certain minor matters altered if you agree with us in essentials the anglicans replied it is mere scruple-mongering to dispute about trifles charles now took the matter more completely into his own hands by issuing a declaration refusing on the ground of constraint to admit the validity of the oaths imposed upon him in scotland by which he was bound to uphold the covenant and not concealing his preference for the anglican church as the best fence god hath yet raised against popery in the world he asserted that nevertheless to his own knowledge the presbyterians were not enemies to episcopacy or a set liturgy and were opposed to the alienation of church revenues the declaration then went on to limit the power of bishops and archdeacons to a degree sufficient to satisfy many of the leading presbyterians one of whom reynolds accepted a bishopric charles then proposed to choose an equal number of learned divines of both persuasions to discuss alterations in the liturgy meanwhile no one was to be troubled regarding differences of practice the majority in the commons at first welcomed the declaration the scheme was indeed wide enough to take in all but an insignificant fraction of the presbyterians and a bill was accordingly introduced by sir matthew hale to turn the declaration into a law but clarendon at any rate had no intention of thus bulking the church of her revenge anticipating hale's action he had in the interval been busy in securing a majority against any compromise the declaration had done its work in gaining time and when the bill was brought in it was rejected by one hundred and eighty three to one hundred and fifty seven votes parliament was at once december twenty fourth dissolved the way was now open for the riot of the anglican triumph even before the new house met the mask was thrown off by the issuing of an order to the justices to restore the full liturgy the conference indeed took place in the savoy palace it failed like the hampton court conference of james i because it was intended to fail upon the two important points the authority of bishops and the liturgy the anglicans would not give way an inch both parties informed the king that anxious as they were for agreement they saw no chance of it this last attempt at union having fallen through the government had their hands free and their intentions were speedily made plain End of section 10. Section 11 of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 8 Triumph of Anglican Church Relations with the Continent. Number 1 Persecution of Dissent the extent of the reaction which had followed far more than it caused the restoration was disclosed when the new parliament met on may eighth sixteen sixty one its composition was ominous to the presbyterians a parliamentary movement had become a royalist revel there now appeared in a house of more than five hundred members but fifty-six of the old majority the great mass of the members were prepared to go all lengths in favour of the church and clarendon in his opening speech looked forward with confidence to their providing that neither king laws nor parliament may be so used again for a time the existence of an assembly actuated by such a spirit was a source of the greatest danger the decrees of the convention parliament 
were in the eye of the law illegal until confirmed by a constitutionally appointed body among them was the indemnity bill and there now appeared a serious prospect of some tampering with this the primary condition of the restoration settlement fortunately charles was firm to this part at least of his engagements his earliest message to the house and the need of such a message marks the danger was a distinct refusal to pass any bill whatsoever until this act should be put beyond dispute the commons then applied themselves to repairing the breaches of the constitution having imposed the taking of the sacrament according to the prescribed liturgy on all their members they first ordered the solemn league and covenant to be burnt by the hangmen they then restored the bishops to their seats in the house of lords a step to which charles was personally opposed as tending to raise a serious obstacle to the accomplishment of his desire for toleration of the catholics an act was next passed strengthening the law of high treason and rendering incapable of public employment any one who should affirm the king to be a heretic or a papist the long parliament was declared to be dissolved and the assertion that there could be any legislative authority in either or both houses without the king was rendered a penal offence parliament then in the full tide of loyalty declaring it to be their duty to undeceive the people who have been poisoned with an opinion that the militia of the nation was in themselves or in their representatives in parliament handed back to the king the entire control of the sea and land forces with sixteen forty one in their minds they passed a bill to limit the right of petitioning and declared that no war offensive or defensive could be lawfully levied against the king to whom also the power of veto was restored at one point however they stopped short there was not the slightest intention of making the crown independent the convention parliament had already given charles a life revenue of one million two hundred thousand pounds it was well known that this was insufficient but there was no proposal to increase it on november twentieth sixteen sixty one the houses reassembled in a state of great excitement rumours had been spread of presbyterian plots in various parts of the country and even without this incentive the majority were eager for a drastic expression of anglican supremacy the chief seats of presbyterian feeling were the corporations of towns and it was these bodies which in many cases returned members to parliament by the corporation act december nineteenth sixteen sixty one this source of presbyterian influence was swept away at a blow and a cogent argument offered to weak-kneed presbyterians to reconcile themselves with the dominant church three conditions were declared essential for admission into any municipality the renunciation of the solemn league and covenant the acceptance of an oath denying the lawfulness of taking arms against the king and especially of that traitorous position of taking arms by his authority against his person or against those commissioned by him and finally the taking the sacrament according to the english church the bill passed in the commons without difficulty in the lords however it met with considerable opposition at the hands of ashley cooper now lord ashley and other noblemen of the old presbyterian party helped in this instance by the lord treasurer southampton the determination of the commons was increased by the knowledge that charles himself in spite of his concurrence in this act was opposed to stringency toward the dissenters his financial necessities gave them the complete control of the situation and they now used their power to wring from him a personal declaration of allegiance to the church on march first sixteen sixty two he addressed the house complaining of the unworthy suspicions against him declaring himself as zealous for the church and as much in love with the book of common prayer as could be wished and expressed his desire that the house should pass an act of uniformity at once he was supplied with money and was then called upon to fulfil his part of the bargain the corporation act had practically destroyed presbyterianism in the state 
the act of uniformity now destroyed it in the church it first declared that no one might hold a living in the church unless he had before saint bartholomew's day august twenty fourth sixteen sixty two publicly read the service from the new prayer book which had been undergoing revision by convocation in the sense most objectionable to the presbyterians and had declared his unfeigned assent and consent to everything contained therein to express in the strongest manner the exclusiveness of the church and to stamp her with that national and political character which she has ever since held all connection with the protestant churches of the continent was broken off by the clause which forbade any one whose orders had been obtained abroad to continue in his benefice or to administer the sacraments without reordination by the bishop the act further provided that all incumbents holders of university offices schoolmasters and private tutors should in addition to taking the oaths prescribed by the corporation act renounce the covenant promise to conform to the liturgy and to endeavour no change or alteration of government either in church or state the same tests omitting only the renunciation of the covenant were imposed upon all the military forces of the kingdom and upon the lord's lieutenants and deputy lieutenants in the case of the clergy no circumstance of aggravation was omitted the day named for submission had been chosen with rare malice the great tithes their chief support would since they were not due until michaelmas pass to the new incumbents and no provision being made for the maintenance of the deprived ministers as had been made in the case of the anglican clergy ejected under the commonwealth they would be thrown on the world destitute of support a still more flippant disregard for justice was shown in the fact that as the revised prayer book was not published until st bartholomew's eve the presbyterians were called upon to express their unfeigned assent and consent to everything contained in a book they had not yet seen from their fellow dissenters the presbyterians received no encouragement the catholics and members of the protestant sects except in the case of a few independents held no benefices and were therefore untouched by the act nor had they any cause to love the presbyterians whose hand had formerly been heavy upon them moreover they were anxious about their own fate and they might well hope that if the lot of the presbyterians were made the same as their own their large numbers must before long lead to a general measure of toleration they found hope in an unexpected quarter both charles and clarendon were opposed to the rapid growth of the persecuting spirit the former because of the obstacles it placed in the way of favouring the catholics clarendon from fear of disturbance and revolt on march seventeenth the chancellor endeavoured in vain to introduce a clause enabling the king to dispense with the provisions of the act declaring that it was recommended by charles himself the act being passed and parliament being prorogued charles in compliance with the petition of the presbyterians which was supported by monk and manchester declared his intention of suspending its execution for three months now however he was deserted by clarendon who while glad to see a parliamentary recognition of the dispensing power would not as a constitutional lawyer favour a claim to an autocratic use of it by the crown and he only gave way when charles told him that his own honour was pledged to this course the vehement opposition of the bishops especially of sheldon the representative of the irreconcilable section of the church speedily convinced charles of the impossibility of success and the design was put aside the spectacle was presented of the presbyterians who usually placed the law above the prerogative calling upon the king to suspend the law by an unconstitutional use of power and of the bishops generally the staunch upholders of the prerogative resolutely opposing its exercise the presbyterians were determined to refuse the terms of uniformity they adhered to their determination in spite of liberal offers from the king of bishoprics and deaneries on sunday august seventeenth from all the presbyterian pulpits in the city the clergy who refused to conform 
preached their farewell sermons to crowded and sympathetic congregations and on the next sunday no fewer than two thousand clergymen the best of the great presbyterian body retired into voluntary poverty and professional exile henceforth presbyterianism was the creed not of a large part of the english church but of a dissenting sect the church of england had taken its final shape the shape which it holds to this day we get a glimpse of the difficulty of carrying out this act of uniformity and of its results in one part at least of the country from the reports of seth ward then bishop of exeter to sheldon in december sixteen sixty three he tells the archbishop that at least fourteen of the justices of the peace of devonshire alone are accounted errant presbyters and some of them esteemed as dangerous as any men within the diocese those therefore in exeter who have obeyed the laws have been checked and discouraged for their labour some of the most populous places had stood void he says ever since the passing of the act and complaints were almost universal either that they had no minister or a pitiful ignorant one or the minister hath complained of want of sufficient maintenance one minister whom he had put in prison had told him that after his removal he stayed some months to see whether any one would supply his place but at length finding that no man was put in his stead and that the people went off some to atheism and debauchery others to sectarianism for he is a presbyterian he resolved to adventure to gather his flock again and he had gathered a flock of fifteen hundred or two thousand on sunday last when he was taken from the pulpit and brought away number two first connection with france royal marriages sale of dunkirk the restoration of monarchy in england had been accomplished without the intervention of a single foreign power but scarcely was the crisis over before charles and the various continental governments sought to take mutual advantage of the change charles's object was a simple one it was to get money the revenue settled upon him by parliament was quite inadequate to the various calls of government the payment of debts incurred abroad the satisfaction of royalist demands and the expenses of his more disreputable pleasures still less was it sufficient to enable him to gratify the desire which he fitfully entertained throughout his reign of ruling as louis the fourteenth ruled of establishing an intelligent despotism independent of parliament founded upon armed force and the sympathy of dissent which might enable him to carry out his promised toleration of catholicism he determined therefore to secure his freedom from control by other means and this determination however unsteadily maintained is the keynote of his foreign policy throughout the reign his first application was to the dutch and from them as the price of an alliance he demanded two millions the renewal however of the navigation act of sixteen fifty one by which their carrying trade had in a great measure been destroyed formed an insuperable obstacle to union charles had plenty of alternatives for spain france and portugal were approaching him with rival offers in september sixteen sixty he let the spaniards understand that his alliance was merely a question of price they offered him whatever money he might want but they demanded that jamaica and dunkirk should be restored to them the proposal was at once refused and the plan for charles's marriage with the second daughter of philip the fourth being rejected by that monarch the negotiations were broken off with far greater satisfaction charles turned to france he was the son of a french princess and he had received great kindness from his cousin louis an alliance between the two crowns was from the dynastic and personal point of view obviously a natural one on louis's side considerations of statecraft pointed in the same direction at the peace of the pyrenees the french king had bound himself to give no aid to portugal then in rebellion against spain and he had acceded to the condition that that country should not be included in the treaty openly the promise was kept secretly it was systematically broken but louis now saw the means of supplying indirectly from england more effective help 
for many years the course of events had in general led to friendliness between portugal and england and a formal renewal of the alliance had been long under consideration in september of sixteen sixty a marriage was proposed between charles and the infanta catherine portugal offered as dowry the cession of tangier and bombay freedom of commerce in brazil and the east indies perfect religious liberty for english subjects in all portuguese territories and a sum of five hundred thousand pounds charles was in return to assist portugal with three thousand men and one thousand horses and to put eight frigates at her disposal to hinder this marriage spain had recourse to every device of intrigue and menace louis in turn spared no pains to accomplish a match by which without formally violating his engagements his old enemy could be so weakened the result was a signal victory of french influence the english privy council unanimously approved the marriage and the contract was signed on june twenty third sixteen sixty one in a speech couched in terms of studied insult to spain charles communicated his intention to the newly elected parliament and there too it was received with acclamation to enable him to carry out the terms of the contract louis sent charles a sum of eighty thousand pounds ten english men of war with three thousand men from the scotch garrison sailed to the portuguese coast even as early as january sixteen sixty two it was noticed that english protestant congregations had been established in lisbon two other marriages of importance took place in the royal family that between james and clarendon's daughter anne hyde had been secretly celebrated before the restoration it was now publicly acknowledged the personal connection with france was still more firmly cemented by the union of charles's favourite sister henrietta renowned for beauty wit and ability and intrigue and possessing great influence over charles himself with louis's younger brother the duke of anjou who afterwards became the duke of orleans by the portuguese marriage louis had made the first step in securing a hold on charles and thereby on english affairs but on the other hand it was by the vast commercial advantages it secured to england and from the aggressive alliance which it carried with it against the chief papal power of the world entirely consonant with the cromwellian policy of making us in dryden's magnificent phrase freemen of the continent very different was the step which emphatically marked the policy of isolation henceforth pursued and which formed another aid to the realization of french ambition as late as the summer of sixteen sixty one clarendon had urged upon the commons the necessity of maintaining dunkirk and the danger of its ever again being in hostile hands and parliament had proposed its perpetual annexation to the crown the expense incurred for the defence of portugal however the king's desire to be independent of parliament the absence of any wish for continental influence and the connection with france all contributed to suggest the advisability of raising money by the sale of the town to that power strong arguments were easily forthcoming it cost a hundred and twenty thousand pounds a year it brought no trade it had a dangerous harbour and its defence from the land side was extremely difficult on the other hand if it fell into an enemy's power it could easily be blockaded by england from the sea the cost of the maintenance of tangier jamaica and bombay and the probability of war with either france or spain if it were retained were dwelt upon clarendon at length gave way after some haggling the price was fixed at two hundred thousand pounds less than the cost of two years maintenance and in november sixteen sixty two to the great scandal of the protestant powers but with scarcely a dissentient in the privy council and without a murmur in parliament dunkirk was handed over to the french it was understood that the money was to be used not for the ordinary occasions of the crown but only for pressing accidents such as the quelling of an insurrection charles looked to it to provide himself with an army End of section eleven section twelve of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth 
by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter nine louis and spain the dutch republic sixteen sixty to sixteen sixty two the death of mazarin in march of sixteen sixty one found europe in a state of almost absolute repose the peace of westphalia had reformed the constitution of the german empire the treaty of the pyrenees had confirmed a truce in the long warfare of france and spain while the relative positions of sweden denmark and poland had been settled by the treaties of copenhagen and oliva in sixteen sixty one the independence of the dutch republic had been recognized the monarchy was permanently re-established in england number one personality of louis the fourteenth already however the agencies which were to put an end to this short breathing space were at work of these none was more potent than the ambition and the power of louis the fourteenth that monarch was the central figure of europe the despotic sovereign of a united country and the master of a superb army mazarin and the fronde had schooled him well to repress his passions to keep down the princes of the blood to be distant with his courtiers to be secret in his business to cultivate his natural talents for dissimulation to work hard these were to be the principles which should make him a great king above all the cardinal had urged him with his dying breath to have no prime minister he was to succeed to a double power and prestige those of the monarchy and those of the prime ministership he took possession of both parts of his inheritance at once on the day after mazarin's death he announced to the council his intention of taking the government solely upon himself his ministers his gens d'affaires he called them were henceforward to look to him for instructions his mother and the courtiers laughed at what they imagined was but a passing whim but the whim lasted more than fifty years during all that time no man in his kingdom worked harder than he no dispatch was signed no agreement sealed no money paid without his knowledge his energy and diligence were no more remarkable than his ability devoid of political morality he looked upon the state of europe with an eye piercing and cynical while the dispatches written by himself to his ambassadors in all the european courts are models of clearness of expression and correctness of insight number two louis claims one the whole spanish succession two the immediate possession of the spanish netherlands it was in his efforts to establish his claim upon the succession to the spanish monarchy that these qualities were first exercised should philip the fourth and his only son die as seemed probable without the birth of any other male heir in the meantime louis was determined to uphold the right of his wife that right as has been seen was rejected by the spaniards on the ground that both she and louis had signed a renunciation louis replied in the first place that the spaniards had themselves rendered that renunciation invalid by the non-payment of the dowry and secondly that no renunciation could be upheld which was contrary to a fundamental law of the spanish monarchy in june sixteen sixty one the hereditary prince was on his deathbed another child was about to be born to philip the fourth and his second wife should this be a son the question of renunciation would of course not be raised and the french ambassador was ordered in that case merely to press for the payment of the dowry on november first the prince died but a week later another boy the future charles the second was born and louis's path to the succession to the whole spanish monarchy was thus completely barred for the time his claim too had been contested from another side the second daughter of philip the third unlike louis's mother the elder daughter had signed no renunciation of her rights she had married the late emperor ferdinand and was the mother of the present emperor leopold who therefore claimed in her right to this louis again had a double answer first the old one of the inherent invalidity of all these renunciations 
secondly that in any case it would be neither his mother nor the emperor's but the present unmarried infanta who if she married would transmit her right to her husband and descendants and therefore unless she married the emperor neither he nor his children could claim in any case this contention of the emperor like that of louis himself fell of course into abeyance at the birth of the new prince but though the prospect of grasping the whole spanish monarchy had thus for the time faded away the ingenuity of louis's advisers had suggested another plan by which he might compass that portion of it most immediately important to him by a local custom of brabant referring solely to private property and in force in some only of the provinces of the low countries it was established that if a man married twice the succession went to the children of the first marriage to the exclusion of those of the second this local custom the jus devolutionis as it was called louis audaciously determined to invoke in order to form a claim at philip the fourth's death to the whole of the low countries that king had married twice and louis had married the only daughter of the first marriage the death of the hereditary prince her brother left her therefore if the local and private custom was to be held with regard to the succession a contention ridiculed by the spaniards the heiress to the low countries to the entire exclusion of the children of philip's second marriage the present infanta and the boy just born louis had meanwhile been endeavouring to compass his object by diplomacy hopeless of conquering portugal by force spain aware of the help which louis was unavowedly sending to it though ignorant of his connection with charles the second of england now by promises of eventual consent to the nullity of the renunciation and by urging the argument that england would if not checked grow too powerful at sea endeavoured to draw the french monarchy into a coalition against that country louis's answer was short and decisive ridiculing the idea of england growing too powerful he declared that to justify him in the eyes of europe for such a step he must have striking advantages offered him his terms were number one a secret revocation of the renunciation number two the immediate possession of franche comte luxembourg Hainaut, and cambrai and failing the revocation the towns of aire and saint omer as well on these conditions alone would he consent to break with the king of england but spain was not yet brought low enough to listen to such humiliating terms and though louis changed his tone to one of menace he found himself unable to move the court of madrid from its attitude of passive resistance to all his claims in october sixteen sixty two the negotiations were finally broken off louis had meanwhile been looking elsewhere for means of accomplishing his ends number three the dutch republic in striking contrast to the success of the monarchical principle in france and england was the development of the power of the dutch republic by the side of the absolute monarchy and the caste feeling of france and the threefold system of king established church and parliament in england was reigning a form of government in which there was neither arbitrary power aristocratic privilege nor ecclesiastical supremacy it consisted of a league of seven provinces each province preserving perfect independence as regarded its internal affairs but contributing its share to mutual defence the province in its turn was a federation of towns each of which bore to its province the same relation as that of the province to the whole federated body the town was thus the unit of national life the basis of the constitution its government was in the hands of a town council of varying number a merchant oligarchy for the most part self-elected who delegated their executive power and financial administration to a regent and it possessed complete autonomy in its own concerns it sent deputies to the provincial estates which regulated the entire internal affairs of that province administrative financial military and judicial similarly each province sent deputies to the states-general 
who was assisted by a council of state composed of twelve members selected from the different provinces voted upon the imperial questions of the republic peace war and measures for defence fixed the contingent of each province to the army and fleet and had the right of concluding alliances and of nominating the commanders-in-chief both by land and sea each province however was bound to obey the states-general only if its own deputies agreed in the decision and similarly each town was bound to obey the decision of the provincial council only if its deputies had concurred admirably adapted for the encouragement of local ambition and for the training of a large proportion of the citizens in the public service such a constitution was evidently unsuitable for crises when a common danger demanded immediate action on the part of the republic as a whole the need of a central authority overriding the individual interests or prejudices of each province or town was then keenly felt the history of the republic therefore shows a tendency to fall back in times of national peril upon the principle of a limited monarchy and when that danger is over to revert to the original constitution the struggle by which its independence was secured had been carried out under the house of orange to this family it had for a time given the supreme military and civil authority in the person of the first stadtholder william of orange and this authority legally elective had gradually become hereditary four members of the orange house successively ruled over the seven provinces and it was not until sixteen fifty one that the attempt of william the second the husband of mary daughter of charles i to acquire absolute sovereignty by a coup d'etat led to the abolition of the stadtholdership the autonomy of each town and province was then re-established and to render impossible the recurrence of an attempt at absolutism the military command was so divided that for purposes of foreign war the army was well-nigh useless the republic had shaken off the domination of a person it now fell under the domination of a single province holland was overwhelmingly preponderant in the federation she possessed the richest most populous and most powerful towns she contributed more than one-half of the whole federal taxation she had the right of naming the ambassadors at paris stockholm and vienna the fact that the states-general met on her territory at the hague necessarily gave her additional influence and prestige it was through her energy that the attempt of william the second had proved abortive she now stepped into the vacant place with the stadtholder's power that of the states-general also as representing the idea of centralization had largely disappeared the provincial estates of holland therefore under the title of their high mightinesses became the principal power to such an extent indeed that the term holland had by the time of the restoration become synonymous among foreign powers with the whole republic their chief minister was called the grand pensionary and the office had been since sixteen fifty three filled by one of the most remarkable men of the time john de witt john de witt therefore represented roughly speaking the power of the merchant aristocracy of holland as opposed to the claims of the house of orange which were supported by the noblesse the army the calvinistic clergy and the people below the governing class abroad the orange family had the sympathy of monarchical governments louis the fourteenth despised the government of monsieur le marchand while charles the second at once the uncle and the guardian of the young prince of the house of orange the future william the third of england and mindful of the scant courtesy which to satisfy cromwell the dutch had shown him in exile was ever their bitter and unscrupulous foe the empire of the dutch republic was purely commercial and colonial and she held in this respect the same position relative to the rest of europe that england holds at the present day to this supremacy many causes had contributed her geographical position between northern and southern europe the rivers from central europe reaching the sea on her shores her extended coastline 
made her a convenient centre for the reception and distribution of the wealth of all the lands of the earth the natural barrenness of the land and the incessant struggle to keep a footing against the inroads of the ocean had formed a thrifty hardy and patient race while the abundant fisheries on her coasts had made of a large part of her population the most skilful and daring sailors of the world speedily her fleets went farther afield as early as fifteen twenty three no fewer than two thousand vessels making three voyages a year were reaping rich harvests in english and scotch fishing grounds in fifteen forty seven eight ships of war attended to defend them from attack and in sixteen thirty five such importance did the dutch attach to this source of their wealth that they paid a sum of thirty thousand pounds for permission to fish that summer in the english waters but meantime and chiefly from a cause of a different nature the trade of the world had been gradually drifting into their hands while central europe was being desolated by the thirty years war the united provinces formed a haven of rest for industry and while every other nation was driving out by war or religious persecution the best of her working population the exiles found a ready welcome in a land in which religious toleration was a fundamental law under this constant influx of skill and enterprise aided by a wise commercial policy the wealth of the country increased with vast rapidity while through her navies developed out of the fishing fleet and formed of vessels which though far roomier than those of other countries were manned with fewer hands she was year by year acquiring a colonial empire in every continent and absorbing the carrying trade of the world in sixteen o four raleigh in a remarkable memoir to james i complained that english enterprise was confined to fetching coals from newcastle to london and at the same date the fleets of the republic were to be found in the east indies the moluccas java guinea ceylon the malaccas sumatra the cape of good hope brazil the coromandel coast malabar and had captured the chief portuguese possessions in asia and africa by sixteen sixty nine john de witt was able with truth to say that the hollanders had well nigh beaten all nations by traffic out of the seas and become the only carriers of goods throughout the world and in sixteen seventy their position is thus described in the lex mercatoria the commerce of holland which may be termed universal reassembles in the united provinces this infinite number of merchandises which it afterwards diffuses in all the rest of europe it produces hardly anything and yet has wherewith to furnish other people all they can have need of it is without forests and almost without wood and there is not seen anywhere else so many carpenters which work in naval construction its lands are not fit for the culture of vines and it is the staple or mart of wines which are gathered in all parts of the world and of brandies drawn from them it has no mines nor metals and yet there is found almost as much gold and silver as in new spain or peru as much iron as in france as much tin as in england and as much copper as in sweden the wheat and grains that are there sowed hardly suffice for nourishment of a part of its inhabitants and it is notwithstanding from hence that the greatest part of its neighbours receive them either for their subsistence or their trade in fine it seems as if the spices grew there that the oils were gathered there that it nourished the precious insects which spin the silk and that all sorts of drugs for medicine or dyeing were in the number of its products and of its growth its warehouses are so full and its merchants seem to carry so much to strangers that there is not a day that ships do not come in or go out and frequently entire fleets this is the more remarkable as in sixteen fifty one a rude blow had been struck at the commercial supremacy of the dutch in that year the famous act of navigation had been passed in england by which it was provided that no merchandise the product of asia africa or america should be imported into england in any but english-built ships commanded by an english master 
and navigated by a crew three-fourths of whom should be Englishmen, nor any European goods except in English ships or in ships belonging to the countries from which these articles originally came. No fish might be exported from or imported into England or Ireland except of English taking. By this law the carrying trade with England was utterly destroyed. It led to a repetition of the great duel between the two countries. In 1652, Tromp, to signify his power to sweep the seas, sailed down the channel with a broom at his masthead. Naval battles the like of which had never been seen filled the next two years. But in 1654, when the masterfulness of Cromwell and the genius of Blake had finally triumphed, the Republic was forced to make peace on terms which showed that the command of the sea was passing to her enemy. Not only was she compelled to assent to the Navigation Act, as well as to other conditions no less humiliating, but she even agreed that Dutch ships, as well of war as others, meeting any of the ships of war of the English Commonwealth in the British seas, shall strike their flag and lower their topsails. It was not to be expected that with her traditions and resources she would contentedly bear this badge of inferiority. Her feeling at the time of the Restoration was a burning desire to recover her old position. End of section 12section thirteen of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter ten louis and the spanish netherlands number one negotiations with de witt it was obviously of importance to louis to secure at least the benevolent neutrality of the republic should he decide to carry out his enterprise on the Spanish Netherlands. De Witt, in like manner, was looking round for support in case the personal antipathy of Charles II and the rivalry between the Dutch and English should lead to a renewal of war, while foreseeing a moment when he might have upon his frontier no longer the nerveless power of Spain, but the victorious armies of France. He was anxious to avoid the chance of this force being turned against the Republic. Under these feelings, a treaty was easily concluded in April 1662, whereby France and the Republic guaranteed each other's European possessions with their commercial and maritime interests and arranged for mutual defense if attacked. Liberty of fishing was reciprocally granted and France agreed to levy no more import duties upon Dutch shipping. De Witt's immediate object, however, was by all means to keep the Spanish Low Countries as a barrier between the United Provinces and the oncoming power of France. But he could take no overt step until Louis had acknowledged the designs which he had already guessed. To secure this acknowledgment became therefore the object of his diplomacy. Three plans had been put forward for the treatment of the Spanish Low Countries. Richelieu had favoured the plan of cantonment, by which they were to be formed into an independent Catholic Republic. Mazarin was bent upon their becoming part of the French dominions. The Dutch had more than once suggested equal partition with France. But as the power of France grew more threatening, the Dutch, in their anxiety to have her amicum sed non wickenum, leaned more and more to the plan of cantonment, and even affected to listen to a fourth proposal by Spain, that the ten Spanish provinces should form a defensive league with the Republic. Louis was as anxious to avoid a premature disclosure of his design as de Witt was to extract it. The astuteness of the Grand Pensionary, however, secured the first diplomatic success. He formally pressed upon Louis various solutions of the difficulty, especially that of partial cantonment, by which France and the Republic should each take the strategic towns on their respective frontiers, while the rest of the country became an independent republic. He represented that the great Dutch towns, tempted by the Spanish promises of wide commercial privileges, were so eager for the defensive league just mentioned 
that he should not be able much longer to withstand the clamour, and he declared that however friendly he might personally be to French interests, he could not actively assist them until Louis's intentions were distinctly expressed. After many months of diplomatic fencing, he was rewarded. For once off his guard, Louis permitted Destrade, the French ambassador, to place the devolution claim formally before de Witt. De Witt, having unmasked Louis, at once changed his tone. He replied that the claim founded upon a purely local custom of Brabant could not be entertained for a moment, and in spite of Louis's haughty anger, he exposed his reasons for so treating it in a most able historical memoir. Then, coming boldly to the point, he declared that a pursuance of the design would drive him to accept the Spanish League. Moreover, he said the emperor now contracted to the Infanta possessed a claim of at least equal right in the eyes of Europe, and he should be ready therefore to entertain proposals from Vienna. Firm, however, as was de Witt's tone, he was surrounded by difficulties. The activity of the partisans of the House of Orange was daily increasing, and he knew that the acceptance of the Spanish League would excite their most vehement opposition and imperil his own power. He was, however, released from the need of fully declaring himself by the action of the principal towns, which refused to concur in the plan of partial cantonment on the special ground that the continuance of the closure of the Scheldt by which measure the trade of their great commercial rival Antwerp had been effectually crippled, was not provided for. Freed from the necessity of further entertaining the French scheme, de Witt now succeeded in convincing the towns of the inadvisability of accepting the Spanish proposal. He thus secured a full knowledge of the ultimate objects of Louis without being bound to any definite course. Louis, too, was well satisfied the Spanish League had been the one thing he feared, and that danger was past. The Republic was for the time driven to inaction. He himself was sure of his own power to strike when the proper moment should come, and though the devolution claim had been unhesitatingly rejected by de Witt, the great advantage had been gained of making it familiar to men's minds. He now pursued his design in another quarter. Number two death of philip the fourth rejection of the french claims louis and spain day by day spain was falling into greater decrepitude her treasury was exhausted her armies unequipped and inefficient her navy had practically ceased to exist her diplomacy was despised the failure to reconquer portugal became ever more apparent and she was even compelled to stand idle while the moors insulted her coasts with impunity philip the fourth looked forward with acute pain to the disruption which threatened his kingdom it was more than doubtful whether his infant son should survive himself the unhappy boy appeared indeed in his physical infirmities to be no inappropriate symbol of the condition of the monarchy to which he was heir. At four years of age he was still at his nurse's breast. His head was not properly formed, neither his hair nor teeth were grown. He was unable to walk without assistance, and he was incessantly subject to fevers, eruptions, and bleedings. Philip had determined to secure what support he could for the tottering monarchy by marrying the young Infanta, Margaret Elizabeth, to the Emperor Leopold, naming her at the same time heir to the monarchy, should the male line become extinct, to the exclusion of all other claims. And the contract was signed on December 18, 1663. The news of the intended marriage had been announced to Louis in May, he coldly replied that he trusted it would entail no conditions prejudicial to his interests. Affairs in the Portuguese war had meanwhile been going from bad to worse. On January 18, 1663, the Spaniards had been severely beaten in great measure through the generalship of the Frenchman Schomburg and the valor of the English contingent. 
the campaign of 1664, though not marked by any decisive battle, was little less disastrous. In 1665 a final effort was determined upon, and Caracena, esteemed the best Spanish general of the day, was called from his governorship of the Low Countries to take the command. Nothing, however, could stay the ever-hastening descent. On June 17th was fought the great and decisive battle of Villa Viciosa, resulting in the utter defeat of the Spanish army. The blow killed Philip IV. He let the dispatch which brought the tidings drop from his hand, exclaiming, It is God's will, and daily and visibly fell to his grave. He died on September 17, 1665. Spain, however, still possessed men who refused to accept all as lost. Upon the removal of Caracena, the Low Countries had been placed under the Marquis of Castel Rodrigo. Skillful, enterprising, and devoted to his country, he determined, so far as the want of money or decent government at Madrid would allow, to place his province in a condition to meet an attack from France. To create a chain of forts, which should replace those which the peace of the Pyrenees had put into French hands, and in every way to expel French influence, were his great objects. His first general order forbade the inhabitants to wear the French dress or to follow the French fashion of the hair. Not until he applied to the emperor for leave to raise troops in Germany did he give Louis an excuse for interference. The use of the conditions inserted in the Treaty of Westphalia and of Louis's bond with the German princes was at once apparent. He wrote to those whose territories blocked the road into the Low Countries, urging them to refuse a passage to the troops, and at the same time made such vehement complaints at Madrid that orders were sent to Castel Rodrigo to drop this part of his plans. The governor then proceeded to carry out a long-contemplated scheme— by the peace of the Pyrenees, Louis had acquired a free passage across the Lys at saint Venant. To render this acquisition useless, Castel Rodrigo determined to turn the course of the river by a canal starting above the town, which would have left it high and dry, and placed a new water defense between him and France. Once more, however, Louis complained at Madrid, and once more the harassed and enfeebled court gave way. The terms of Philip IV's will were looked to with utmost anxiety by Louis. They were found to justify that anxiety to the full. The succession was left first to the young Prince Charles and his descendants, then to the Infanta and her children. Not a word was said as to the French claims, but the dowry provided by the Treaty of the Pyrenees was to be paid in full. Had Louis's hands been free, he would doubtless now have pressed his devolution claim to the Low Countries, which the Spanish Council had unanimously rejected. But he was for the moment embarrassed. He was at war with England, in compliance with his treaty of April 1662 with the Dutch. He was, too, engaged in a diplomatic dispute with Sweden and in a quarrel with the Pope, and complications had arisen in Savoy. He again saw himself compelled to wait. End of section 13. Section 14 of the English Restoration and Louis XIV by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 11. England, Persecution of Dissent, the Dutch War, Part 1. Number 1. The King's Attempt to Favor Popery. The English Parliament had separated in May of 1662, gratified by their triumph over the Presbyterians in the Corporation and Uniformity Acts. They met again in February 1663 to find themselves confronted by an enemy whom they feared and detested with a still keener hate and terror. The dominant factor in the feverish politics of this reign is to be found in the feeling of the ordinary English mind regarding popery. The churchman might despise and persecute the Presbyterian. The Presbyterian, like the Scots, might regard the other sects as advocates of the devil himself. But in all of them, hatred of popery was the master impulse. 
Fox's Book of Martyrs was favorite reading, and the fires of Smithfield were in the English imagination still alight. Another armada seemed to hang like a dark cloud upon our shores, and a fresh gunpowder plot might at any moment burst forth. There was no atrocity which was not natural to the papists. The very debauchery of the court was laid to their charge, and the cry which greeted the early Christians in Rome, Christianos ad leones, never rang in their ears more pitilessly than the execrations which, when the panic rose to its height, were hurled at the bloody papists. To the Englishman, then, it was the first duty of his king to hate and combat this last and insolentest attempt on the credulity of mankind. But first, to his astonishment, and then to his indignant fury, he found, or thought he found, that Charles was of altogether another mind. Charles, indeed, had abundant reasons for wishing to alleviate the lot of the Catholics. He was himself a Catholic, had been befriended while in exile by Catholic princes, and had made promises of favor which he earnestly wished to fulfill. Among his father's most faithful adherents had been many of the proscribed creed, and more than others they had been the mark for fine imprisonment and confiscation. He was at this very time in formal communication with Innocent the Eleventh for a reconstitution of the English Church, whereby, while retaining its national and independent character, it should nominally acknowledge the Holy See as its head. These considerations had led to his former attempt to put off the execution of the Act of Uniformity for three months. He now repeated the attempt. On December 26, 1662, during the recess, he issued a declaration expressing his intention of doing his best to induce Parliament to mitigate the rigor of that measure and to concur with him in making some act for that purpose as may enable him to exercise with a more universal satisfaction that power of dispensing which he conceived to be inherent in him. This declaration drew from Sheldon a letter in which the iniquity of the proposal, as tending to set up that most damnable and heretical doctrine of the Church of Rome, Whore of Babylon, was set before him in the plainest language. Undeterred, the king met Parliament on February 18, 1663, with a speech in which he declared himself in nature an enemy to all severity for religion and conscience, and while asserting that he had no intention of favoring the papists, though he owed them gratitude and admitted their claims to indulgence, and desiring that laws might be made to hinder the spread of their doctrine, he asked for such a power of indulgence to use upon occasions, as might not needlessly force them out of the kingdom or give them cause to conspire against its peace. Before the words were well out of the king's mouth, all men saw before them in tangible shape the enemy they dreaded most. They had kept out the fox, said William Coventry. Were they now to let the wolf into the fold? They did not know that Charles was himself a Catholic, but there was much going on to cause suspicion and in every place where he wrote dissent, the English mind read Pope of Rome. He was not long left in ignorance of the feelings he had roused. Within a week, the commons answered his appeal in a remonstrance of the boldest character. Such an indulgence, they said, will establish schism by a law. It will no way become the gravity or the wisdom of a parliament to pass a law at one session for uniformity and at the next session, the reason for uniformity continuing just the same, to pass another law to frustrate or weaken the execution of it, it will expose your majesty to the restless importunity of every sect or opinion. It will be a cause of increasing sects and sectaries, whose members will weaken the Protestant profession so far that it will become difficult for it to defend itself against them, and in time some prevalent sect will, at last, contend for an establishment which for aught can be foreseen may end in popery. Charles now knew the conditions on which he might expect to continue to rule. At all hazards popery was to be kept out of the kingdom by the maintenance of a dominant state church. A bill introduced in the House of Lords 
enabling him to dispense with the act of uniformity was to his great disgust opposed by clarendon and southampton and had ultimately to be dropped he was made to understand that supply would depend upon the immediate issue of a proclamation banishing all catholic priests and he yielded then taking him at his word as to hindering the growth of papacy the parliament heartily laboured therein he now however put an end to the session his object was to keep the matter as far as possible in his own hands and to secure the sympathy of the dissenters but he saw how keen was the anger caused by the overconfident tone of the catholics who had thought themselves secure in his favour and before the houses separated he promised that he would in the next session himself suggest bills for realising the purpose which the parliament had at heart on other questions the reaction against the principles of the long parliament was still in full force the triennial act had secured parliamentary government by declaring that if the king did not summon a fresh parliament within three years from a dissolution the peers were to undertake the duty if they failed the sheriffs of each county and in the last resort the electors themselves an impression had got about that this meant that no parliament might sit for more than three years skilfully availing himself of this to raise jealousy in a body whose continuance was thus threatened and using to the utmost the influence of bribes and of the king's friends as those members who were attached to the court were called charles so prepared the ground that on the reassembling of the houses in march of sixteen sixty four he ventured to tell them that much as he was in love with parliaments he never would suffer a parliament to come together by the means prescribed by that bill anxious no doubt to narrow the scope of their differences with the king the commons while reasserting the principle of the triennial bill removed from it all the precautions which had given it efficacy the result of this abandonment of a strong position was not shown until the end of the reign when for the last four years the king ruled absolutely and without a parliament number two persecution of protestant dissent the commons then resumed their favourite work the act of uniformity had of course led to the establishment of unauthorised religious meetings or conventicles against which the anglican clergy and the commons invade as hotbeds of schism and sedition charles ever unwilling to maintain resistance where attack was persistent and anxious for a supply gave his assent to the first conventicle act this iniquitous measure which was to be in force for three years first renewed the act of uniformity of elizabeth it then absolutely forbade meetings of more than four persons besides the household for religious services other than those allowed by the church three months imprisonment or a fine of five pounds for the first offence a double penalty for the second banishment for seven years to the american plantations or a fine of one hundred pounds for the third and death for return or escape were the penalties of the act sheriffs justices of the peace or any persons commissioned by them were authorized to break up conventicles and imprison at will any who were present at or who permitted the meetings even married women were liable to a year's imprisonment unless their husbands paid a fine of forty shillings many devices were resorted to for evading these provisions sometimes where houses were joined a hole was cut in the wall so that two or three congregations each within the limits of the act might listen to a sermon in the records of the baptist congregation at broadmead near bristol we read of a conventicle being held in an upper room the stairs being purposely packed so closely with women that the sheriff and his officers were unable to force their way up until time had been given for the minister and his congregation to escape by another way nevertheless the sufferings were very great upon the quakers who from the novelty and peculiarity of their doctrines were more suspected and obtained less popular sympathy than any others the blow fell with special weight pepys on august seventh sixteen sixty four relates how he saw several being dragged through the streets and his only comment is they go like lambs without any resistance 
I would to God they would conform or be more wise and not be catched. Before a year was over, an act still more cruel and drastic was carried in the commons without a division, though again opposed in the lords. During the desolation of the plague, many of the clergy had fled. Without authorization, the deposed Presbyterian ministers stepped into their pulpits and once more gathered eager congregations. But the vigilance of the Anglican Church was not asleep. The old cry was raised of schism and rebellion. At the October session at Oxford in 1665, it was determined to prepare a shibboleth, a test, to distinguish among those who will be peaceable and give hopes of future conformity, and who of malice and evil disposition remain obdurate. Once more the pressing need of supplies compelled Charles to give way. For consenting to the Five Mile Act, he obtained a grant of a million and a quarter. No nonconformist minister was permitted henceforth to teach in schools or to come within five miles of any city, corporate town, or parliamentary borough, unless he had previously subscribed an oath denying the lawfulness of taking arms under any circumstances against the king or those commissioned by him, and declaring that he would not at any time endeavor any alteration of government in church or state. The penalty was six months' imprisonment or a fine of forty pounds. The infamous trade of informer, which had been created by the Conventicle Act, and which was so odious a feature of the reign, was encouraged by the promise of one-third of the fine exacted. It was, too, actually proposed, and the motion was only defeated by six votes, that this oath should be imposed upon the whole nation. The machinery of persecution was now complete. The Corporation and Uniformity Acts had settled forever the limits of the Church. The Conventicle and Five Mile Acts were the answer of the Church to the claim of dissent, not to legal recognition, but to the right to exist. Number 3. Causes of the Dutch War while the Anglican Church was exacting to the utmost the vengeance she deemed her right for the injuries of twenty years, and was asserting the supremacy which was to exist in the same tyrannous form for nearly two centuries, the country was reeling under the stress of a great naval war. England and the Dutch Republic were now engaged in the second part of that tremendous contest for the commercial supremacy of the world, of which the first had been fought out between Tromp and Blake. The peace of 1654 had not only left the causes of enmity untouched, but in the confessions of inferiority exacted from a high-spirited people had established the certainty of a renewal of the conflict. The mutual advantages which the Protector and De Witt received from their alliance had indeed secured the continuance of peace during the Commonwealth, and in September 1662, in spite of the Navigation Act, a fresh treaty had been concluded between the two nations. This treaty in itself, however, only served to advance the date of a rupture. It gave a mutual liberty of fishing to both countries, but otherwise it was almost solely to the advantage of England. The invidious demand for the salute by Dutch ships to the English flag in English waters was repeated and allowed. Polaroon, the richest of the Molucca Islands was nominally restored to England, and it was agreed that neither country should afford protection to the rebels of the other. But while the forms of amity were thus preserved between the two governments, the nations themselves were actually in fierce and incessant strife in every quarter of the globe. The Committee of Trade reported to the Commons that the English were almost driven out of the East and West Indies, Turkey, and Africa, with a loss during the last few years of seven millions sterling. Wherever the Dutch had influence, they compelled the natives to close their ports against their rivals. Polaroon had not been handed over according to the treaty, and the English had been deprived of the lucrative slave trade from the Guinea coast to the Barbados. On April 2, 1664, the House presented a petition to the King for the speedy redress of these wrongs, and unanimously expressed their willingness to assist him with their lives and fortunes. The Dutch were in a state of equal irritation. The acquisition of Bombay by England in accordance with the treaty with Portugal had especially roused their jealousy. In the spring of 1664, Robert Holmes, 
sailed on a filibustering expedition along the African coast, he captured eleven merchant vessels and ousted the Dutch from Goree, Cape de Verde, Cape Corso, and many other places. In America, the Dutch West India Company had for forty years possessed Long Island and the opposite coast from the Connecticut River to Delaware Bay. A force under Colonel Nicholas drove them out, and Charles, after changing the name of New Amsterdam to New York, handed the country over to his brother James. Tobago and other good harbors in the Antilles were similarly wrested from the Zealand settlers. The Dutch were not idle under these aggressions. De Ruyter was sent to the African coast with orders to make war on the English and to do them all the harm he could. In October he captured the English vessels at Goree and took all their posts on the Guinea coast except Cape Corso. The English retaliated by cutting off the Dutch Bordeaux fleet, and after a severe action part of that from Smyrna also. All Dutch ships lying in British harbours were seized as prizes. Thus the nations necessarily drifted into formal war. Must we, said the Dutch envoy to Monk, sacrifice our commerce to yours? Whatever happens, replied Monk, we must have our part, or the peace will not last. Even had the rulers been anxious for peace, it could not have been maintained. But every private and family feeling in Charles's mind was enlisted against the Dutch. He disliked them personally, and he declared that his honor required him to be their enemy since Cromwell had been their ally. His brother James, an eager advocate of England's commercial interests, who hated the Dutch as a Calvinistic people, and who was ambitious of naval glory, sedulously cultivated these feelings. Charles, moreover, saw in the outbreak of war a chance of a liberal supply, and trusted that the binding influence of a great national crisis might bring to his side the classes disaffected to the government. De Witt similarly hoped to find in the contest a means of frustrating the intrigues of the Orange faction. Number 4. Preparations of England and the Republic the declaration of war by England in March of 1665 found the Crown, the people, and the Parliament for once in complete harmony. A supply of £2,500,000, the largest money grant hitherto given by an English Parliament, was unanimously voted, and Charles's terms to the Dutch rose in proportion. He demanded compensation for injuries to British commerce, the possession of various ports as pledges for payment, the right of search of all foreign ships in the Channel, and the renunciation by the Dutch of their fishing rights in British waters. Men talked of giving the law to the whole trade of Christendom, and of making all ships which passed through the narrow seas pay toll to England. The number of vessels with their armaments which the Dutch were to be allowed to keep was mentioned. The din of preparation resounded in every dockyard in the kingdom. Commissioners were appointed in the principal ports for the sale of prizes, and it was declared that all ships, no matter from what country they sailed, were liable to capture if there were three Dutch sailors on board. Privateers were let loose in swarms. The war, it was said, must support itself. No less high was the spirit of the Dutch. Heavy taxes were cheerfully voted. The navy was brought to its utmost efficiency, especially in the quality of the guns, and the army, as far as possible, was reorganized. Entrenched batteries were erected at all the exposed points of the coast. The peasants were armed to resist a possible landing. The sailors were to receive increased rations, and liberal pensions were voted for the families of all who should fall. Large rewards were offered for the capture of prizes, and two thousand pounds for that of the admiral's flagship. For any captain who should strike to the enemy or retire without orders, there was to be but one penalty, death. De Witt now claimed from Louis the fulfillment of the Treaty of April 1662. Louis, however, was much embarrassed. He was afraid that the war might spread, and that he might be thereby hampered in his design on the Spanish Low Countries. Moreover, by declaring for the Dutch, he would lose England, and from England he had the widest hopes for Charles had given him to understand that as far as he was concerned, France might have a free hand in the Netherlands. On the contrary, if he allowed the Dutch to succumb, de Witt would be overthrown, the House of Orange would be triumphant, and the Republic would fall politically into dependence upon England. 
the first great action had taken place before he had made a move to redeem his promises. End of section 14. Section 15 of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 11 England, Persecution of Dissent, The Dutch War, Part 2. Number 5 The War, 1665. In spite of the disorder which reigned at the Admiralty, so vividly described by Pepys, an English fleet such as had never been gathered together before was ready for sea in the spring of 1665. No fewer than 109 large vessels with 30 of smaller size, manned by 21,000 men, many of them old Commonwealth sailors, and armed with 4,192 guns, sailed under the command of james the dutch fleet under the veteran optum was of the same size but manned with more numerous crews and armed with heavier guns this superiority was however corrected by the greater knowledge of the art of sea warfare which the english had learnt under blake nothing says an eyewitness can equal the good order of the english their line is perfect and thus an enemy who comes near them has to undergo their whole fire. They fight like a line of cavalry in perfect discipline, whilst with the Dutch the various squadrons leave their ranks and come separately to the charge. The fleets met off Lowestoft at 4 a.m. on June 3rd. The explosion of Opdam's vessel was the turning point of the battle, and the Dutch withdrew in confusion, Tromp with his squadron alone keeping up the fight but for the negligence of the English in ceasing the pursuit during the night, the hostile fleet would have been annihilated. As it was, the Dutch had lost, besides the admiral, three vice-admirals, nineteen first-rates, and seven thousand men. The English loss was four ships and fifteen hundred men, that in officers, as in all the battles of this war, being proportionately great. The medal struck in London to celebrate the victory bore the proud motto, Et Pontus Servoyet. For a time deep discouragement weighed upon the Dutch, but the spirit of De Witt rose with disaster. The penalties due for flight were sternly meted out. Three captains were shot, six more were degraded, and had their swords broken above their heads. A superb mausoleum was raised at the Hague in honour of the dead light vessels put out to warn the different merchant fleets at sea router arrived opportunely with his guinea squadron while the east indian and mediterranean fleets also reached holland with but small loss meanwhile the dutch had been attacked from another side bernard van gallen bishop of munster was the last representative of those warrior prelates who had been conspicuous in the middle ages his youth had been passed in the army and his vast wealth enabled him to indulge the military taste which he had retained. His position on the Dutch frontier gave him at this time special importance, and Charles II, who knew that he had standing causes of jealousy with his neighbours, had skilfully secured his assistance. In June 1665, an alliance had been concluded by which in return for a heavy subsidy, the bishop engaged to maintain an army of 30,000 men, and to attack the Dutch within two months. The Republic was almost incapable of resistance. The fortifications were out of repair. The best troops were on board the fleet, and she could oppose this attack with but 7,000 untrained men. The bishop entered Dutch territory, took Zutphen, and overran the province of Overissel. Upon the sea, however, the Dutch had once more asserted their supremacy, a fresh fleet, raised by the efforts of De Witt, had sailed in the midst of the stormy season to challenge their foes wherever they might be found. The challenge was in vain. London was panic-stricken by the plague, the crews of the English fleet were themselves infected, and the sixty ships at the mouth of the Thames lay sullenly inactive. The Dutch were compelled at length to return to their own shores without firing a gun. Nonetheless, 
the expedition had served to raise the courage of their country and to show the english how far they still were from the victory to which they had so confidently looked forward number six dutch alliances de witt now again pressed louis to fulfil his treaty engagements otherwise he threatened that he would make peace and enter into close alliance with the english for louis this meant a serious obstacle to the carrying out of his great project he was moreover nettled at the coolness with which charles the second had in the flush of a first success treated his offers of mediation he therefore declared his intention of sending a fleet to join the dutch in the north sea and at the same time maintaining a squadron in the mediterranean he promised to employ his diplomacy in their favour wherever he had influence in europe and to assist their intrigues with all charles's discontented subjects as soon as he was informed of charles's treaty with the bishop of munster he sent a corps to join the dutch troops who were resisting the prelate the conduct of the french showed however how little their sympathies lay with their nominal allies they behaved as if they were in a hostile country they pillaged the people and insulted their religion they openly cursed the dutch cause and they drank publicly in the market-place of maastricht to the healths of the king of england and the bishop of munster the french commander successfully avoided every favourable opportunity for attacking the bishop's troops and indeed acted in such a way as to raise to the utmost the ill-will already existing between the two nations nevertheless the fact that france was in alliance with the dutch and had actually declared war against england january sixteen sixty six had given far greater weight to the diplomacy of the states general they baffled charles's ambassador in sweden and succeeded in restraining that country from joining england they formed with Denmark an alliance, February 11th, 1666, by which she bound herself to place forty ships at their disposal. The elector of Brandenburg, February 16th, 1666, promised to force the bishop to make peace, and the heads of the House of Brunswick, Luneberg, in consequence offered their good will. Heavy subsidies were paid by the Dutch in each case. The result was that the warlike bishop was compelled april sixteen sixty six to renounce the english alliance and to sign an ignominious peace when the rival fleets again put to sea in the early summer of sixteen sixty six england was without an ally from bergen to bayonne there was not a friendly port open to her ships six months later october twenty seventh sixteen sixty six after the campaign which has now to be described these different treaties were completed and confirmed by a closer defensive alliance for ten years between the republic denmark brandenburg and brunswick luneburg by which each power agreed to assist the others with all its forces in case of new aggression it thus relieved the republic from her dangerous dependence on louis and it was the first sign of that tendency to coalition against france which henceforward is so marked a feature of the politics of europe number seven the war sixteen sixty six meantime great events had been passing on the sea on june first sixteen sixty six the fleets had met off the dunes and during four days had waged the most terrible sea fight in history Rauder and tromp with one hundred vessels were confronted by an english fleet under monk rendered greatly inferior in numbers by the necessity of dispatching rupert with twenty vessels to meet the french fleet which louis however who only desired to see the two great naval powers destroying one another carefully kept back the battle raged from midday until dusk some idea of the slaughter may be gathered from the fact that in an english vessel which went into action with three hundred men but forty were left alive at six next morning the contest was renewed the day's fighting went against the smaller fleet and monk fell back sullenly and in perfect order toward the english coast the next day however rupert rejoined him and thus strengthened the english prepared for a third struggle 
Router summoned all his captains to his own vessel and told them that upon the issue of that day depended not only their own fate but that of the Republic. Fighting began at nine in the morning and lasted with desperation for six hours without advantage to either side. Then Router hoisted the red flag, the signal for a general and final effort. With such desperate valor was he obeyed that he twice pierced his enemy's line. Still, it was only after incessant fighting, lasting till dusk, that the English gave way, and so shattered was his own fleet that he did not attempt to pursue his advantage. He had lost three vice admirals, two thousand men, and four ships. On the English side, five thousand men had been killed and three thousand taken prisoners eight ships of the line had been sunk or burnt and nine more remained in the hands of the dutch almost without the loss of a day each side prepared to renew the struggle the dutch sailed from the tessel on july fourth before the end of the month an english armament the finest and best equipped that had left her shores sallied from the thames on august fourth monk and router met off the norfolk coast to try conclusions once more after another long day of carnage the dutch this time decisively beaten sought safety in confusion in the shallows of zealand the english signalized their mastery by a daring and successful act in the harbour of flea at the entrance of the zuiderzee one hundred sixty merchant ships were riding in apparent safety a single english frigate followed by five fire-ships, managed to penetrate the narrow passages. The fire-ships were let loose, and the whole fleet, with the exception of nine vessels, was destroyed. The loss was estimated at a million sterling. Internal troubles were at the same time pressing upon De Witt. As misfortunes gathered round the Republic, men's thoughts turned more strongly to the family under whom the early greatness of their country had been achieved five provinces with zealand the second in influence at their head now declared for peace and for the restoration of the house of orange even in holland de witt's own province the cause made way harlem and leyden were unanimous for the prince it was demanded that he should be named captain-general of the cavalry and should have a place in the council of state other towns urged that the republic should adopt him as the child of the state and undertake his education lest he should grow up in english principles unable otherwise to nullify the intrigues of the adherents of the prince of orange de witt determined to follow this last suggestion he himself undertook as mazarin had formerly done with louis to instruct the prince in the art of government already the intelligence power of dissimulation and persistence of william's character was such as to strike an intelligent observer in other respects de witt was in good hope not only had his indomitable energy enabled him once more to send forth a fleet which in vain challenged rupert at the mouth of the thames and thus restored the honour of the flag but he found that england was herself anxious for peace london was in ruins from the fire the navy, despite its late successes, was in a desperate condition. The state of the treasury compelled Charles to retrench his expenses. This he did, not by any diminution in the shameless extravagance of his pleasures, but by starving the navy to such an extent that although Parliament had made another grant of £1,800,000, England was obliged to act strictly on the defensive, the sole office of her warships as in the days of James I being to convey the colliers from newcastle to london from the scotch came bitter outcries at the strangling of their trade which owing to the rigorous protection laws of england was almost exclusively with the dutch ireland was equally distressed while as for england herself her feelings were shown by the address of the speaker on january eighteenth sixteen sixty seven who alluding to the terrible exhaustion of the kingdom prayed Charles in the name of the people to put an end to this desolating war. Evidently, says Clarendon, the Dutch could endure being beaten longer than England could endure to beat them. Charles seized the opportunity of returning to his natural personal connection with France. In February 1667, 
Lord St. Albans was secretly sent to Paris to conclude an engagement on the basis that England should enter into no connection during 1667 with the House of Austria, while Louis was to support all Charles's interests in or out of the kingdom. The final form which this intrigue took, an intrigue kept entirely secret from the English ministers and contained only in autograph letters from both monarchs to the Queen Mother, in whose house the negotiations had taken place, was number one, each pledged himself not to enter during a year into any alliance contrary to the interests of the other, number two, Louis agreed to hold back the fleet with which he had promised to help the Dutch, and number three, Charles was to allow him a free hand in the Spanish Low Countries. Number eight, the Dutch in the Thames, Treaty of Breda. Sweden, having offered her mediation, a conference met in May 1667 at the neutral town of Breda. For a long while it was found impossible to come to terms. Exhausted as both nations were, neither had reduced the other sufficiently to gain the commercial advantage on which they were bent. It was now that de Witt, looking anxiously across the frontier to the Spanish Low Countries, into which Louis had already marched, determined upon a decisive stroke. Suddenly, on June 7th, when Charles was at a drunken revel at the Duchess of Monmouth's, all mad in hunting of a poor moth, the sound of guns was heard in the Thames. It was the Dutch fleet of sixty-one men of war, which under Router and John de Witt's brother Cornelius had come to revenge upon England the insult of Flie. Mounting the Thames as far as Gravesend, and driving the English vessels before them, they took Sheerness, sailed as far as Upner, and along the Medway to Rochester, burnt three English men of war, and succeeded in capturing the Royal Charles, which was taken in triumph to Holland. Then Router sailed proudly along our coasts, vainly challenging a contest at Harwich, Portsmouth, Torbay, Dartmouth, and Plymouth. The immediate effect of this daring blow was to extort peace. On July 31, 1667, the Treaty of Breda was signed and a month later ratified. Its terms were the terms of a drawn battle. Each nation was to retain all conquests made, both before and during the war, up to May 10, 1667, either in territory or ships, and the Treaty of 1662 was annulled. The effect of this was that England kept New York, and the Dutch Suriname and Polaroon. The act of navigation was so far relaxed that Dutch vessels were allowed to bring Dutch, German, and Flemish goods into English ports. The salute to English men of war in British waters was again allowed, but only as a matter of courtesy. The Treaty of 1662, as far as it regarded commerce, was renewed. Each country was to protect the other against all enemies whatsoever. At the same time, treaties were made by England with France and Denmark. France restored St. Christopher and gave up Antigua and Montserrat. England restored Acadia or Nova Scotia. Denmark was admitted to commercial equality. The great struggle for the command of the sea and the commerce of the world was over for the time only because the combatants, exhausted and bleeding, needed repose. It had decided nothing and left behind it hatred and mistrust. But hatred and mistrust yield to the pressure of a common danger. Even before peace was concluded, all eyes had been turned from Breda to the victorious march of Louis' armies. The era of French aggression in Europe had begun. End of section 15. Section 16 of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 12. Diplomacy and Preparations of Louis. Invasion of Spanish Netherlands. Number 1. French treaties with Portugal and the Rhine princes. The years of the Dutch war had been on Louis's part a time of incessant diplomatic activity in preparation for the great design. Himself distinguished by all the qualities which mark a master of statecraft, 
he was served with implicit obedience by a corps of the most accomplished diplomats that Europe had yet seen. Lyon in Paris, Ruvigny and Colbert in London, de Grémonville in Vienna, the Archbishop of Ambrun in Madrid, Pampon and Destrade in Sweden and the United Provinces. These and many like them had, except in De Witt, Lisola, and perhaps Arlington, no rivals. Well might a baffled English envoy at Madrid exclaim, France has the gift of persuading what she pleases here, as in the rest of Christendom. By his nominal alliance with the Dutch, Louis had prevented them from taking measures against an aggression which would bring him to their frontier, and by restraining his own fleet had prevented them from crushing their rival. When England seemed to be preponderating, he had, on the other hand, been instrumental in gaining for the Republic, in 1666, the alliances which had helped to give her heart for another effort. He had secured from Charles, while peace was still pending, a secret and personal engagement which assured the neutrality of England for a time sufficient for his immediate purpose. But previously to this, he had scored against her a brilliant diplomatic success in the peninsula by counteracting her endeavours to bring about peace between Portugal and Spain, and by forcing from the former an offensive alliance with himself. By this treaty, March 31, 1667, it was agreed that for a heavy subsidy, armed help against Spain, Louis's guarantee of any treaty she might make with Spain after Spain herself had made peace with France, and his promise to compel Spain to grant the title of king to her ruler, Portugal should actively carry on the war, should grant considerable commercial advantages to France, and should listen to no proposals from Spain until France herself made peace. He thus secured a potent source of distraction to Spain whenever he might choose to strike his blow. Secure of England, the Republic, and Portugal, there now remained for Louis only one possible opposition of importance to neutralize. From Leopold, chief of the Austrian house, on account of his near relationship to Spain, the former connection of the countries, and the proximity of the Spanish low countries to his own dominions, the liveliest resentment might be expected. The means to counteract this difficulty, at any rate for a time, had already been provided by Mazarin in 1658, by the formation of the Rhine League, which renewed its constitution every three years and was still in existence in August 1667. Louis had, too, in 1664, formed separate alliances with the King of Sweden, the Grand Elector of Brandenburg, and the Electors of Saxony and Mayence, cemented by large subsidies. He had thus made himself in a great measure, the arbiter of German affairs, and took frequent occasion to assert his position. Naturally, however, as thus fettered, the emperor grew less and less formidable to the princes of the empire, these bonds had become relaxed. Jealousy of France was taking the place of jealousy of the emperor, and in 1667 it seemed doubtful whether another prolongation of three years of the Rhine League would be secured. Louis, therefore, at once, October 28, 1667, made secretly, at heavy cost, fresh alliances with the princes along the Rhine, the electors of Mayence and Cologne, the Duke of Neuburg, and the Bishop of Munster, by which they engaged to refuse a passage to Austrian troops. At the same time, he stirred up disaffection among the emperor's discontented subjects in Hungary, hoping thus to distract his attention, as in the case of Spain he had done by the help of Portugal. Number two, invasion of the Low Countries. Never did a fairer prospect present itself to an ambitious monarch. France was at this moment, beyond comparison, the best administered country in Europe. The wounds of the Fronde had been healed, and all classes seemed in contentment. The energy and determination of Louis himself were ably seconded by the devotion of the great administrators who had learned their trade from Mazarin. Colbert had removed abuses and reorganized finance with such success that Louis found himself in 1667 not merely free from debt, 
but with an easily collected revenue of more than thirty-one millions of livres beyond what had been with difficulty wrung from the people at the death of mazarin Lyon had restored the navy which mazarin had permitted to rot away in sixteen sixty one the royal dockyards had contained eighteen weather-worn vessels scantily armed and manned in sixteen sixty seven france possessed a fleet of one hundred and ten well-built and amply equipped ships carrying three thousand seven hundred and thirty guns and manned by twenty one thousand nine hundred and fifteen men exclusive of officers the army was superb no fewer than one hundred and fifty thousand men officered by the veterans of the fronde were in constant drill field practice and garrison duty the utmost attention was given by the war minister louvois to raising the infantry hitherto the weakest arm to the standard of the unequalled cavalry and every inducement had been offered the noblesse to join its ranks in the provinces near the spanish low countries louis had amassed fifty thousand of his best troops while the whole country was covered with camps and arsenals the best means he says himself i thought of doing something of importance was to surprise my enemies by my diligence and by entering their country in arms before they could be ready to resist me i therefore got everything ready much sooner than was customary i collected everywhere corn meal fodder powder bullets guns and everything the lack of which might have delayed the march of my army but particularly i kept carefully exercising the troops immediately about my person in order that from my example the other leaders might learn to take the same care of those of whom they had the command a strong contrast to this energy was afforded by his enemies in spite of urgent warnings from the governors of the spanish low countries and franche comte the court of madrid sunk in lethargy made no preparations at the moment when the troops selected to accompany louis on his march were passing before him in review the spanish ministers were congratulating themselves on his deceptive assurances of peace a few days later their eyes were opened by receiving from him in a lengthy volume entitled the livre des droits a statement of his immediate claim on the spanish low countries and the suggestion of the future claim to the whole monarchy its arguments which were answered by lisola austrian ambassador at london and the hague in le bouclier d'etat et de justice were thus summed up france claims the spanish low countries by the right of marriage spain owns them in right of blood the provinces themselves owe allegiance in virtue of their customs the queen of france is wife of the first sister of the second and sovereign of the third a few days later louis forwarded this statement to the various courts of europe he presented his enterprise not as a war war indeed was not declared but as a mere entering into possession of his wife's inheritance he was going he said to travel in the spanish low countries there was no further delay on may twenty fourth sixteen sixty seven louis and turenne crossed the frontier castel rodrigo with a total force of twenty thousand men scattered in garrisons in towns whose fortifications were out of repair could make no resistance Binch was taken on the thirty first charleroi on june second by the eighteenth at tournay douay courtrai audenarde were in french hands in less than two months the whole south of the spanish low countries was at louis's feet number three treaty of eventual partition of the spanish monarchy with leopold spain could not dream of effective resistance to louis her only hope was from outside she speedily found that from england nothing was to be expected though she was still ignorant of charles's secret engagement with louis taking advantage however of the revolution in portugal of november sixteen sixty seven which had overthrown don pedro and placed his brother alfonso on the throne and which had thus rendered the alliance with louis of no effect she made a peace with that country recognizing her at length as an independent kingdom she then turned to leopold 
the Spanish Low Countries forming part of the Circle of Burgundy, one of the ten circles into which for certain administrative and financial purposes the empire was divided, was as such nominally under the protection of the empire, and Spain claimed a fulfillment of this duty. But at the Peace of Westphalia the empire had agreed to give no assistance to Spain during her war with France, and in 1658 Leopold had renewed the engagement on his own account. Louis now took every step in his power to secure the continued fulfilment of these promises. His ambassador at Vienna, de Gramonville, perhaps the ablest of his diplomatists, had the charge of managing the emperor. He so completely succeeded in his task that even when Turenne had captured Lille, August 27, 1667, hitherto deemed impregnable, and had routed the Spanish force sent against him, and when Leopold in consternation had yielded to the pressure from Madrid and ordered large levies of troops, by taking the high hand he actually compelled the emperor to countermand his own orders. Not a man was enlisted, and Louis, thus freed from anxiety, was able at the end of September to put his army into winter quarters and return from his victorious progress to his capital. With the Diet of Ratisbonne, Louis was equally successful. Publicly, he assured the princes that he would hold his conquests in the Spanish Low Countries on the same terms relative to them and to the emperor as those upon which Spain had held them. Privately, he appealed to individual members by profuse bribery, and he fomented the divisions which already existed among them. In October 1667, the Diet resolved to confine its action to mediation and to let the claim to protection of the circle lapse. In one respect only, Louis failed. He was unable to secure another term of three years' continuance of the Rhine League. With the two great Protestant powers of the North, Brandenburg and Sweden, he dealt separately. Firm allies of France, as their jealousy of the emperor had made them, they began now to be alarmed rather at the prospect of an indefinite extension of French influence, and their anxiety was increased by the endeavors of Louis to secure the Polish succession, likely soon to become vacant by the abdication of John Casimir for a prince of the French blood. Louis, to whom Poland was merely one of the counters with which he played the game, at once changed his tone. To secure the cooperation of Brandenburg, he not only withdrew his own claim, but promised to support the election of the Grand Elector's relative, the Duke of Neuburg. Won by this promise, by a generous subsidy, and by the engagement of Louis to be moderate in his claims in the Spanish Low Countries, and persuaded by their ministers who, down to the secretaries who wrote the draft, had their pockets filled with French gold, both the Grand Elector and the Duke agreed to preserve a strict neutrality and to refuse a passage to the Emperor's troops. Sweden was treated with less ceremony. By the force of plain threats, she also was induced to remain neutral. The arrogant spirit of the French is shown by Lyon's boast that in case France had any trouble from her, she should be speedily sent back into her forests. Louis had thus taken all indirect precautions against Leopold intervening in the struggle. He now made use of arguments still more convincing. Without feint or reticence, he laid before the emperor a project which, by its straightforward appeal to his selfishness, might induce him to break through those family and dynastic interests which at present prevented his cordial alliance with an enemy of Spain. This was no less than a scheme of the partition of the whole Spanish monarchy between Louis and himself, should Charles II of Spain die childless. Already in the beginning of 1667 the idea had been mentioned tentatively, and the negotiations were resumed with the utmost secrecy in October. So well was that secrecy maintained that not until a few years ago was the existence of this intrigue and of the treaty which resulted from it known to the world. Between the first and second attempts, Louis had ascertained the conditions upon which the Dutch would support him in coming to terms with Spain. They agreed that Louis should hold Franche-Comte, Cambrai, and the Cambrai-Sea 
Douay with the fort of Scarpe, Air, Saint Omer, Furne, and Berg with their dépendances or districts, and that Charlois should be dismantled, or as an alternative that he should retain what he had already conquered. Louis now placed these conditions before Leopold, along with the enticing project of partition, by flattery of the emperor and his ministers by first proposing exorbitant terms and then as great concessions withdrawing those which had no importance for france by every device indeed known to diplomacy even to downright lying de remonville at length brought about an agreement if spain should refuse to make peace with france on the suggested conditions the emperor would not help her provided louis did not push his conquests further in no case would france or austria attack each other in their own dominions the eventual division of the spanish monarchy was thus regulated the emperor was to have spain itself except navarre and rosas the west indies milan and the right of investiture to the duchy of siena and all the spanish ports on the sea of tuscany up to the frontiers of naples while louis was to take the low countries and franche comte the eastern philippines navarre and rosas all spanish possessions in africa with naples and sicily except as before arranged each power was to help the other to overcome resistance on the part of its new subjects local rights were to be disregarded the agreement was not to lapse until any child that might be born to charles was six months old and the treaties of westphalia and the pyrenees were meanwhile to remain in full force End of section 16. Section 17 of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 13. The Fall of Clarendon. While Louis the Fourteenth absolute ruler of a great kingdom was thus giving the law to europe charles the second of england was every day realizing more clearly how narrow were the limits of his own freedom his parliament had been showing itself imbued with precisely the same views as the long parliament of his father except that whereas that had been puritan this was anglican its enemies were the same popery military force and an uncontrolled use of the purse by the crown upon all three points the action of charles had excited bitter suspicion and discontent it was through that suspicion and discontent aided by many collateral causes and most of all by the base desertion of the king a desertion less notorious than his father's desertion of strafford only because the circumstances were less tragic and the personages less grandiose that clarendon was now struck down the leading causes of his fall are easily discernible though from the many purely personal questions which were involved it is impossible to give to each its just value in sixteen sixty two he had risked the king's favour by opposing the declaration of indulgence in sixteen sixty three his personal enemy the catholic earl of bristol made an ill-advised attempt to secure his impeachment for high treason but the charges were utterly frivolous charles gave no countenance to the proceeding bristol as the king prophesied only burnt his wings and clarendon remained the stronger for the attack he was however surrounded by enemies lady castlemaine the most vulgar and abandoned of the women who governed charles hated him with the hatred of disappointed vanity and avarice not only had clarendon steadfastly declined to court her favour he would not even permit his wife to visit her but he had frequently refused to pass grants for her from the king it was at her house that those nightly meetings were held at which a knot of young political adventurers to whose rise the all-absorbing power of the chancellor was an obstacle met to plan his overthrow ashley lauderdale william coventry and henry bennett better known as the earl of arlington whom clarendon had himself introduced to public life and who was now secretary of state in the place of nicholas had each his reasons for wishing his fall the disappointed cavaliers 
owed him a deep grudge for the indemnity bill in the bill of sales the catholics saw in him the representative of anglicanism the presbyterians and other dissenting sects laid their persecution at his door he was disliked by the courtiers for the reproach which the decency of his private life cast upon their excesses his daughter's marriage with the presumptive heir to the throne roused the jealousy of the nobility while the arrogance of his demeanour and his display of wealth alienated the citizens of london it was not least to his disadvantage that the gravity of his deportment lent itself to buckingham's ready wit and mimicry the bishops alone were his steadfast friends it was not until sixteen sixty six that grave political events placed him in direct antagonism to the parliament the incessant drain of money for the expenses at once of the dutch war and of the king's pleasures was gradually exasperating the commons they had with enthusiasm voted an enormous supply in sixteen sixty four and had followed this in sixteen sixty five with another of half the amount even then charles had been compelled to accept a proviso suggested by suspicion of waste that the money should be applied strictly to the war as in the parliament of charles i the doctrine had been established that taxation could not be raised without the consent of parliament so now was established the equally important doctrine that neither could it be spent without that consent clarendon's view of the constitution despite the lessons of the last twenty years was precisely the same as it had been when he served charles i the king was to work in combination with his parliament but he was not to allow the house of commons to force its will upon the house of lords still less was he to allow both houses combined to compel him to give the royal assent to bills of which his conscience disapproved he now incurred the displeasure of both the king and the commons by vehemently inveighing against this proviso as derogatory to the crown when however in september sixteen sixty six charles demanded yet another supply the country gentlemen upon whom the weight of taxation chiefly rested and who were scandalized at the excesses of the court in which they did not participate determined while offering a sum of one million eight hundred thousand pounds to frame further safeguards avoiding a direct attack upon the king they declared their belief that he had been cheated by the officials and demanded a public inspection of accounts they appointed a committee to examine all persons who could give information on the subject and they introduced a bill to nominate parliamentary commissioners to investigate expenditure and punish defaulters charles anxious only for the money did not oppose the action of the commons clarendon however again stood between them and their desires he declared that they had exceeded their proper functions and that this was a new encroachment as had no bottom an unconstitutional expansion of their privileges and that the scars were yet too fresh and green of those wounds which had been inflicted upon the kingdom from such usurpations he openly expressed his determination to oppose the bill to the utmost of his power when it came before the lords and he urged charles to refuse his sanction even if the lords permitted it to pass the further progress of the measure was stayed by a prorogation and before the next session clarendon had fallen the bill of the commons was then passed commissioners were appointed who were members of neither house and by their investigation shameful disorganization and peculation on a gigantic scale were brought to light but clarendon had taken a step which brought him still more directly into conflict with parliament he saw that the government and the commons were in constant antagonism he therefore pressed the king to have recourse to a dissolution the constitutional method of getting rid of such a difficulty his advice was not followed for charles felt that the present house contained a far greater number of his personal adherents and of the court officials than were ever likely to find seats again and the bishops represented the danger of the possible election of many presbyterians 
The mere proposal, however, further increased the excitement against Clarendon. Greater still was the jealousy caused in all classes by another suggestion, perhaps the only one for which Clarendon can be justly blamed. How far Charles was at the time endeavouring to realise his long-cherished desire of creating a standing army is doubtful. It is, however, certain that on the pretence of guarding the coasts after the Chatham disaster, troops were now raised without any reference to Parliament. They were collected and equipped by some of the great nobility at their own cost, but their maintenance had to be provided for, and the exchequer was empty. Though Parliament stood prorogued, Charles determined to summon it at once. This resolve was opposed by Clarendon, on the formal ground that it was unconstitutional to summon a prorogued Parliament before the day named for its meeting, and to get over the difficulty he suggested that without waiting for parliamentary sanction, royal letters should be sent to the Lord Lieutenants and Deputy Lieutenants of the counties in which the troops were raised, authorizing them to call in provisions, while the other counties should pay a proportionate subscription. That he honestly believed this to be within the lines of the Constitution is clear, and nothing could more strongly prove how ignorant he was of the effect upon the English mind of Cromwell's government by standing armies. The effect was immediate. At the meeting of Parliament in July 1667, the Commons unanimously voted an address praying the King to disband the newly raised troops. His reply was to rally them on their suspicion that he should dream of wishing for a standing army, and once more, for reasons which are very obscure, to prorogue them. This prorogation, too, was laid to Clarendon's advice. It became certain that whenever Parliament should reassemble, Clarendon would be impeached. Among the bishops alone could he look for support. Charles himself, while treating him with personal kindness, displayed the cool ingratitude of his race to the man to whom he largely owed his peaceful and triumphant restoration. He had indeed many causes of irritation against Clarendon. The Chancellor had opposed his wish for toleration, had not spared the most outspoken remonstrances upon the idle debauchery of his life, and had thwarted him in at least one disgraceful intrigue. He was tired of hearing on every side that so long as his minister was in power he was but half a king. Finally, and this was with Charles throughout his life the most potent argument, it was easier, in the presence of popular clamour, to abandon than to support him. Just as in later years, when consenting to the judicial murder of Archbishop Plunkett, Charles was not ashamed to exclaim, I cannot save him because I dare not. So now he was heard to say, My own condition is such that I cannot dispute with them. On August 30th, 1667, after a vain endeavour to induce Clarendon to resign, he sent him, ill as he was at the time, and mourning the death of his wife, orders to deliver up the great seal. He was rewarded by receiving the assurance of May, Lady Castlemaine's secretary, that he was now king, which he had never been before. Personal dislike, unscrupulous attack, the virtues far more than the weaknesses of his private character, the disasters of the nation, the odium for which fell, as always, upon the most prominent figure in the kingdom, and the ingratitude of Charles, had all much to do with Clarendon's disgrace. But the main cause is to be sought in the inherent weakness of his political theory. He did not instinctively feel, and therefore could not guide, as Pym had guided, and Shaftesbury was to some extent to guide, the desires of his generation. He was purely a constitutional lawyer with views of the Constitution which he thought beyond argument or improvement. His sole guide was the law as he understood it. He had opposed Laud and the Star Chamber because they were above the law, and he had opposed parliaments when they acted against the law. He endeavoured to secure a clause in an act of parliament to grant the king a dispensing power, but he objected to the king's use of that power without parliamentary sanction as an illegal extension of the prerogative, just as he objected to the claim for appropriation of supplies and the inspection of accounts 
as an illegal extension of parliamentary privilege. These essentially negative views had not stood in the way, had rather been advantageous at the Restoration itself. They had indeed then taken a positive aspect, for Clarendon's business was to restore the old parliamentary monarchy in strict connection with the old Anglican Church, to come back to the broad lines of a constitution which he loved. For such a task, his firmness, integrity, knowledge of constitutional law, and love of business fitted him beyond any man of his time. But that task, once finished, the weakness of a position based upon negations showed itself. He had neither the keenness to discern a coming change nor the elasticity of mind to adapt himself to it when it came. Had he been able to place himself at the head of the current popular opinion, he might have died Prime Minister of England, for his usefulness was incontestable. As it was, he stood in its way and was swept aside to make room for more supple men. It is possible that Charles had hoped that by his action he might save his old servant from further attack, but he had misunderstood the temper of Parliament. Everything that had gone wrong during Clarendon's administration was laid to his initiative, the sale of Dunkirk, the entering upon the Dutch War, the disaster at Chatham, the waste of public money. When the Commons met on October 10, 1667, they at once voted an impeachment. It was as extravagant as might have been expected. Of all the articles, one only, that in which he was accused of promoting a standing army, the dissolution of Parliament, and the supporting troops upon forced contributions, had even plausibility. Conscious of the weakness of their case, they applied but in vain to the lords to commit clarendon on a general charge of treason clarendon hesitated long what course to pursue hearing however that charles had wondered why he did not withdraw himself he determined to take the hint which indeed soon became a positive command and on november twenty ninth he fled to france leaving parliament to the barren vengeance of passing an act banishing him forever to which Charles was forced to consent. End of section 17. Section 18 of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 14 the triple alliance and peace of aix la chapelle number one various projects of charles underlying the other causes of the parliamentary attack upon clarendon had been the conviction that he was directing english policy in the french interest it was this jealousy of the french power the jealousy of the nation as distinct from the king which now led to the formation of a great european coalition against louis the project of a close alliance between England and the Republic had been discussed even before the close of the late war. It first took shape in the mind of Sir William Temple, an intimate friend of de Witt and the most cultured of English diplomatists. He had fretted under the success of Louis in fostering a war whereby the two great naval and Protestant powers destroyed one another's strength, and he longed to repay him in kind. De Witt had listened to his proposals readily. The sole object of the Grand Pensionary was to stay the approach of France toward the Dutch frontier, and he had tried in vain to induce Louis to pledge himself to hold his hand. He had, too, reason to hope that Sweden, sore at Lyon's arrogance, would throw in her lot with that of the two other Protestant powers. His agent in London was therefore directed to work upon the fears of Charles, by declaring that if England did not join the Republic, the Dutch would be driven to a close alliance with Louis, and upon his pride, by putting before him the headship of a great Protestant coalition. At the same time, he tried to bring Louis to terms, by letting him know that on the one hand he was treating directly with Castel Rodrigo, and on the other had good hopes of a league with Austria, Sweden, and England. The implied threat 
drew from Louis nothing but a curt and angry reply. The focus of diplomatic intrigue was now transferred to London. Ruvigny, the French ambassador, a personal friend of Clarendon, was dispatched to England in the utmost haste, well furnished with funds to enforce his arguments, and with instructions to renew to Charles himself the promise of French help against his own subjects. Before, however, he reached London, Clarendon had fallen, and he had to deal with Buckingham and Arlington, between whom the power which the Chancellor had left behind was now divided. He was received with perfect frankness. Charles expressed the warmest personal regard for Louis, but declared that Parliament would never consent to an alliance with France, and among all whom Ruvigny approached, he found the conviction that England would not stand idle while France was taking the whole of the Spanish Low Countries. Louis, on receiving Ruvigny's report, showed the liveliest anxiety. To soothe the parliamentary opposition, rendered keener by the news that Clarendon had landed in France, he forbade the fallen minister to come to Paris. He instructed Ruvigny to press upon Charles the shame of being a slave to his parliament and the prospect of avenging the insult at Chatham. Concealing the fact that he was at the moment in active negotiations with de Witt, Charles replied by hinting at generous offers from Spain. A large supply of ready money, a part of the French conquests in the Spanish Low Countries, and important commercial advantages might, however, move him. Louis at once, October 1667, instructed Ruvigny to promise the money demanded, increased facilities for trade with France and the Spanish Low Countries, and French aid in ships and money to conquer the Spanish possessions in the West Indies. The question of places in the Spanish Low Countries was, however, waived. The diplomatic contest between France and the Republic was accentuated by the personal rivalry of Buckingham and Arlington. The former, a vain man devoid alike of principle and political insight, was wholly in the French interest. He hoped to receive the command of an English contingent in the service of Louis. Arlington, equally vain and unscrupulous, had succeeded to the principal direction of foreign affairs by his evident capacity for business and coolness of judgment. He may indeed be regarded almost as a statesman of the first rank. It was greatly in his favor that he was the only one of Charles's ministers, with a knowledge of European languages sufficient to enable him to converse easily with foreign ambassadors. He perfectly understood the temper of the English people, and having married a lady from Holland, was inclined to the Dutch rather than the French connection. The opportunity now offered him of thwarting Buckingham tended in the same direction. While therefore engaged in apparent concert with the latter, in preliminaries with Ruvigny, which he had no intention of seriously pursuing, he at the same moment busied himself with Charles's sanction, but without Buckingham's knowledge, in direct and serious negotiations with de Witt. In pursuance of this policy, terms were placed before Louis in December of a nature likely to ensure their rejection. Louis in return sent the draft of a treaty equally distasteful to the English government. Charles hereupon asserted that England was so exhausted by the late war that repose was absolutely necessary, and that he was therefore determined upon a course of strict neutrality. Louis was compelled to hide his irritation at this, the first serious check to his diplomatic success, by proclaiming that such neutrality was really more to his interest than war, inasmuch as the Dutch, no longer fearing the union of England and France, would lay aside much of their jealousy with respect to his movements. Privately, however, he expressed profound disappointment. It is a lively illustration of the political morality of the time that simultaneously with these negotiations, Charles was offering to Spain, too, his act of alliance. His terms were, as always, ready money and commercial expansion. He demanded a heavy subsidy, permission to send a fixed number of ships for unrestricted trade to Buenos Aires and the Philippines, privileges in Antwerp, which was again to become the rival of Amsterdam, and through the exercise of Spanish influence, free trade with the Hansa towns. 
both the poverty and the pride of Spain stood in the way of the acceptance of such terms. Number two, the Triple Alliance. Nothing, therefore, now remained, if England was to take action at all, but the acceptance of the union with the Republic proposed by de Witt to compel Louis to bind himself to one or other of his alternatives, and to this, under Arlington's influence, Charles now found decisive reasons for turning. Most of all, the hope that such an alliance might put to rest the increasing clamor of Parliament was an argument which influenced a king who habitually acted along the line of least resistance. Early in January 1668, Temple was sent off in haste to The Hague. Two difficulties threatened to retard the conclusion of the alliance. De Witt had dealt a severe blow to the Orange faction, and had offended Charles by obtaining the perpetual separation of the Stadtholdership from the command of the land and sea forces. To this he wished for Charles's acquiescence, and he now secured this acquiescence by affecting to hang back from the treaty on which the king was for the moment bent. The other difficulty was that, while haste and secrecy were of the last necessity, the peculiar constitution of the Dutch government, which required the sanction of all treaties by the provincial estates, rendered haste and secrecy impossible. It happened, however, that during the late war the provincial estates had for urgency delegated their power to a commission of eight members which was still undissolved. To this body the business was referred, and upon their agreement the treaty was at once ratified by the states general. Temple thus completely outwitted Destrade, the French ambassador at The Hague, who reported to Lyon that some arrangement was in the wind, but that it would be easy to secure its defeat when brought, as the Constitution demanded, before the provincial estates. On January 13, 1668, Temple succeeded in concluding three separate treaties, by the first each power was bound to assist the other if attacked in Europe, with forty ships of the line, six thousand infantry, and four hundred cavalry. By the second they were to endeavor to restore peace between France and Spain on the basis of the alternatives, to obtain from Louis a secession of arms until the end of May, to guarantee the cession by Spain of the places to which he would become entitled, and finally to induce him, under this guarantee, to renounce further conquests in the Spanish Low Countries, even if force should be found necessary to compel Spain to observe the agreement. In these two treaties all sign of menace to Louis had been sedulously avoided. The third, which was strictly secret, was of a different character. It provided that whichever of the parties refused to consent to the alternatives, force should be used to compel her to accept peace. If France were recalcitrant, the war upon her should not cease until she had been reduced to the limits imposed by the Peace of the Pyrenees. No protest was made against the future claim of Louis to the Spanish monarchy, and it was doubtless hoped that since the conditions of peace were those proposed by Louis himself, the secret article would never be called into play. To this treaty Sweden gave her adhesion in April, conditionally upon obtaining from Spain the payments to which she laid claim. Such, however, was the poverty of Spain that she was unable to find the money, and the difficulty was got over only by England and the Republic guaranteeing the payment at a future time. The signature of Sweden was affixed on May 15th. The treaty has thus become known as the Triple Alliance. Important as the Triple Alliance was, both in its immediate effects and as the first formal expression of European resistance to the aggressions of Louis, it was, so far as Charles was concerned, a piece of gross political knavery. His hopes were in reality steadily fixed on France, and on the day after the treaty was signed, he wrote both to his sister Henrietta, who was in the confidence of Louis, and to Louis himself, to explain his action as forced upon him by his subjects. He had, too, the special meanness to declare that it was the Dutch, and not he, who had proposed and pressed the matter forward. By the secret treaty he had cleverly and fatally compromised the Dutch, in the eyes of Louis, 
and had thus secured their isolation if ever he should himself desire to attack them again number three peace of aix la chapelle in the face of this coalition louis might well pause in his career the peace which portugal had made with spain naturally tended in the same direction since it set free to fight in the spanish netherlands whatever forces spain still possessed the three events the partition treaty the triple alliance and the peace of portugal with spain now brought about a short period of repose for europe but louis had meanwhile had time to strike another blow on the mediation of the pope he had in september sixteen sixty seven granted a truce of three months at its conclusion in january sixteen sixty eight the diet asked for a further period of three months during which terms might be arranged but louis while consenting to keep open the negotiations refused a suspension of arms the confidence of castel rodrigo who declared that nature herself would enforce a suspension incited him to an unexpected enterprise winter campaigns had been till then almost unknown in european warfare but louis broke through the general practice he determined to overrun franche comte which lay temptingly open to attack his preparations were rapidly made a corps of fifteen thousand men were placed under the command of conde on the second after sending notice of his intention to all the european powers he left st germain in a fortnight all was over the spaniards could oppose only twelve thousand disorganized troops to conde's corps d'élite and by the nineteenth before europe had recovered from her surprise the only places capable of offering resistance were in louis's hands he now received from the english and dutch envoys the formal announcement of the triple alliance their communication was couched in terms of studied compliment the whole stress being laid upon the intended compulsion of spain in accordance with the treaty they asked for a suspension of arms until the end of may sixteen sixty eight to this louis replied that spain by making peace with portugal showed her intention of continuing the war and that to grant the suspension demanded would merely give her three months in which to strengthen herself while he with one hundred thousand men ready to march had to stand by with folded arms to show his anxiety to satisfy europe however he would hold his hand until may sixteenth upon an undertaking that the ratifications of the treaty with spain on the basis of the alternatives were exchanged by that date and would even give back to spain all he might have taken since march thirty first the date he had originally offered for the conclusion of an arrangement this decision was arrived at only after long consideration in the unprepared condition of the other powers no less than in his own readiness for attack in the advice of conde and turenne and in the feeling of paris where the warlike spirit was so strong that it was a mortal sin even to mention peace louis had every temptation to immediate war moreover he had through the treachery of charles learned with excessive indignation of the secret provisions of the triple alliance other considerations however prevailed the necessity of garrisoning any towns he might capture would enfeeble his army while a general european coalition would probably at once follow any further attack war would but consolidate the triple alliance which was sure before long if he were moderate to fall asunder by its own weight franche comte could be rendered powerless before he gave it up and the towns which he already possessed in the spanish low countries would place the rest at his mercy when a more favourable moment should arrive he therefore on april fifteenth sixteen sixty eight agreed to the following terms up to may thirty first he would accept whichever of the alternatives spain might choose during the next two months he should raise his terms to the first alternative he should add the possession of luxembourg or lille and tournay to the second that of franche comte cambrai and the cambrai should nothing have been settled by the end of july the whole question would be open to revision england and the republic bound themselves meanwhile to attack spain after may thirty first should she refuse to concur reserving for their action the northeastern while he dealt with the southwestern portion of the still unoccupied part of the spanish low countries without resources or prospects of efficient help 
Castel Rodrigo at length gave way, though the pride, dilatoriness, and formality of the court of Madrid so effectually seconded his reluctance that it was not until May 29th that the treaty was finally concluded. Looking more to a future war with France than to the present peace, he decided to accept the second alternative, since the first, which included the French possession of Franche Comte, would have closed all communication between the Spanish Low Countries, the Empire, and Lorraine. The Dutch, too, he felt, would by this choice be alarmed at the proximity of France, and would be more interested in the continued defence of the rest of the Spanish Low Countries. The advantages gained by Louis were immense victory had as it were been given him by compulsion and he appeared before europe as the apostle of moderation confronted by a formidable alliance he had himself laid down the conditions of peace and those conditions contained not one word to hamper his action in that which especially caused the fears of europe the prosecution of his claim to the spanish monarchy the fortresses of charleroi binch at douay with Scarpe, Tournay, Audenarde, Lille, Armentières, Courtrai, Berg, and Furne, with their districts, which were now secured to him by treaty, constituted a veritable frontière de fer, the impregnable northeastern frontier of France for which Henry the Fourth, Richelieu, and Mazarin had all striven. Paris was now the real centre of the country and the way for the next step to European supremacy was open and easy. End of section 18section 19 of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 15 complete failure of charles's attempts at toleration after the fall of clarendon sixteen sixty seven to sixteen seventy one number one toleration during the recess of parliament the fall of clarendon constituted a definite point of departure in the history of the reign of charles the second for it removed one obstacle to the fulfilment of his purpose of resting his power upon the goodwill and gratitude of dissent buckingham and arlington were naturally ready to espouse a policy opposed to that of clarendon but their private inclinations also led them toward toleration buckingham as the husband of fairfax's daughter and the patron of protestant discontent arlington as a sympathizer with the catholics even if he were not one himself as long as the recess lasted they had their way the penal statutes were ignored the prisons set open and the meeting-houses again thronged the presbyterians received ostentatious favour while many old commonwealth men again appeared in public a conference was held in which orlando bridgman who as lord keeper of the seals had succeeded clarendon lord chief justice hale and some of the purest characters of both the church and the dissenting bodies took part and a bill was drafted whereby upon some alterations of ceremonies and the form of ordination the presbyterians were to re-enter the church while the other sects whose principles forbade association with the state establishment were to have three years full indulgence it was confidently hoped that parliament rendered tractable by the triple alliance would give their consent to this proposal this hope soon proved groundless the commons had indeed overthrown clarendon because he had resisted their encroachments on the prerogative and was thought to favour france not because he had opposed toleration upon this question they had always been more clarendonian than clarendon himself and it was now found that their views were but strengthened by their late successes number two persecution during the session the intentions of the king had already leaked out and the commons met february tenth sixteen sixty eight in a state of excessive irritation to consider the speech from the throne the usual demand for money occupied the first place then followed a request that they would seriously think of some course to beget a better union and composure 
in the minds of my Protestant subjects in matters of religion. All mention of Catholics was carefully avoided. The reply of the Commons struck the prevailing note of distrust. A subsidy of three hundred thousand pounds was indeed voted, but with a demand for definite application. A searching inquiry was instituted into the mismanagement of the Dutch war, and especially into the Chatham disgrace. They next sought to restore the abandoned safeguards to the Triennial Bill by entrusting the Chancellor with the duty of issuing writs should the King fail to do so within three years of a dissolution. But the dislike to stultify themselves so soon, the indecency of pushing the King so hard, and the fact that in Sweden, the only other country then under parliamentary government, writs were issued by officials only during a minority, furnished arguments to the court party, and a technical irregularity in the introduction of the bill was made an excuse for waiving the question. Language of unusual boldness was however heard in the debate, and phrases such as, compelling the king by law, were significant of the rising anger and distrust. On the main issue, there was among the vast majority no hesitation. Charles was at once petitioned to proclaim the suppression of all unlawful assemblies, whether papist or protestant. He well knew that upon his answer depended a continuance of the supplies which his extravagance rendered necessary. The short-lived hopes of the dissenters came to an end. The desires of the king, the influence of Buckingham and Arlington, and the wishes of the best men of both parties were alike powerless before the angry determination of the commons. On March 11th, they settled down to the consideration of the last part of the king's speech. The minority spoke with boldness and force. They urged that, if a man finds not his account in the government he lives under, he will never labor to support it and they represented vividly the evils which the persecuting acts were causing to trade. The dread of a standing army was appealed to on both sides. It was alternately declared that toleration with its consequent anarchy and repression with its consequent discontent would alike demand the maintenance of a military force. The violent churchmen used the old language. The Presbyterians had, it was true, brought about the restoration, and were supporters of monarchy, and yet their tenets were destructive of proper government. The king, but minister honorum, greater than any one man, but less than the people. Salus populi suprema lex. They must not be allowed a footing, lest they destroy the whole. The charge that, though by profession men of mercy, churchmen carried things with excessive severity, was met by the question, must a father yield authority to his son? Leave was at length given to introduce a bill to continue the conventicle acts. On April 8th, the proposal that the king should be asked to hold a conference of divines was fully debated. It was argued that severity did but make dissent respectable, that the justices refused to convict because the wife and children of the offender became chargeable on the parish, and that it was dangerous to make laws too big to be executed. Waller likened the church to an elder brother among the Turks who strangles his brethren lest they should threaten the succession, and he bade the house take notice that Empson and Dudley were hanged, not for extortion, but for pressing the penal laws. The tolerationists had the speaking to themselves, but the majority had the votes, and the proposal was rejected by 176 to 70. Three weeks later, on the bill for continuing the conventicle acts, the advocates of severity had their way. In vain, they were urged to make the fire in the chimney and not in the middle of the room, and warned against making it so hot that it would burn both the victims and their executioners. The prevailing sentiment was probably interpreted by a speaker who declared, that if the Catholics did not come under this bill, he should ask leave to bring the one to tolerate popery. The bill was carried by 144 to 73. For a while the attention of the House was distracted by a famous controversy with the Lords, 
embittered by the jealousy aroused by their frequent and serious assumptions and extension of power since the restoration a merchant named skinner who complained that the east india company had seized his ship and cargo and assaulted himself laid his cause before the privy council instead of first appealing to the law courts the privy council referred the matter to the lords and the lords awarded him heavy damages the company thereupon appealed to the commons who at once denied the legality of an original appeal to the lords in a case with which the ordinary courts were competent to deal declared the action of the lords to be a breach of privilege and ordered skinner into custody they passed to a vote that anybody who assisted in carrying out the order of the lords should be deemed a betrayer of the liberties of the commons of england and an infringer of the privileges of the house the lords thereupon committed to prison sir samuel barnard diston chairman of the company and a member of the commons and fined him five hundred pounds so violent was the quarrel and so complete the deadlock that the opportunity was a good one for seeing whether if time were given for passions to cool the commons might not at the same time be induced to waive their opposition to toleration charles therefore on may eighth sixteen sixty eight ordered the house to adjourn itself and afterwards by successive adjournments put off its meeting until october nineteenth sixteen sixty nine during this long interval the question of a dissolution was again earnestly discussed not only were both buckingham and arlington anxious to avoid parliamentary attack but they were confident of the full support of the dissenters for a new election since their condition had again been ameliorated as soon as parliament had been adjourned the more pronounced sectarians had been secured by buckingham and had offered a large contribution toward the king's expenses in return for the indulgence he promised charles had himself received a presbyterian deputation and declared he still hoped to see their body before long within the national church it is probable that a dissolution would have secured his objects but the old fears again prevailed monk who still possessed great influence urged that a parliament composed largely of the oppressed would seek for vengeance on their oppressors and exclaimed that rather than wait for that day he would leave england charles determined once more to face his old parliament the meeting of which could not indeed be longer delayed during the recess a spasmodic attempt had been made to bring the expenditure within the revenue secured to the king for life but economy was an exotic at court and money was again absolutely necessary the houses met on october nineteenth sixteen sixty nine had charles been careful to maintain at least a moderate execution of the penal laws it is possible that the commons might at their coming together have accepted some indulgence for protestant dissent as it was they assembled possessed more than ever with the doctrines that catholicism was their arch enemy and that an overwhelming and exclusive anglican ascendancy was the only means whereby to fight this enemy sheldon had collected ex parte information as to the character of the conventicles and even before the meeting of parliament had carried it to charles and forced him to issue a fresh proclamation to enforce the laws the session began with a strict examination into the public accounts the king was then thanked for his recent proclamation the commons next appointed a committee to inquire into the holding of conventicles in london which had aroused a blind dread of the return to a commonwealth regime the committee reported that such meetings were an affront to government and an imminent danger to parliament and the general peace monk was deputed to suppress them and it is noteworthy that this suppression had now become a matter of pure police the meetings were to be put down as politically dangerous religion was not named the house then returned to the skinner dispute justified the unrestricted right of petitioning the commons which the lords had called in question and again declared the action of the upper house in claiming original jurisdiction subversive of the rights both of themselves and of the subject they asserted further that should the lords at any time give a decision contrary to law the subject had a right to appeal to the commons the dispute was never settled 
but the claim of the lords to original jurisdiction was allowed to lapse and has never been reasserted somewhat later the commons practically defeated the lords upon another question of great constitutional importance their claim to make alterations in money bills such a claim had been made and either allowed or contested many times without a final decision being arrived at at length in april sixteen seventy one the lords reduced the amount of an imposition on sugar and this led to a resolution of the lower house to the effect that in all aids given to the king by the commons the rate of tax ought not to be altered by the lords the exclusive title of the commons to the giving aids the only poor thing the commons can value themselves upon to their prince or in other words the only real hold they have upon the crown was in the words of the attorney-general at the conference between the houses so fundamental that i cannot give a reason for it for that would be a weakening of the commons right and privilege which we can never depart from being affirmatively possessed of it in all ages and negatively as to the lords the lords strong in the absence of proof to this effect brought forward many precedents to the contrary the relevancy and import of which was however challenged with great subtlety by the managers for the commons the question came to an end with the session and like that of the judicature has never been formally settled but as with the latter the lords have tacitly given up the point for though they have not acknowledged the privilege of the commons further than as regards the originating of money bills they have on the other hand never seriously questioned their right to the absolute adjustment of all questions of taxation and supply hopeless of gaining his objects charles on december eleventh sixteen sixty nine once more prorogued parliament and thus ended a session which lasting since february tenth sixteen sixty eight had not passed a single act the supply which had been voted him was insufficient for the wide-reaching purposes which it will be seen he had in view and he refused to accept it he was already deep in secret negotiations with louis presently to be related and he had hoped for assistance from parliament large enough to enable him to treat with that monarch on independent terms the jealous parsimony of the commons who refused so much as to take his debts into consideration changed his views he determined to look to france for the money when parliament met for a new session on february fourteenth sixteen seventy an unusual scene was witnessed for the first time in english history the sovereign in opening the proceedings was attended with military pomp it can hardly be doubted that his design was thus to accustom the people to the idea of a standing army he met the houses with confidence begotten by his dealings with louis and addressed them stilo minaci et imperatorio but he had another reason for confidence he had no intention of hampering himself by a continuance of the quarrel on the contrary he was resolved to extract from parliament an unstinted supply which he would use for the objects not distasteful to it he knew the one condition necessary and he cynically determined to offer it himself his speech did not for once contain a word about toleration the commons understood that they might have their swing of persecution they showed their instant recognition of the fact by voting a supply of three hundred thousand pounds a year for eight years the skinner dispute having been got out of the way by his sensible proposal that all the records connected with it should be erased charles left them without demur to settle down to their favourite work so successful was this complete surrender of the policy which he had pursued since his restoration that in the words of andrew marvel the king was never since his coming in nay all things considered no king since the conquest so absolutely powerful at home on march second the bill for suppressing conventicles passed its second reading on the old ground that seditious sectaries under pretense of tender consciences do contrive insurrections at their meetings it consisted of the former act of sixteen sixty four with somewhat slighter penalties for the listeners but with the addition of clauses which rendered it far more severe and thorough in application preachers and teachers were liable to a fine of twenty pounds for the first 
and forty pounds for the second offence constables withholding information were to be fined five pounds and justices of the peace who refused to convict were to pay one hundred pounds for every such refusal informers were further encouraged by the promise of half the fine to protect the arbitrary execution of the law it was decided that if any one appealed against the prosecution and was non-suited he should be mulcted in treble costs while the climax of injustice was reached by the enactment that all clauses shall be construed most largely and beneficially for the suppressing conventicles and for the justification and encouragement of all persons to be employed in the execution thereof no warrant shall be made void for any default in form and if a person fly from one county or corporation to another his goods and chattels shall be seizable wherever they are found this inhuman act did not pass without protest it was argued that men have a kindness for persecuted people ever since henry the eighth and mary the dissenters it was said are like children's tops whip them and they stand upright let them alone and they fall a man that has no preaching near him said colonel birch an old commonwealth man will get it where he can is it reasonable to punish men when they must go four or five miles for a sermon to whip them and not to be able to tell them why you do so is unreasonable they having no churches in many places to go to when waller demanded that the conventicles should have no severer penalties than the papists he laid himself open to the obvious retort that that was just none at all and a reference to louis the fourteenth who had solved the religious difficulty in france by allowing the huguenots set and limited places of worship was not likely to have much weight with an assembly to whom the name of france had become hateful the lords eagerly seconded the commons in passing the bill they attached to it however two provisos the first to insist upon their own immunity from search except by a warrant from the king under his sign manual or in presence of the lord lieutenant the second ran thus provided always that neither this act nor anything therein contained shall extend to invalidate or avoid his majesty's supremacy in ecclesiastical affairs or to destroy any of his majesty's rights powers or prerogatives belonging to the imperial crown of this realm or at any time exercised or enjoyed by himself or any of his majesty's royal predecessors but that his majesty his heirs and successors may from time to time and at all times hereafter exercise and enjoy all such powers and authorities aforesaid as fully and as amply as himself or any of his predecessors have or might have done the same anything in this act or any other law statute or usage to the contrary notwithstanding it was not probable that the commons would pass an amendment under cover of which the dispensing power might have been legally exercised the words in italics were rejected by one hundred and twenty two to sixty eight and the lords wisely refrained from insisting upon their view on april eleventh sixteen seventy charles gave his assent to the bill sheldon hounded on the bishops and so severely was the act executed that a trustworthy witness declared soon afterwards that there was scarcely a conventicle to be heard all over england amid all this senseless cruelty one advance in constitutional liberty deserves to be recorded the quakers were especially obnoxious to the law finding the usual place of meeting in grace church street closed by soldiers the celebrated william penn the most eminent of their body addressed the people in the open street the conventicle act not technically touching this meeting penn and another quaker william meade were indicted at the old bailey on september first sixteen seventy four preaching to an unlawful seditious and riotous assembly which had met together with force and arms the trial which followed is notable in the history of english liberty for the jury for the first time asserted the right of juries to decide in opposition to the ruling of the court they brought in a verdict declaring penn and meade guilty of speaking in grace church street but refused to add to an unlawful assembly then as the pressure from the bench increased and as they were sent back time after time without food light fire or tobacco they first acquitted meade 
while returning their original verdict against Penn, and then, when that verdict was not admitted, gave in their final answer, not guilty, for both. The recorder of London fined the jurymen forty marks each for contumacy, and in default of payment imprisoned them, whereupon they vindicated and established forever the right they had claimed of finding verdicts against the ruling of the bench in an action before the Court of Common Pleas, when the Lord Chief Justice Vaughan declared their imprisonment illegal. Protestant nonconformity being now out of the way, the Commons were at liberty to attack the other wing of the forces hostile to Anglican supremacy. On March 10, 1671, a remarkable petition was forwarded to the King, in which was set forth at length the causes of the increase of popery and the remedies held to be necessary. All popish priests and Jesuits were to be banished, with the exception of those attached by treaty to the Queen's household and to the foreign embassies. The existing laws against popish recusants were to be rigidly enforced. Attendance at the chapels, which by the exceptions mentioned were left unmolested, was to be forbidden to the King's subjects. No civil or military office was for the future to be held by a papist or one justly suspected to be so. All Catholic schools were to be closed and the teachers punished. Plunkett, Catholic primate of Ireland, and Peter Talbot, titular Archbishop of Dublin, were to be arrested and sent to England for trial. To the demands for the banishment of priests and Jesuits, and for the enforcement of the penal laws against popish recusants, Charles yielded at once. Opinion had not, however, yet travelled so far as to force him to grant the rest. Being now secure of a further supply, the payment for this new surrender, Charles immediately prorogued the Parliament, which did not meet again for business until February 4, 1672. Before that time, the great crisis of the reign had been reached. End of section 19. Section 20 of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 16. Preparations of Louis for the Invasion of the United Provinces, Part 1. Number 1. The Treaty of Dover, June 1, 1670. The Triple Alliance had been entered into by Charles against his personal inclinations. No one in his confidence regarded it as more than a temporary expedient, for the disruptive forces were as permanent as those which secured it were fleeting. The king's antipathy to the Dutch was reinforced by desire of avenging the Chatham disgrace. The same informal war of merchants wherever the two countries met in competition for trade as had preluded the late struggle, was being waged, and the old dispute of the flag had been revived. On the very day when London was blazing with bonfires to celebrate the conclusion of peace, Clifford was heard to declare that for all the rejoicing there must soon be another war. That Louis should contentedly accept this rebuff at the hands of the Dutch was still less to be expected. As republicans, as traders, as Protestants, they were the objects of his haughty contempt. As promoters of the Triple Alliance, with its secret articles, they were the objects of his bitter anger. The arrogance of speech, in which they were unwisely indulging their fanfaronade de pêcheurs, an arrogance exhibited especially in the metal in which France was represented as the sun, which Louis had adopted as the symbol of his grandeur, stayed in his course by the republic so rankled in his mind that he never he says entered his council without thinking how to make them pay dearly for the great role they had assumed but before attacking them he set to work to remove from them all possible sources of support to destroy the coalition limb by limb and he began with england it is a mistake to regard Charles in what followed as making a surrender of himself to Louis. He was for the time master of his own game, and he exacted his own terms. The game was not an easy one to play. 
he was to break off an alliance upon which Parliament was most earnestly bent, he was to enter into fellowship with the representative of European aggression and Catholic despotism, and these were precisely what Parliament most dreaded. He had, too, to deal with the divisions in his own council. The frothy egotism of Buckingham was enlisted on the side of France, while Arlington openly expressed the opinion that Louis was pretending to universal monarchy and that his wings must be clipped. The first approaches of Louis, April and May, 1668, were frustrated by Arlington's action. When Rouvigny asked what offers he might place before his master, he insisted that the first proposals should come from France, and in the teeth of Buckingham's influence induced the king to send Temple as ambassador to The Hague, a step which from Temple's well-known sympathies could only mean a determination to maintain the existing alliance. But Louis was not discouraged, for he had received the private assurances of Charles that he would willingly treat as between gentlemen, and that he preferred his word to all the parchment in the world. He now replaced Rouvigny, whose Protestantism unfitted him for the work in hand, by Colbert de Coissy, brother of his great finance minister, with instructions at all cost to secure Arlington. The strictest secrecy was to be observed, but since Charles had broken a previous informal agreement, any fresh understanding must be precise and signed by the commissioners of the two kings. At the outset, he again met with disappointment. Charles frankly told Colbert, August 1668, that he was almost the only man in his dominions in Louis's interest. Arlington declared that trade was the English idol, and any alliance would be judged by that test. Colbert decided that it would be waste of money to offer him the lavish bribe which Louis had suggested. At one point, however, Arlington as well as Buckingham could be reached. The return of Clarendon, then an exile in France, would have meant to them political downfall. Harping skillfully upon this fear, Louis so far succeeded that in February 1669 Arlington himself made advances to Colbert. This change of tone was, however, probably due far more to another event. The Duke of York had lately declared his conversion to Catholicism, and with all a convert's ardor was urging his brother to the same course. Arlington was warmly attached to Catholic views. He had now a good excuse for deserting the Dutch, and ranging himself on the side to which he knew his master inclined. From this moment he became the eager promoter of the treaty. Charles had hitherto sought favor for the Catholics under cover of toleration for Protestant descent. For Protestant descent as such, he had no sympathy, and he threw aside without reluctance that part of his scheme. The other part, however, was always actively present in his mind. The political view of the matter was as strong as the religious. Only under a Catholic constitution, he said, might a king of England hope to become absolute. But an influence of a more personal kind was acting upon the king. If there was one being for whom he felt a genuine affection, it was his sister Henrietta, the wife of Louis's younger brother, the Duke of Orléans. A devoted Catholic, she longed before all things that her brothers might likewise find the true road to salvation. She had succeeded with James. She now succeeded with Charles. On January 25, 1669, the king, in strict secrecy, announced his conversion to Arlington, Clifford, and Arundel. He now placed the entire conduct of the proposed alliance in the hands of Arlington and Colbert. Buckingham, as a Protestant and a babbler, was excluded from all participation in the Grand Secret. Personal negotiations were at once opened with Louis. It was understood that if Charles would join the French monarchy against the Dutch, he should be assisted in every way to establish an uncontrolled authority in England and to declare his conversion. The frequent journeys of messengers between London and Paris soon aroused public notice and jealousy. 
it was openly declared in the streets that a compact was already concluded and the price was named for which english honour had been bought and sold charles was already he wrote to his sister in june sixteen sixty nine making formidable preparations he was rapidly fortifying the principal ports of the kingdom and placing them in sure hands the number of his troops was being cautiously increased and he could fully rely upon their devotion lauderdale his viceroy in scotland had created an army of twenty two thousand men bound by act of parliament to march when and whither he pleased within his dominions ireland too under Berkeley, was in good hands he was resolved to proclaim his conversion the moment he felt safe but it is easy to reckon charles's words at too high a rate a fixed resolve was utterly foreign to his nature and day by day as his character deteriorated under continual debauchery he grew less capable of sustained effort time after time we see him forming great designs and proceeding with them just so long as they do not meet with a formidable resistance careless as he always appeared of public opinion he never deceived himself for long as to the facts of his position he never forgot his father's fate and as he humorously said he had no intention of again going on his travels temple meanwhile was doing his best to sustain the alliance which his master had determined to betray at his instigation the states general formally complained to louis on behalf of spain of infractions of the treaty of aix la chapelle louis replied in the language of insult to the dutch he said he refused any explanation but he would willingly listen to any communication from the king of england charles though to satisfy louis he repudiated temple's action was much disquieted to obtain the supplies he needed from parliament he felt that he must be able to assure them with verbal accuracy that the triple alliance was firm and that there was no danger of further attack upon the spanish low countries it was arranged therefore that louis should request charles to act as mediator between him and spain in the disputes which had arisen and that by including sweden in the arbitration the opportunity should be taken to separate her interest from that of the dutch sweden meanwhile angry at the delay in the payment by spain of the promised subsidies was threatening to withdraw her guarantee of the peace of aix la chapelle de witt therefore urged charles to maintain the coalition by offering his security to sweden that her claims should be satisfied and charles to avoid increasing de witt's growing suspicions and for the reason already mentioned thought it prudent to give way meanwhile some amusing fencing had taken place between charles and colbert upon the question whether the king's declaration of war against the republic should precede or follow the announcement of his conversion the object of louis was to attack the dutch at the earliest moment charles was in no haste to bind himself to the cost and risks of a great war upon the religious question he said he could reckon upon the neutrality of the dissenters for they hated the church more than they hated catholicism with his troops and fortresses he should be strong enough to carry the matter through colbert laid stress upon the fact that in such a case the dutch would stand before europe as the champions of the protestant cause while the difficulties which would necessarily arise at home would prevent the king from using his strength for the war but if sustained by the commercial jealousy of his own people he first declared war he would have good ground for demanding supplies with the troops and ships thus provided he would find it easy at the close of a successful conflict to secure a quiet acquiescence in his conversion to charles's next suggestion that louis should first begin hostilities and that he himself should then carry out both parts of his scheme simultaneously louis replied with an absolute refusal to begin the war without the explicit concurrence of england louis had been well served by the conduct of the english parliament which met on october nineteenth sixteen sixty nine charles in asking for a supply had prided himself upon being the happy instrument which had secured the triple alliance and the peace of aix la chapelle he had used language which though not verbally mendacious 
since there was no intention of breaking the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle, was intended to lead to the belief that the Triple Alliance was equally firm. The fraud was a vain one. Disregarding his appeals for supply and for the payment of his debts, the Commons voted the inadequate sum of four hundred thousand pounds. Charles at once decided to go on with the negotiations with Louis. On December 18, 1669, Arlington submitted to Louis demands which did credit to Charles's audacity. The declaration of Catholicism was to precede the war at a date settled by Charles himself. For this, Louis was to give him two hundred thousand pounds and armed help should it prove necessary against his own subjects. For the war in which he was to join only when England had been pacified, he was to receive eight hundred thousand pounds a year. At its conclusion, Minorca, Osten, Valhieden, Schlusch, and Kadsund, with Spanish America at a future time, were to pass into his hands. The interests of the Prince of Orange were to be preserved, and the Peace of Aix-la-Chapelle maintained. On his side, Charles was to support Louis by land and sea in the Dutch War, and when the time came in making good his claim on the Spanish monarchy, he was for the present to maintain 6,000 infantry in the French service. Louis replied that rather than agree to such preposterous terms, he would wait until he could do the work himself. Charles was, however, only playing a game of brag. On January 24, 1670, he made further proposals, which for the first time convinced Louis that he was in earnest. They contained one provision, however, which showed how well Charles knew the temper of his people. He told Louis bluntly that no English captain would take orders from a French admiral. If, therefore, the fleets were united, they must sail under English command. The reconciliation which he secured with Parliament in the session of February 10, 1670, with its practical result in the vote of £300,000 a year for seven years, greatly strengthened Charles' position in these negotiations. He now began to hang back from the alliance and to raise his terms, and on every point, commercial advantages, the command and numbers of the fleet, the payment of subsidies in hard cash and not in letters of exchange, even his demand that in the powers given to the commissioners he should be styled King of France, Louis found himself compelled to yield. His compliance was hastened by the action of de Witt, who had at length become convinced that treason to the Triple Alliance was being hatched in London. The Grand Pensionary determined to send his leading diplomatist, Van Beningen, to ascertain the truth and frustrate, if he could, any such design. Louis, who knew Van Beningen's reputation for persuasiveness, resolved to anticipate the visit. No one, he felt, was so likely to overcome Charles's reluctance and the few remaining difficulties as his sister Henrietta. Her influence over her brother was immense, and her hatred of the States General, on account of the dependent position in which they kept her nephew, was keener than that of Charles himself. She more than fulfilled her mission. On May 5th, she arrived at Dover, where she was met by Charles, and on June 1st, 1670, Colbert for France, and Arlington, Clifford, Arundel, and Sir Richard Balings from England, signed the celebrated Treaty of Dover, the Traité de Madame, as it was often called, though the terms had practically been agreed upon between Arlington and Colbert in March. A fortnight later, the ratifications were exchanged. When Van Beningen arrived, all was over, and nothing remained but to carry out the farce by keeping him in play with feigned negotiations in which Charles's own ministers, Bridgman, Trevor, and Ashley, were equally his dupes. By this famous compact, Louis, at no great cost, secured his immediate object. The Triple Alliance was broken up, England was to join in war upon the Republic, and Louis was to choose the moment of declaration. An English land force was to serve under French command and in French pay, and when there should arise a failure in the Spanish male line, Charles was to help Louis by sea and land to make good his claims upon that monarchy. 
but Charles was, except for honour, no loser by the bargain, nor, he might claim, was England. He was indeed to declare his conversion, but while he was at once to receive one hundred and fifty thousand pounds to aid him in any difficulties which might arise, the date was left entirely to himself. So long as the war lasted, he was to receive two hundred and twenty-five thousand pounds a year, and at its conclusion, Walhiren, Schlusch, and Kadsund, giving him the command of the coasts of Zealand, were to be his share of the spoil. The Treaty of Commerce was to be immediately concluded, and the Peace of Aix-la-Chapelle maintained. The supremacy of England at sea was marked by the condition that France was to raise only thirty vessels to be regarded as auxiliaries to the fleet equipped by England, and that the whole should be under the command of an English admiral. End of section 20. Section 21 of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 16. Louis's Preparations for the Invasion of the United Provinces, Part 2. A new difficulty giving occasion for one of the most curious pieces of byplay in history now arose. It was impossible to show the treaty as it stood to those servants of the king who were Protestants, to Buckingham, Lauderdale, Bridgman, Trevor, Ashley, Ormond, or Rupert. It was equally impossible to keep the secret long. With Buckingham's inordinate vanity, however, to play upon the matter was very simple. He was allowed to negotiate, in the belief that the suggestion was his own, a fresh treaty led on by the flattery of louis and still more by the feigned hesitations of arlington and colbert while charles looked on with infinite amusement he laboured zealously in preparing a draft january sixteen seventy one differing from the original one in only two important respects all mention of the conversion was omitted the subsidy offered for that purpose being now added to that to be given for the war the opportunity was then taken to secure still further advantage to England. Gorry and Vorne were added to the places to be given her, and the commander of the English land contingent was to take precedence of all the lieutenant generals of France. Louis had his way on only one point. The nearer that Charles approached the question of Catholicism, the less agreeable grew the prospect. He had indeed spoken confidently of his forces in Scotland and Ireland, but they were composed of Protestants, and on this question would fail him at the pinch. He had regarded this second treaty as a way out of the difficulty, but Louis insisted on a secret article unknown to Buckingham that in this respect the first agreement should stand. The ostensible treaty was then signed by Buckingham, Lauderdale, and Ashley. Thus, among all the immediate advisers of the crown, there was not one who held his hand from this shameless abandonment of an alliance which England had herself sought. The second treaty had fixed the spring of 1672 for the declaration of war. Strangely enough, this was the doing not of Louis but of Charles. He had now two reasons for desiring prompt action— the advisability of settling both the war and the religious question before the next meeting of Parliament was urged upon him by James, and he happened, through the success of his duplicity and through his abandonment of toleration, to be in possession of ample funds. On October 24, 1670, he had opened Parliament with a speech in which he had carried deception to the furthest point short of absolute falsehood. The reputation he had acquired by the Triple Alliance and the commercial treaties with Spain, France, Denmark, and Savoy was magnified. In a word, so ran the speech, almost all the princes of Europe do seek his majesty's friendship, as acknowledging they cannot secure, much less improve their present condition without it. The necessity of raising the navy to proportions which might challenge the daily increasing armaments of France and the Dutch was dwelt upon. Not a hint was dropped that the bonds of the Triple Alliance were likely to be relaxed. 
the first of temple's treaties indeed which bound england and the republic to mutual assistance in case of attack was specially mentioned thoroughly deceived the commons answered the king's demand for still a further supply by a vote of no less than eight hundred thousand pounds the importance of the treaty of dover can scarcely be overrated in spite of the advantages charles had extorted louis was the real gainer charles had entered upon a course which becoming more and more one of subservience to france placed it henceforth in the power of louis to neutralize the influence of english opinion and even to enlist the material support of england in the interests of despotism and catholicism this political profligacy was responsible for the miseries to which for more than a generation europe was subjected without england louis would not have dared to attack the dutch for the fleets of the republic would have swept his commerce from the seas while the cordial union of the two great naval powers would have stood like a wall against his schemes of aggression had england at this moment possessed a king of lofty temper proud to lead and apt to control the current of national feeling the chapter of bloodshed and desolation which began at dover and ended at utrecht would probably have remained unwritten two treaty with sweden and the princes of the empire louis had now lopped the principal limb from the triple alliance he determined to detach the swedes also for a long while his success seemed doubtful they would be glad they said to see the naval power of the republic crippled but they had no wish to see her ruined to overcome their scruples charles at louis's request sent henry coventry in october sixteen seventy one to support the french ambassador courton between courton and coventry on the one hand and the ambassadors of spain austria brandenburg and the republic on the other a daily diplomatic duel was waged for several months sweden was poor and the more she was courted the higher she pressed her terms this gave a decisive advantage to the longer purse and the clearer purpose of louis on may sixth sixteen seventy two he secured a treaty for three years by which sweden agreed to oppose any princes of the empire who might attack him to send sixteen thousand men into pomerania in order to defend his line of march and to regard any breach of neutrality on the part of dutch garrisons in places belonging to the empire as a declaration of war for this she was to receive one hundred thousand pounds at once and one hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year during the war her jealousy of denmark so great said leon that their dogs would not hunt in company was expressed by the demand that louis should guarantee the present peace between them but that denmark should not enter the alliance except by the mutual consent of france and sweden almost as important to louis were the treaties which in july sixteen seventy one he succeeded in forming at hanover cologne munster and osnabruck by lavish subsidies and the promise of a share in the spoil he secured a free passage for his troops and the right of purchasing stores while similar advantages were to be refused to any forces which might be sent by leopold to the aid of the dutch the elector of brandenburg however who was an ardent protestant and the other princes of his family rejected the proposals of louis three treaty of neutrality with leopold in all these cases the diplomacy of louis had been assisted by at least an apparent community of interest it was far different with the negotiations which he had begun early in sixteen sixty eight with the emperor leopold first to restrain him from joining the triple alliance and later to secure his neutrality when france attacked the dutch de gramonville the negotiator of the partition treaty was entrusted with this affair also he was alternately assisted and hindered by the character of leopold and the state of his councils the emperor originally destined for the church had the tastes and bearing of a recluse so irresolute was he that his ministers declared him to be only a statue which people could carry about and put up at their pleasure 
From week to week he wavered in his plans as the arguments of de Gramonville and the pressure of Spain and the Dutch, personal pique, the force of old connections, the influence of his mother, his position as head of the empire, and the internal dissensions of his heterogeneous kingdom acted upon his mind. From the date of the Triple Alliance, de Gramonville carried on single-handed and with inexhaustible skill and temper a daily contest against all the influences adverse to France. His plan was to give Leopold no rest but by placing before him proposals which followed one another as fast as each was rejected to keep him in a constant state of nervous anxiety incessantly craving audiences which leopold could not refuse or conferring with his ministers whose rivalry he knew well how to foster and utilize he positively bewildered them with the innumerable arguments furnished to him by louis and lyon and by his own astuteness unruffled by any insult and undeterred by any temporary check with absolute confidence both in his master and in himself he was the one stable element in the sea of warring interests by which he was surrounded not until february sixteen seventy however could he claim any important success beyond that of restraining leopold from taking decisive action even then the emperor's promise that he would not enter the triple alliance was but a spoken one he had however expressed himself willing to leave the dutch to their fate provided louis would promise not to attack spain and louis had hastened to cut the ground from under his feet by writing publicly to the pope engaging not to do so for at least a year further progress was now delayed by the masterful action of louis himself charles the fourth the errant duke of lorraine restored to his estates by the peace of the pyrenees had in sixteen sixty two formally handed them over to louis on condition that the princes of lorraine should be recognized as members of the royal family of france he received them again in sixteen sixty three upon giving up marsal the key of the country and admitting the sovereignty of louis to the great road from metz to alsace with a league's breadth of country the whole of its length in august sixteen seventy however louis heard that the duke was intriguing against him with the dutch and the electors of treves and mayence not sorry for the excuse louis declared the treaty dissolved by this act poured troops into lorraine and in a few days had overrun the country this new aggression roused the utmost resentment at vienna not only was lorraine a dependency of the empire but charles the fourth was the brother-in-law of leopold the refusal of louis to attend to all remonstrances the reproaches of the german princes and the threats of spain that as he had abandoned his family interests they would abandon him once more turned the emperor's fickle resolution against france louis now directed de gramonville to employ his utmost efforts to secure a written promise of neutrality when the attack on the dutch took place but this in his present mood the emperor refused to give hereupon louis for the first time indulged in threats since leopold reserved to himself the liberty of helping the enemies of france he should claim a similar freedom for himself the effect was immediate for the emperor knew that it would be easy at any moment for louis to stir up war in hungary he therefore promised his neutrality so long as neither the empire nor spain were attacked even then it required the further threat of an immediate abandonment of the negotiations to overcome the dilatoriness of the imperial court it was not until november sixteen seventy one that thoroughly wearied out leopold signed a treaty promising that in case of the expected war he would not interfere provided that the peace of aix-la-chapelle were preserved and thus was completed the circle of negotiations by which louis had during nearly four years been engaged in securing that when he attacked the republic she should look around her in vain for support the ability and firmness with which his purpose had been maintained were as remarkable as that purpose was unscrupulous and base End of section twenty one
Section 22 of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 17. Charles the Second and the Cabal, 1671 to 72. 1. The Cabal. The prorogation of April 22nd, 1671, left Charles once more free from parliamentary control. The manner in which, aided by the peculiar character of the executive government, he used his liberty led to the great crisis of his reign. The Privy Council, which in theory was always consulted, had been found to be an inconveniently large body. It had become the custom, therefore, to form within it a small committee or cabal, a term at least as old as the reign of James I, of the members most in the king's confidence, to which were referred not only foreign affairs, for which it was primarily intended, but all matters of importance and secrecy. This cabal has been regarded as the origin of the present cabinet, but the cabinet is representative of the people, at any rate of the House of Commons, possibly in antagonism to the personal wishes of the crown whereas the cabal was the representative of the crown often in spite of both commons and people neither existing nor ceasing to exist with any direct reference to their opinion each member held his place purely at the king's will he gave his advice but his duty then was to support whatever decision the king might choose to adopt the cabal at the time of the Treaty of Dover practically consisted of Clifford, Arlington, Buckingham, Ashley, and Lauderdale, though Bridgman, Trevor, Ormond, Rupert, and others were at times included. It was soon noticed that the initial letters of these first five names made up the word cabal, and it is therefore to this particular cabal that the title has been specifically attached. Among the five there was besides the guilty knowledge of one or other of the treaties of Dover, but one bond of union. All of them, though from the most various motives, were in favor of toleration. Sir Thomas Clifford was perhaps the most picturesque figure of the cabal, a valiant, incorrupt gentleman, ambitious, not covetous, passionate, a most constant, sincere friend. An ardent Catholic in sympathies, if not by actual conversion, he was as ardent an advocate of an uncontrolled monarchy. Only in the combination of religious freedom and royal despotism did he see salvation for the state. His temper was vehement, his eloquence striking, his personal courage conspicuous. The story is well known how during the former war, when on a visit to Arlington at Euston in Suffolk, he and Ormond's son Ossery, hearing the guns off Norwich, leaped on their horses galloped to the coast and put off in an open boat to join the fleet and serve as volunteers through one of the bloodiest days in english naval warfare though a poor man his hands were clean of bribes and his life was remarkably pure his horoscope foretold him fame and fortune but an early death he answered that he cared not for an early death if before he died he might witness the triumph of the catholic church Anthony Ashley Cooper, Lord Ashley, ancestor of the present Earl of Shaftesbury, had been in the forefront of political life since boyhood. In the days of the Commonwealth, he had striven against Cromwell in support of parliamentary government, and after the protector's death had taken a great share in breaking down the despotism of the army. In spite of his present complicity in Charles's counsels, he was still a keen upholder of parliamentary rule. He was violently anti-Catholic, not from any religious convictions, but because, as he expressed it, popery and slavery go ever like two sisters hand in hand. But he had been a supporter of every attempt at toleration of Protestant dissent as being necessary for trade, and in the Constitution, which at his request John Locke drew up for the new colony of Carolina, toleration was a leading feature. He had established a reputation for business power, tact, and finesse, 
and though he never affected to censure the prevailing private and public immorality, he shunned debauchery in his own person, and like Clifford, is free from any well-established charge of bribery. Small and slight in stature and of delicate health, he had a soul as ambitious and fiery as that of Clifford himself, and it was not until the end of his career that his keen political foresight gave way under the excitement of faction and the harassments of ill health. But though he possessed an intuitive perception of those causes which had a great future before them, his conduct was always liable to be modified by the determination to ride on the crest of the political wave, and while from his ready and incisive eloquence, his unceasing activity, and his skill in party warfare, which in its modern form he may be said to have originated, he was always formidable, he is far more often spoken of with distrust than with admiration or respect. John Maitland, Duke of Lauderdale, was only in the second place an English politician. He was Charles's irresponsible and almost absolute viceroy of Scotland, at a time when Scotland was completely separated in sympathies from England. He was, too, the king's devoted personal adherent, eager to carry out his slightest wishes, which he affirmed were more to him than all human laws, and to pander to his most shameless vices. Utterly dissolute as he was in morals and religion, his early career as a Presbyterian caused him to be regarded as a Protestant, and as such he was excluded from knowledge of the Catholic plot. There is one other person whose influence was more powerful and lasting than that of the professional politicians. This was a young Breton girl of noble family who came over in the train of Henrietta, and who, by the beauty of her baby face and a winning charm of manner and conversation, which formed a piquant contrast to the vulgar humors of Lady Castlemaine and Nell Gwynne, completely captivated Charles. It is more than probable that Louis had determined that some permanent representative of French influence should have a place in that scene of female caprice which surrounded Charles's most intimate life, and that it was this which Louise de Kerouaille was to supply. She soon became the chief intermediary between the monarchs, sharing in all their schemes of statecraft, and displaying an independence of judgment and a capacity for intrigue worthy of a practised politician. Her influence was recognised by the hatred with which she was popularly regarded as the agent of France. Upon Louise de Kerouaille, better known as the Duchess of Portsmouth, as upon the other women of Charles's harem, the treasure of the country was poured out in reckless profusion. It was not without good reason that a caricature published in Holland represented the king between two women with his pockets turned inside out. The supplies voted by Parliament, the subsidies of Louis, ran like water through the hands of these female favorites. Pensions, patents, monopolies, crowned lands, reversions of lucrative posts were showered upon them and their children. Louise de Kirouaille alone had before long an annual income of forty thousand pounds, and in 1681 the enormous sum of one hundred and thirty-six thousand pounds passed through her hands. It is no wonder that this being but one form of expenditure on his pleasures, the sums received by Charles were all too small, and that in August 1671, his debts were reckoned at more than three millions. 2. Stop of the Exchequer, Declaration of Indulgence, Dutch War A state of things so desperate with an expensive war in prospect suggested desperate remedies. All evidence points to Clifford as the author of the Confession of National Bankruptcy known as the Stop of the Exchequer, though it is possible that a similar step by Mazarin may have suggested it to Charles. It was customary for the bankers to advance money to the crown on the faith of taxes voted by Parliament, but not yet collected, at an interest of 12%. It was now determined in the Privy Council, though against the advice of Ashley, 
to apply the whole proceeds of the taxes for 1672 to the war, the bankers being left unpaid, while for the future the interest on the money thus confiscated should be reduced to 6%. The sum upon which by this outrageous breach of faith Charles laid violent hands, £1,400,000, was secured at the cost of the permanent ruin of the royal credit and general commercial distress. Hundreds of private persons were left destitute, for the bankers were compelled to suspend payment, and merchants who had placed money in their hands were unable to carry on their ordinary business. And after all, says a shrewd observer, as it did not supply the expenses of the meditated war, so it melted away, I know not how for carrying through this scheme the flagrant dishonesty of which was evidently obscured by his view of the proper privileges of royalty, Clifford was rewarded with a peerage and the Lord Treasurer's staff. The second important measure which signalized the spring of 1672 must be laid to the credit of Ashley. Trusting no doubt that at the close of the war he would be in a position to dictate his own terms to Parliament, Charles made another attempt to secure the dispensing power. On March 15, 1672, he published the famous Declaration of Indulgence. It was evidently drawn up by Ashley, whose often expressed views were thus set forth in the preamble. We do now issue this our declaration, as well for the quieting of our good subjects, as for inviting strangers in this conjuncture to come and live under us, and for a better encouragement of all to a cheerful following of their trades and callings. Charles then boldly claimed the dispensing power. Looking to the unhappy differences in matters of religion, he declared himself obliged to make use of that supreme power in ecclesiastical matters which is not only inherent in us, but hath been declared and recognized to be so by several statutes and acts of Parliament. In the vain hope of conciliating the Church, the Declaration stipulated that the doctrine, discipline, privileges, and government of the Church, as now established, should be scrupulously observed, the suspension of all manner of penal laws and matters ecclesiastical against whatsoever sort of nonconformists or recusants was announced, while in pursuance of a plan adopted by Louis with marked success, but which had been on a former occasion rejected by the commons. Certain places were to be licensed for the worship of non-conforming Protestants. Catholics, however, were to be allowed only their former liberty to hold services in their private houses. The issue of the declaration had been hindered by the conduct of Orlando Bridgman, keeper of the seals. That honest minister had already made difficulties in the matter of the stop of the exchequer, he now absolutely refused to put the great seal to the declaration. The opportunity was taken to reward its author. Bridgman was removed, and Ashley, under the title of Earl of Shaftesbury, was made Lord Chancellor. Two days after the issue of the declaration, the last great step for which the members of the cabal were jointly responsible was taken. On March 17th, war was declared against the Dutch. End of section 22.